Good afternoon, good morning, everybody, and, and welcome to this, um, I think, very important panel that we're going to be running today. Um, I'll be introducing our panel very shortly. Um, and as you've just heard, we'll be talking about um, the the uh, the concept of uh, the question of vaccines, IP, and global equity. And uh, a central uh, aspect of that, of course, is the discussion of the the vaccine waiver at W. To um, this continues to be uh, an emotive topic, um, and it leads one to reflect on why so often does IP run into these moral and ethical areas. Um, one of the uh, reasons I've always felt is that um, one of the first places that hears about stuff is the IP world. Uh, there have been many discussions at this very conference about AI, for example, and the IP world has been one of the first to address it. Here, our involvement is slightly different, and it's that uh, difficult area between stimulation of innovation, competition, and openness. And so today, we're going to be have a looking at have a look at the topics, uh, the questions that come up in relation to, to vaccines and the current pandemic situation. Um, we're joined by some. Um, fantastic speakers today which is great news um we've got some genuine experts including um uh, tony taubman from wto who'll be leading off in, the, in a couple of moments we also have sapna kumar university of houston banu sada sivan at mcdermott will and emory Corey salzberg at novartis and peter Yu at texas a and m i think between the group we have a disparate set of views which i think is incredibly important in the interest of balancing the debate but to kick off uh, straight away, let's first of all um, turn to you, Tony, if I may, and talk a little bit about the kind of the current state of play. Can you talk us through about, a bit about what's going on at WTO, what the thinking is, and, and what's happening right now? Certainly, uh, William, and, and greetings, everyone. Uh, real uh, pleasure to join you all. Uh, well, right at the moment, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very critical stage. Um, I'll take a few steps back and give some, some background. Uh, just over a year ago, uh, initially, India and South Africa tabled a proposal in what's called the TRIPS Council here in the WTO, the, the main uh, committee dealing with IP and, and our agreement, the TRIPS agreement. Uh, and that proposal was uh, not, as we, we often hear, an IP waiver or a patent waiver. It was a proposal to waive uh, members' uh, uh, obligations under the treaty uh, that have bearing on the protection of, of IP. Uh, so uh, what they proposed was that uh, uh, for the duration of the pandemic, uh, members would not have, uh, would not, would be relieved from certain obligations to protect IP under their domestic systems. So it, it's about giving uh, member governments um, significantly greater latitude than is currently possible under under existing rules and that would uh, have effect uh, as, as it's tabled at least as it's proposed uh, in relation to copyright in relation to industrial designs patents and the area of undisclosed information which includes trade secrets and uh, clinical trial data uh, and th that uh, that uh, has been debated uh, as you can imagine quite quite extensively uh, in the years since then uh, and in june a slightly revised uh, proposal was, was put forward by this group and by this time the proposal had gained very wide support from a wide range of uh, developing country members of the WTO, uh, including the African group of countries itself and the least developed uh, country group itself. Uh, and just very quickly, it, it uh, proposes a waiver of the protection of those IP rights or the, the obligation rather to protect those IP rights in relation to health products and technologies, including diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, medical devices, PPE, their materials or components and, uh, uh, and their methods and means of manufacture. Uh, so that's the scope of technologies and for uh, three specific purposes for the prevention, treatment or containment of COVID-19. Now, without going into the the legal detail. This proposal, uh, in my view, has, has three uh, broad um, elements to it uh, because it, re it refers to the obligations under the TRIPS agreement to recognise IP rights, uh, the obligation to give effective enforcement to IP rights, and it refers to dispute settlement at the 
government to government at the member to member level. Uh, so uh, it, re it refers uh, to the obligation to, for example, to make patents available, to make patent rights available uh, in relation to, say, the prevention of, of COVID. It also relates to the availability of effective remedies for the infringement of, of patent rights. And thirdly, it provides for uh, a, 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 a suspension of uh, the possibility of taking dispute settlement action here in the WTO in relation to the, the field covered by, by this waiver proposal. Now that, that, has, that has been the subject of very, very intensive de debate and discussion within the walls, uh, including the virtual walls these days of the WTO and well beyond it, as, as, as we know. But I did want to clarify that it is not a, a it cannot be uh, uh, an IP waiver or waiver of patent rights. It concerns the uh, scope of uh, uh, latitude that uh, member governments have uh, in, if you like, uh, blunting the, the exclusive, something that was discussed in previous sessions, the exclusive uh, effect of, uh, of IP rights. Uh, and from that point of view, uh, it sits uh, alongside uh, a discussion about the existing uh, scope that governments have to limit the exclusive effect of IP rights because there is, of course, under the TRIPS agreement already a, a recognition of a, of a, a range of ways of uh, limiting uh, uh, exclusivity of rights or, in effect, overriding IP rights in the public interest. And that's the, the theme of uh, an alternative proposal that the has tabled. Uh, and they uh, have taken the approach of seeking to clarify those existing uh, uh, provisions, those existing entitlements that governments, governments have, uh, again, in particular to, to issue compulsory licenses in the patenting area. Uh, uh, so I, I guess the, the nub of the, the issue uh, comes down to whether in responding to the pandemic, whether it's enough for governments to have uh, the existing range of latitude that they already have uh, to, well, override or um, blunt the exclusive effect of, of the IP rights mentioned, uh, or whether it's necessary to go beyond that. Uh, and so from that point of view, I, I would emphasize there's, there's two other uh, angles that do need consideration. What, what would it mean to implement, actually implement at the domestic level this greater latitude that is that is uh, uh, proposed in the, uh, the the waiver submission, uh, and secondly, uh, what uh, avenues this gives for greater international coordination and cooperation, because uh, the proposal is made in the interest of solidarity, and we have to say very clearly that the background here uh, is widely shared. Uh, uh, I was going to say anxiety profound concern, even outrage, at what's seen as a, a, a huge inequity in access to vaccines in particular at the moment, and the sense that uh, distributed uh, uh, production uh, production of vaccines, production capacity of vaccines is, is urgently needed to address that, that uh, inequity. Uh, and so the, the waiver, is, is a waiver proposal is, is propounded in that context. Uh, the focus has been on vaccines because that's clearly the most uh, uh, significant intervention at this stage, which uh, uh, can, can reverse the uh, awful impact of, of this pandemic. But uh, the, the proposal is, is significantly broader and would cover therapeutics, diagnostics, uh, protective equipment and so on, as I've mentioned. The current state of play is, uh, I might say, very intensive. Uh, there's diplomatic activity going on at, uh, at several levels. Uh, it is formally uh, a process of the TRIPS Council here in Geneva, and uh, which must make a recommendation to the General Council, which is a higher level body. But there's a great deal of uh, more informal uh, diplomatic activity at the moment to try to work towards uh, some kind of consensus outcome, because there is a strong interest, very strong interest, in achieving a consensus outcome that sends a strong signal that the WTO is uh, prepared to uh, assist, uh, enable the necessary action to combat the, the pandemic. 
uh, whether it's through uh, either of these proposals or some kind of um, uh, 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 hybrid proposal incorporating the two. Uh, things are now very urgent because in the first week of December, we have scheduled the next ministerial conference, which is a, uh, the highest level uh, governing body of the WTO. Uh, there is uh, urgent, uh, intensive efforts uh, underway to uh, reach a, an agreement, not only on the IP dimension, but on all aspects of the trade policy response to the pandemic. Uh, and of course, there's a, a range of other issues, including maintaining open supply chains, uh, reducing the effect of uh, export restrictions or this kind of thing. Uh, but, but the proponents of the waiver, the TRIPS waiver, have made it quite clear that uh, they, they really don't see that it, it would be a, a complete or acceptable package if we talk about uh, other trade issues and do not address the IP dimension. So uh, we're, we are expecting a very busy uh, period uh, in the course of November and possibly even throughout the ministerial uh, conference itself to reach a, a consensus outcome. Uh, there is consensus, if you like, that consensus is urgently needed, but the components of that consensus very much uh, up for grabs still at the moment. I hope that gives a general picture, but uh, let's explore the, uh, the, the broader issues. Thank you, William. No, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad there's consensus to have consensus. Sounds like a good start. <laughs> but, uh, there's a little way to go. I'm professionally, uh, professionally obliged to be optimistic at all times. So. <laughs> well, I was going to actually ask on that in terms of optimism. So, I mean, you've talked about consensus outcome. You've talked about the general mood that, you know, there is something we can be doing here. And you've also mentioned something I think is very important for this kind of, let's face it, IP oriented audience is that there's a recognition that WT, at WTO that you know, it, it's not fair in any way to call IP the only culprit. Hopefully IP isn't the culprit at all, but it certainly isn't the only culprit. So there's, this is part of a bigger package of looking at trade policy and liquidity, all these things, that's that's really reassuring to hear. But, but with your kind of, um, with your optimist hat on, let's imagine, well, first of all, is there any chance of a consensus outcome in, let's say December or, you know, the, 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 the short term? And if so, what actually would that look like if it was implemented? I mean, how would we see, our, how would we see things change? Uh, well, as I say, I, uh, uh, ultimately it does get down to what uh, national governments wish to do at the domestic level. And uh, to be honest, uh, uh, we haven't heard a great deal of detail about, about specific proposals. That is to say, the day after this waiver comes into force, if it's, if it's agreed, we will do exactly the following. And this is our legislative package, if you like. We've heard very little about that. And uh, uh, so it has been a, a more general debate about more the other way around, whether the existing uh, latitude that governments already have, whether that is, uh, whether that is uh, enough in the course of a pandemic, whether it's too cumbersome, whether there's too much bureaucracy, whether there's uh, uh, a number of uh, governments have said, look, we do have compulsory licensing in our system, but it's, uh, it doesn't seem to work. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, the process is, is too burdensome, we, we, we rarely use it, it's, it just doesn't seem to be effective. Um, and the other point, the idea that uh, this is done in the name of solidarity and so there, there should be scope for um, um, co connected or a, a, a coordinated response on the part of governments. And so the debate has really been uh, at heart whether the existing constraints in the, in the TRIPS agreement uh, are, are impeding uh, that that kind of action, uh, and really without without completely speculating, you know, which which would, wouldn't be appropriate or useful for me to do, uh, it, it's still open as to what uh, individual governments would themselves choose to do uh, in the event of a waiver, uh, uh, because ultimately that's what it's about. It's about broadening the the menu of options for for governments. It gives them greater latitude. But how they want to exercise that agency uh, is is another matter, and uh, that would be, uh, uh, you know, as ever, up, up to the, the government's concerned. Thank you very much. I mean, I think you've 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 made it. You, you've, picked, you've touched very importantly on one of the key topics today, which is the kind of the equity point. Um, and as you say, there's plenty of um, uh, of 
possibilities already within national or regional IP law to, to take steps. Um, before, I'm, I've been asking you the questions and I'm kind of moderating, but I, please may I remind the audience that you're very welcome to fire questions in at any point through the Q&A function, which on the top of my screen is, is top right. I don't know where it is on everyone else's screen, maybe the same place. Do please pop those in. Um, I've disagreed to the panel, don't let me dominate, do jump in. But actually I'm gonna jump, first of all though, to, to something to talk about that one point about the kind of, what national slash regional IP law has already, and in particular, of course, compulsory licenses. Why aren't they working? What's going on? Yeah, so just to give a little bit of background, with compulsory licenses, this is a situation in which a government authorizes a third party to use patented technology without the patent holder's consent um, in exchange for paying uh, some form of remuneration to the patent holder. And this is allowed under current law, under, first of all, under TRIPS, Article 31, countries can do this. Um, in fact, during a national emergency, which a pandemic would count as, a country doesn't even need to negotiate with the patent holder in advance of issuing the license. Um, so this all sounds great, uh, but what we've seen is there are some serious limitations. So the biggest problem is that there really isn't a mechanism for forcing IP holders to share the manufacturing know-how, the trade secrets that make it easy to produce the drug. And I can give you a, kind of a concrete example of this. Like we've seen compulsory licensing used during the pandemic. Uh, Russia and Hungary have both um, utilized it for producing remdesivir and Israel early on for producing Coletra. But the thing about those drugs is they're small molecule drugs. They're relatively easy to replicate, to reverse engineer. By contrast with vaccines, those are biologics. Those are very complicated to recreate. And even when you do, you would have to still get regulatory approval that your, uh, that your biosimilar is not going to harm people. And so what that means for vaccines is that even with compulsory licensing, there's gonna be long, long delays for scientists to figure out how to replicate the technology and then to you know, get the manufacturing scaled up and to actually start producing <laughs> these generic uh, you know, biosimilar vaccines. And this could take years. Um, so when you're dealing with a situation where delays kill people, compulsory licensing isn't going to be your, you know, your one-stop solution, unfortunately. Good one. Can I can I just respond to that? I, I don't know if you yeah. wanted to defer no, to okay, it, okay, but okay. yeah, I mean, just I, I think that the the two points that we certainly you know from an industry perspective and an innovator perspective struggle with is that you know assuming what Sapna just said is true, and I, I agree actually, it is true that that you need a lot more than a patent to actually enable a third party to practice and um, and make something like an mRNA vaccine or even a standard vaccine. The question should be, how is waiving trips going to get you there? or waiving IP at all. And uh, for one thing, you know, we have many, many, many examples and, uh, you know, of situations where you cannot force tech transfer because tech transfer isn't something that you can print up on a manual and, 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 and email to someone. You actually have to spend the time to, to, to teach them, to share information, to work with them. And that all requires collaboration, which happens because of IP, not by waiving it. And the second really quick point, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop and let others chime in because I have some other remarks and other things later, um, but is that the TRIPS agreement itself does not cover know-how or tech transfer either. Um, it covers patents. Yes, it covers trade secrets, but even in the trade secret sense, all it does is it applies an obligation on, on member countries to pass laws that prevent others from misappropriating trade secrets. So trade secrets aren't granted the way patents are. They don't belong to governments to take away in the first place. The only thing you could do is loosen laws that, that, that currently prevent people from theft and fraud and misappropriation. So I guess our view is, you know, on that particular set of points, if, if the issue is tech transfer needs to be done, we're not clear at all how the waiver would help effectuate that. And I should jump in and say, I actually agree with Corey on this point. I don't think the IP waiver does solve 
the problem of uh, forcing, you know, drug companies to actually share the technology or to license out their technology to scale up uh, production more quickly. Um, we've seen this with Moderna, we've seen this with Pfizer, where they've been dragging their feet in terms of licensing out their technology um, in situations where they're not willing to. I don't know how even, you know, getting a full waiver is going to help. Tony, actually, um, so there's, I imagine all these considerations have come up in the WTO discussions. Um, again, straight to the practicalities of it, how is a waiver going to help? There's something, for example, like uh, trade secrets is a really good example. A secret to secret, how do you make somebody share it? How does that work? Yeah, well, I, I, as I say, it's been debated for for uh, a, a, over a year and we have 164 members. So if I'm going to keep my job, I'm, I'm not going to be selective and, and uh, put any particular point of view forward. I, I would say that uh, uh, the, the debate has, has uh, addressed these points um, and uh, our members really disagree on, on whether it, ca it can be effective, particularly on the point, uh, area of know-how. And I think one reason for that is that the, I mean, patent law is, is relatively uh, uh, homogeneous, you know, similar structure format uh, basis. Uh, uh, in, in most countries, whereas the the law of whatever confidentiality, trade secret protection, uh, is is more heterogeneous, and there's just actually less understood about the uh, if you like the public interest dimension. Uh, Trips uh, Trips presents it as a, as a matter of unfair competition, and ensuring that uh, I don't have advantage from your know how. But what about the, the public interest perspective? If we are talking about a situation where the government says, well, look, we're the government and we want to use your know-how uh, to, to produce a vaccine, uh, not, not uh, f in a commercial context, but in a, a public, uh, public function, then, it, then it, it is in a different category. And frankly, not much is known about uh, the scope of, of uh, not only the TRIPS provisions in this area, but how, how they've been implemented in our 164 members. So to my mind, that's one of the reasons why the, the, the debate is quite unclear in this area. It, it's because it is uh, much more heterogeneous, much more diverse in, in character, in its applied form at the domestic level than your average uh, patent law. And I should mention also that, of course, the, the, the uh, waiver proposal would also address protection of clinical trial data or test data protection. Uh, and of course, that's, that's effectively uh, while it's under the same rubric, it's effectively a different category uh, of, uh, of IP protection. And, and again, the, the public interest uh, consideration there uh, uh, has not been fully brought forward, even in the debate, I would say, so far. Uh, and, and to me, that, to my mind, that's, that's one of the issues that has really come to light in this context. A recognition that, okay, we know that patent rights are not absolute, uh, that the, the public interest uh, can, can intervene. Well, that also does apply to some extent uh, to trade secret protection or protection of undisclosed information or confidential information, whatever the, uh, uh, what you have in your system. And likewise, when it comes to test data protection, uh, whatever uh, approach is taken at the domestic level, I don't think anyone's argued that it's completely absolute and the public interest can never uh, be considered. However, this, uh, this has not come forward fully in, in the debate. And, and that's why I say, uh, I think one of the missing elements in the debate is a really thoroughgoing discussion of what domestic implementation would really look like. Uh, and, and because ultimately that's where you, you know, the rubber meets the road. What we're talking about here, literally here, uh, are the, the international rules, which are cast as broad principles. It, you know, the TRIPS agreement is not a, a model IP law, it's a set of broad principles that governments uh, uh, legislatives, legislatives are, are, are put into effect in, in diverse ways. So to me, that's one of the one of the, uh, uh, the unresolved questions in, in this in, in this, in this uh, long running debate. If, if I may, uh, I think I want to speak maybe a little bit of historical context in terms of public interest and and uh, and, and this whole idea of patents and 
yes, it's patent is something that is enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. So why do we even need? Why do we even have a patent? Why do we think it's so important that it was enshrined in, the, in our Constitution? It does say it to promote the progress of science and useful arts. And well, how does a patent do it? A patent is not just a certificate saying, "Hey, you have a patent. Here's your patent number." It's a it's a pretty thick, dense document that tells you how to make it, how to use it, what the invention is, and you can use it to go forward and develop and areas that's not taught, you can elaborate. So, and, and why am I bringing all this? And I wanted to give a little historical perspective um, in the sense that we have their, this is remarkable, how quickly the vaccines have been made. And in order to get there, there was a lot of work that has been done over time. You know, genomics has been key to this. In the olden days, you had to grow viruses. That took time. You don't have to do it now. You use genomics and you, you figure out what is the sequence I want. And then even if you want to track infection, you know, you use the genomic tools. So these tools have developed over time. And, and so what we have mRNA technology, how to put that mRNA into a lipid vesicle, that technology, every piece of this has taken time to develop. And if it didn't have all this information, I think of it as an arsenal of tools that we just deployed when we saw a pandemic and we said, all right, let's go get this. And it, we can all debate and say, my opinion is patents did help in developing these technologies. Uh, but if we do something and we say we're not going to uh, give any patent protection or completely wipe all of it, one of the concerns that I have and I want uh, to express is there, there's probably going to be another pandemic. There's probably going to be another big issue. We need to have this arsenal. We need to have this developing arsenal ready to deploy. And what it is to the public's interest is not to somehow minimize it in some way that we not continue to develop these tools. And ultimately, next it comes, we are just flat footed. That's also very much against the public interest. So I just stop at that. I just thought I should say when you said public interest. Thanks very much, Barney. Just a quick one. Um, Peter, I'm not sure if you're, when, you, when your machine's unmuted, it I might be making a hissing noise for everyone. I'm not quite sure. Can you just try and mute, see if that works? Yeah, I'm, I, I can speak. Okay, well, if you speak, that's great yeah. as well. But as I say, yes, go, go, go. If you have any comments, please go for it. Sure, sure. So um, let me pick up on what uh, Banu just said, because I think that's actually quite important. I think that the decision we are going to make to address COVID is likely to be quite different than a decision we're going to make to address all future pandemics. So I think it's very important for us not to just focus on this point in time and lose sight of the fact that we might also think about uh, all future pandemics. I think there have been a lot of discussions about how we're going to see another major pandemic in the next 10 to 20 years. So I think it's actually quite important for us to think about the future. About what I want to do is to pick up on what uh, both Tony and Samner said earlier in terms of the waiver and get you uh, behind the mindset of the proponents and the co-sponsors. So uh, there are a lot of flexibilities within the TRIPS agreement, as Tony and Sepna mentioned, and I believe Tony mentioned the existing range of latitudes. So for a lot of the developing countries, uh, the first one that comes to mind uh, in the TRIPS agreement, obviously, is Article 31, uh, which uh, Sepna uh, touches on with respect to compulsory licensing. The frustration, I think, for a lot of those proponents and co-sponsors is that the provision is country by country, product by product, and right holder by right holder. So in order for you to secure a compulsory license, uh, the process is actually quite complicated. But more important than that, even if it's allowed under the TRIPS agreement, the U.S. trade representative, as well as other governments, can still take trade retaliations against those governments that are using the compulsory licensing arrangement allowable under WTO rules. I think Thailand is a very good example that's quite uh, repeatedly cited as well as others. Uh, so the concern for them is not just about the WTO, but also uh, what type of repercussions they will have in using those provisions. Now, on top of that, there are also a lot of countries 
that do not have capacity to manufacture the health product and technology. And so during the Doha round, uh, the uh, WTO members agreed to amend the TRIPS agreement by adding Article 31 bits. And that's mainly for those countries that do not have the capacity to do that. But before the pandemic, only one uh, uh, country has so far gotten benefit from uh, the uh, uh, provision based on either the paragraph six solution or Article 31 bits, and that's Rwanda. And so that uh, protocol to amend the TRIPS agreement was adopted in 2005, and only one country has benefited from that amendment uh, before the pandemic. And now we have another case with respect to Bolivia trying to get the pandemic vaccine from Canada, and they are also facing major challenges. So from the standpoint of a lot of developing countries, if we are talking about more than a decade, only two cases have been uh, successful or close to successful, and they're still struggling, then this is not working very well. On top of that, the TRIPS agreement also have other provisions like Article 30 that will allow countries to adopt exceptions, and Article 73 that will allow countries to uh, take advantage of national security exception. But all of those provisions can be challenged under the WTO dispute settlement process, which Tony mentioned before. And uh, it can be very costly based on figures that's been shown in the early 2000s. One claim is about 150,000 US dollars, right? So during, in pandemic times, uh, a lot of countries are very concerned, not just about the trade repercussions, as, uh, but they're also very concerned about the cost it takes to defend uh, before a WTO dispute settlement body. Now that doesn't mean that we do not have reservations about the waiver. So in the interest of time, I want to highlight three things that are quite important, uh, even coming from a developing country's perspective. The first one is what uh, I mentioned early on about how Article 31 best get adopted in 2005, and it did not get fully ratified by, by two thirds of the WTO membership until 2017. So that's more than a decade. So we are going to have the discussion about the waiver at the moment there's a good chance that we will not see it ratified by two thirds of the WTO membership until a decade later. And by then we actually talk about the next pandemic, not talk about COVID. So that's the number one concern. The second concern I have is what Tony gets to about domestic implementation. A lot of countries have signed a lot of the free trade agreements, bilateral investment agreements. They still have to figure out how to get complementary waivers to those agreements. Just waiving a TRIPS agreement doesn't help them with respect to those other agreements. On top of that, you also have a lot of countries where the position they take in Geneva is very different from the position they take in the capital uh, because of domestic opposition. Uh, Sebna mentioned that the three countries that have uh, issued a compulsory license during the pandemic, Hungary, Russia, and Israel, none of them are the co-sponsors or the proponents of the waiver proposal. Right, so even for those p countries that are actually proposing a waiver or co-sponsoring them, they have not issued a compulsory license at home. Right, so they de definitely will, will see quite some uh, domestic opposition. And the last thing I want to add on is about the concessions that the developing countries need to give in order to get a waiver. So what are they going to give up in the WTO negotiations? It's very important to remember WTO is an international trade organization. So there are a lot of concessions, not just in the IP area. And that's why I think a lot of the member states as well as the uh, NGO community are now asking to complete the waiver negotiation before the ministerial. Because they fear that uh, the more we go into a ministerial to actually address a lot of those issues, the more uh, 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 host trading will be going on with the different trade items and that will become more complicated for those countries that are actually demanding the waiver. So on that note, I'll pass it back to you, Gwilym. So I could make Thank a comment. You. Please, please. Um, I just wanted to, ju uh, I, I agree with almost everything, well, pretty much everything that uh, Peter said. Um, I just wanted to add, there's blame to be heaped also onto the high income governments that helped fund the development of these vaccines. And this relates to a question that came in through the Q&A as well with regard to how IP uh, helped lead to the development of these vaccines. Well, so did billions of dollars that were poured in from the United States, from Germany, from the European Union to help fund some of these vaccines. And yet these governments failed to secure promises 
from you know when providing the funding with regard to availability with regard to licensing out technology to scale things up with regard to access in lower income countries pricing none of that yeah you know, there were you know none of those uh none of those conditions were placed when all of this taxpayer money went to the vaccines so i just want to be clear here that this is not merely a trips problem but also uh, a problem with regard to the behavior of national governments. Girl, if I, if I could respond to several of these yeah. points, um, I mean, maybe just starting with that last one. Um, certainly there was federal money that was provided, um, you know, in, in terms of, but it really differed quite a bit company to company. I think it's a vast oversimplification to suggest, for example, and I, I know Sapna didn't say this, but, but there are media reports and others who have said, that the Moderna vaccine was basically, you know, developed by the government and government money. That's not true. I mean, th th this technology has been decades in development from all different sources, some public, some private. Um, tons of vent private venture capital money went into Moderna to keep it afloat long before the federal government even had an interest in, in, in mRNA technology or vaccines over the last few years. So, and the other big point there, I think, on the funding is that a lot of that money, and, and I agree with Sapna here, by the way, uh, fully that that there's a lot of beyond the IP there's a lot of vaccine nationalism that that we would say is probably the biggest single issue today um, in terms of why there's not vaccine equity and a lot of that money that we're talking about was used not to to pay for the development of the vaccine as such but to actually secure doses in advance and what we've seen governments including our own here in the U.S. do is hoard you know millions and millions and millions of doses of vaccine and not share them all governments that have had vaccines have done that. So I think, you know, just to add that context, just to respond a little bit to some of Peter's points, um, you know, I, I also think that the, the Article 31 bis and Paragraph 6, you know, evidence or anecdotes is an oversimplification. I think that the reason why that has not been used in most cases is not because it's so cumbersome and hard to use, but because there's not been a real interest in most countries to use that because that is generally in order to get someone to issue a compulsory license in a foreign country in order to supply an LDC, which is really what paragraphs say, or an LIC, you need a market. And most generic companies don't have an interest, in, even in India, in creating and, and manufacturing and selling drugs into the world's poorest countries because they can't make a living from doing that. And, you know, to, to prove that point a little bit, as I think everyone, you know, here on, on the panel knows, there is no IP in 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 the LDCs, except for those who choose to adopt it, there's there's a moratorium on, on and um and a waiver, a different kind of waiver on their uh, requirement to adopt the trips obligations up until 2033, I think it is, and another one until 2043, something like that. Um, you know, there's nothing that would have stopped either before the pandemic or in this pandemic from uh, companies from India, for example, building a factory in Bangladesh to do you know to to develop vaccines. There's no IP barriers, I should say. There are lots of other barriers to doing that, like you know, an interest in doing it because of the market, the time it takes, the lack of know-how, the lack of expertise. But I think all of these things, you know, show that I do think it's an oversimplification to say that that you know it, it's because Article Thirty One is so cumbersome and that's why it's not happening. Um, I'll stop there. I have a bunch of things if we have time. I wanted to cover on a totally different point, but I wanted to respond for now and let others now chime in on the issues that have already been tabled. Thank you very much, Corey. And yes, we, we will be, we'll definitely come back. Don't worry about that. There's quite a few, um, lots of issues coming up here. Let's have a look at a, a couple of them. And Tony, sorry, we're not we're generally not trying to put you on the spot or get you in trouble, but there's quite a few questions coming back about about the process. Um, maybe just kicking off quickly with a, a point, and, and please, if you answer this quite quickly, hopefully that Peter raised about some of the kind of the mechanical issues here um, around things like the the delay that traditionally we've seen in view of the giant majority required, and also um, the kind of horse trading of concessions. Um, I don't know how much they can comment on, or, or I suppose that they, they fit together to say, you know, does this mean that real, reality, maybe it's not, we can't be as optimistic as we'd like about the out, speedy outcome. Okay, well, my CV is on the on the website somewhere, so if, I, if I'm out of a job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, we'll look after you. <laughs> but, but, so on, on both of those points, firstly, uh, well, if it's about a waiver proposal, um, uh, uh, this is a specific channel in the uh, in the treaty system in the WTO. 
uh, it's provided for generally. I mean, it, it, this is it, it's 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 uh, very rare in the IP area. It's more, it's more frequent in other areas of trade law, and uh, that that is that is simply a, a decision uh, at the government to government level to say, well, okay, for for a certain period, this this treaty obligation is is suspended for you in in these in these circumstances. So a waiver as such uh, doesn't require uh, a, a, an additional level of, of uh, legal acceptance as would new treaty obligations. Uh, and, that, and that's clear, that's within the existing treaty, or treaty system. So if it's a waiver, and I keep going back to that word because it's a, it has a technical sense in the WTO, then that's, that if, if it's agreed, then it's relatively straightforward. And, and we do have waivers for, in particular, for least developed countries in certain areas uh, relating to pharmaceuticals that's that's established. So that, that in itself uh, is not a difficulty. If it's about rewriting the rules, uh, sure, that, that involves uh, uh, amending the treaties and, and that is a more elaborate uh, mechanism. Uh, I, I really can't comment on the, the question of whether um, the, the IP issue or the, the TRIPS waiver issue would lead to horse trading uh, or trading of any other um, quadruped, you know, in, in Geneva. Because, not because I'm reluctant to, but, but because it's, it really isn't clear what, what the exact linkages would be, to be honest, um, whether, uh, whether uh, in the course of a, a ministerial meeting, which by the way, uh, this, this time around will be largely hybrid. We don't even know yet because of the difficulties of organizing this kind of meeting. Uh, where, just exactly how how the uh, the, the process of the of the uh, conference will, will proceed, but that's that's when the kind of the you know these kind of deals are made. We we have this experience in the in the trips area. It's a rather recondite question, but the the exact scope of the WTO concerning trips uh, there's a there's an ongoing question of whether so-called non-violation disputes are covered or not, and this is often linked with with something that's uh, technically unrelated, that, that's to say um, uh, a suspension of, of uh, tariffs on e-commerce e tra uh, transmissions. Uh, that's the kind of cross-sectoral deal that we do see uh, sometimes. Uh, I, I, at the moment, I don't see that happening. I, I think the, the debate on the TRIPS waiver is proceeding uh, on the content of it. That doesn't make it easier. Uh, because uh, uh, because there are gaps, there are clear gaps that are on the record that still haven't been haven't been bridged, uh, and and there are really important issues of, of uh, principle at stake. So that 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 remains open, uh, uh, I'm afraid. But but Peter is right that the, the WTO, uh, unlike other international organisations, has a history of these kind of uh, uh, deals across unrelated issues. At the moment, I, I, I don't see that that happening, but that certainly doesn't exclude it in the in the in the in the, in the coming weeks. That, that's for sure. Thank you. So let's be optimistic that we'll have an outcome, but also, of course, we'll have an outcome that makes good sense um, and isn't just a, a kind of a knee jerk thing. I'm sorry, as a Brit, I can't avoid. I have to make the odds joke. And can I just point out that hybrid horse trading is in fact chimera trading? Um, that was that, that <laughs> occurred to me while you were, while you were talking there. Um, so let's talk a bit about the. Thank you. Thank you. Um, talk about the practicalities for a moment. Um, so, as you say, you know, this is not about we're going to waive IP. This permits local, national governments the opportunity to to vary their law. And Sapna, if we can come back to you, um, that then becomes a very interesting question. As you've mentioned, uh, mere compulsory licensing, even if it was happening as it kind of hasn't been really broadly, would need a lot more. I mean, can you? Uh, imagine a, a scenario that would that would look attractive, that would make sense, in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in the goal of uh, getting this equity that we're looking for. I think that's a complicated question because it's going to turn on what kind of country you're talking about. If you're looking at mm -hmm. higher income countries in terms of what they can do, I think that licensing. Uh, when funding research is probably the strongest mechanism to deal with this. So, under you know, for example, we in the U.S. we have the Bayh-Dole Act that you know there's certain rights that uh, that attach when the government funds research. We have you know 
theoretically these Martian rights where the government can use uh, the invention if it needs to. Um, we need to expand on that idea, I think, and say that you know when high income countries are funding vaccine development, that they should ask in return for certain promises with regard to the company doing everything it can to scale up production, working with other companies, uh, third party manufacturers to do this uh, in order to make that happen. Um, now, in terms of thinking of it on an international scale with regard to trips, I can't even begin to, to guess at how to kind of recraft the bargain um, and provide stronger rights for the lower income countries with regard to know-how. We would at the very least need a provision that expressly addressed um, sharing that kind of information. Okay, so uh, Tony, I hope you're taking notes. There's, there's the beginnings of a the solution there. <laughs> if, if, if I may just, just chip in here, because it's something that, you know, as a secretariat, frankly, we, we observe this uh, as, as, as non-participants, but it's worth pointing out that there is scope to use the, the existing mechanisms that, that is untapped. Uh, the, the, the TRIPS agreement has been amended, this is Article 31 bis, as it's called, to provide a, what is a novel arrangement. This is a, a, a compulsory license in one jurisdiction for export of another jurisdiction. This, this, is, this is still relatively novel and it, um, Peter Peter's absolutely right, it's, it's been scarcely used. Uh, it is, I would argue that it's not cumbersome to use in itself. Uh, for a recipient company, uh, sorry, a recipient country, a country that that, that is in need of uh, a medicine, the use of the, the system is the maximum uh, requirement is to send us two emails. That's not cumbersome. What's cumbersome is, um, I, I think, as as Corey mentioned, the uh, production capacity uh, for a generic producer, uh, as as others have mentioned possibly without the necessary know-how and, and uh, the, the secret source that, that makes that feasible. Uh, it, it, it doesn't in itself create the uh, economies of scale that, that make it feasible. Uh, you know, if, if, you're a, if you're a small island state with a population of, of a couple of hundred thousand, uh, even the most altruistic generic producer is not going to boot up a, a, a new production line to purely to serve your needs. And as we see with the, the current situation with uh, uh, Biolize and, and uh, in Canada, there are regulatory questions. Well, it's got nothing to do with uh, whether a, a government is prepared to uh, approve from a regulatory point of view, the, the production in question. Uh, and some of, the, some of the points that come up in the discussion, you could really argue either way. One of the issues is uh, in, the, in the, the, the mechanism for export under compulsory license is uh, distinctive labeling. Well, at the moment, we're having a debate about uh, how to ensure that, uh, frankly, uh, vaccine production doesn't go to uh, booster shots for uh, teenagers in, in perfect health in, in um, developed countries and are not going to uh, frontline health workers uh, in uh, resource starved uh, countries. Well, the, the purpose of the labelling is, is exactly that. It's, it's, a, it's a vaccine equity mechanism. Uh, and, and yet this is, this is, this is put forward as a, as a potential obstacle. So for me, this really sheds light on the need to really step away from some of the polemic and, and say, okay, what are the practical tools we have? How do we uh, refine them? How do we make them work more effectively? This is not, I stress, uh, to say that the waiver may not be necessary or useful because uh, a large number of our member governments have said it is, but uh, certainly uh, uh, that's not an, and everyone has said, you know, make full use of the existing mechanism. That there's no actually disagreement on that. That's an EU position. That's a position on the part of the proponents of the waiver. Uh, and uh, to me, that's that's one of the missing ingredients in the discussion. How to how to really get to grips with the existing toolkit, even while you're debating whether the toolkit should be should be broadened. But I did want to come on that because it, it, occurs, it strikes me again and again that there's an assumption 
this whole thing is is completely unworkable uh, and we're not having a debate about how to make it workable totally well, i think that's right i think one thing we talked about in the, the build-up to this was starting to um not be quite so defensive about ip as being viewed as the culprit it's quite clear that this whole panel agrees i think everyone agrees that uh, there's a it's a huge huge question where ip is a tiny tiny factor um we can come on perhaps to whether ip has had any adverse effects i suppose and i was going to come back to you barney because i think one of the areas you were going to be talking about was kind of you know the role of the role of ip so far i mean you presumably you're feeling that it's, it's had a bit of a rough ride in, in some of this some of the debate not today but in a, about the waiver generally yeah uh, it, it's <laughs> It becomes so easy to just call patent as the the, the bad guy, so to speak, um, and and it is getting a bad rap in that sense. And um, but as I said, it, particularly the life sciences area, where you need quite a bit of R and D investment upfront, and the certainty that this is actually going to work is not there. And so a lot of times it's it's um, some data, some faith, continue on and do it. And you've seen the stories over and over and over again, people continuing to do something that others are not doing it, continue to go on. I, uh, I, can, I can personally say about some of the inventors I've spoken to who have come up with these ideas, which have really helped and how they weren't sure it was going to work. They hoped so, and how excited they were. So there, there, there's there's just a, um, I, I, that that wellspring, that innovation. Uh, you know, we should let it flourish. And to me, that's important. And and if there is a solution that IP can provide in in terms of uh, minimizing vaccine inequity, absolutely, we should consider it. But what we really don't want is, you know, as you say, they throw the baby with the bathwater. And, and, and more importantly, how, how is it? What is the issue? And so we can try to solve um, the problem. And that, that's something that's what has come across over and over again. Practicality, as you said, in, in terms of, so you said as well. What is the issue here? Um, if it is compulsory licenses, and we can, okay, how do we fix it? If it is, um, we have the toolkit, are we not taking advantage of it? Why not do it? And and so, um, but having having said that, uh, uh, I, I I again want to emphasize that the patent protection has provided. Uh, uh, a, a resource for people to invest in to develop this area. And this is not the last one. We're going to see this again. We really need to continue to invest. We need to con continue to <coughs> not just be one person sitting in a garage and coming up with the, writing the software. This is this is expensive. And, and you need some kind of an investment. And to have investment, there should be some reassurance. You're going to recoup the cost. Um, and so that that framework has to be there, obviously not at the expense of anyone else's. But again, taking a step back, you know, this this is this COVID has devastated economy. And if someone is making a little bit of money, if it is, you know, if it's a company, a pharmaceutical, I'm not going to break budget. I mean, if you've saved so much to bring it to the table, and as again, it's a public service thing. We don't ever want to lose this arsenal and be caught flat-footed. To me, that worries me a lot more than anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, and hopefully there's a stronger and stronger recognition that there's been a lot of vocal um, expression about this. You know, the, the IP system does, it does stimulate innovation. Perhaps the question becomes, at what point does it have to kind of balance itself against other other aspects? But I'm, I'm going to bring Corey in because Corey, I think you had you, you're itching to speak. You said you had a few things to add in. So well, please. no, thank you. And I, I have had a chance to speak, so it's not that bad. Um, <laughs> to 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 uh, reference another quadruped, I guess uh, you know, and I, I was going to actually say the elephant in the room, but it's not. It's no longer the elephant in the room because it's it's been exposed and talked about, which is. I think you know vaccine nationalism is is one of the biggest factors here and to make that point you know and also i think this is really important factual context for the audience um, i looked up the latest statistics on where we are in vaccine production because banu i think framed a great question what is the issue 
And in my mind, you know, the issue is certainly not vaccine production. It's where the vaccines are going and whether they're getting into arms in the right place. So just to give, you know, some, some quick data here, um, which is difficult to argue. And this is from Our World in Data, by the way, which is a, a University of Oxford. You can look it up on the Internet. So in, in the last 10 months, right, since the vaccines were launched, there have been over 9.3 billion doses that have been produced. Um, by the year end, it is anticipated that we'll be at 12 billion. And by the middle of next year, frankly, before I think even the proponents of the waiver, everyone agrees, before anyone else is able to start making vaccines, by mid-2022, there will be over 24 billion doses that will have been produced. As we speak, as of yesterday, 3.91 billion of the world's 5.8 billion adults, which is over 67% of adults have received at least one dose, and 53% of the world's adults have been fully vaccinated. That's a fact, uh, more than half the world. Now, absolutely without question, you know, there's an inequity in terms of who those, where those adults are. Uh, they are primarily, you know, in, in, in the wealthier countries, particularly LICs are where I think it's less than 4% right now of, of adults. But even there, I will say that 2.1 billion doses have been delivered to the LICs and the LMICs, and about 50% uh, of, of adults in LICs and LMICs have received at least one dose. Um, you know, and then the last kind of piece of data I'd like to point out is that you know, I would certainly make a robust argument that the reason why we've been able to scale up and have 9.3 billion doses already made in 10 months and that we will be on target to have 12 to 24 billion in the next six, six months is because of IP, not by putting it aside. IP has, as a matter of fact, brought together, there's 331 current manufacturing deals, according to IFPMA. I can tell you from one perspective, some that I know are real because we're a member. Uh, we are manufacturing vaccine for, for BioNTech at Novartis. We have set aside factory space. We've set aside over 100 employees, diverted them from other projects to be part of this network. And there are 331 similar deals. And this is all done because of voluntary licensing and collaborative approaches to IP that has gotten us to a point. And just the last maybe point here is to put this in perspective, you know, for polio vaccine, it's been 65 years and we still haven't vaccinated the whole world. Um, you know, it took 20 years to create that vaccine and it took decades to actually get scale enough to start distributing that throughout the world. So the fact that we were at 9 billion doses in 10 months, to me, just looking at the numbers says whether you believe IP was important or not in doing it as a factual matter on the numbers, which I think are hard to dispute, we are now at the point where we have almost enough doses for the whole world and certainly will have enough doses for the whole world within the next six months. That doesn't mean that the people who need the doses are getting them, which to me says, what is the problem? Is it, how, how is it IP the problem? How is the waiver going to address that? To me, the problem is that we have too many doses sitting in a small number of countries who have bought up too many doses and aren't actually doing their part to distribute them. And then we also, the last piece I'll say is if for now, we don't have, I think, the logistics and the, the support we need on the ground to actually get vaccines into arms. And there are stories, for example, of hundreds of millions of doses being sent to, I think it was Rwanda or one of the, one of the African countries, where unfortunately the vaccine sat on a runway or, an, or an, an airport hangar and spoiled before they could be put into arms because the logistical, you know, on the ground infrastructure that you need has been proven difficult even in the United States at the beginning, you know, let alone in poor countries. So. This is just all to say, I think this was said earlier, there's a, there's a problem here. There's a lot of factors. I'm just not convinced that IP is one of them at all, um, you know, but it's certainly not, not a major one when you look at, at the numbers and the production and the other factors going on. So I'm sure people will have responses to that, but that's a mouthful. But that's what I wanted to put forward. If I could jump in. Please. Uh, so just two points that I wanna make. Um, First, I agree that the politics, like the politics, the nationalism, like there's real issues there. We actually saw this with India, where, you know, India had been pushing for the IP waiver and as recently as February was actually giving away vaccine doses. And as far as we could tell, it was trying to compete with China uh, for soft power influence. So it was giving away its doses while its population had a very low rate of vaccination. And then in April, the Delta wave hit 
and suddenly it's, you know, suddenly it realized, oh, wait a minute, we need those vaccines for ourselves and now we'll no longer allow them to be exported, uh, even though our agreements required us to do so. So we definitely see some strange political machinations going on and beyond just the hoarding that's going on in countries like the US. But I do want to, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that we have seen patent rights get in the way with regard to drug access, not with vaccines necessarily, but we saw it with remdesivir, where um, the Gilead Sciences took time before it licensed out uh, its technology to other companies uh, and to other countries. And during that time, Bangladesh, not subject to patent laws as a um, least, developed, uh, least developed country, was able to replicate it, was able to, able to scale it up, and was able to start exporting it to 19 other LDCs. So to me, that says if we, you know, the US, if the EU had actually started granting compulsory licenses, if, you know, we had taken responsibility in that regard, that we could have alleviated some of the remdesivir shortages at the very least. So to me, that says that patent rights are at least playing a role. They're not everything as, as Banu, as you've uh, mentioned, but I think that they're definitely playing a role. And that comes to the, well, the exclusivity. So I think there's consensus that IP uh, obviously is the facilitator and stimulator of innovation, incredibly important. But as you say, of course, it's a monopoly. That's the way it works. And I think at the beginning, we were talking about the interaction with competition and intellectual property. There are always at tensions. And actually, Peter, if I can come back to you, um, you've written your excellent uh, critical appraisal of the COVID-19 trips waiver. Um, one of the points you you, you focus on is the, the what you call the intersection of intellectual property and public health and whether there's a common objective there. Do you want to expand on that? Because that seems to be tied in with this kind of tension that we're talking about here. So you're on mute, you're on mute. Okay. Please continue. When we're thinking about the intersection between uh, IP and human uh, and, and, and public health, uh, we can of the fact that uh, different international bodies are focusing on different issues. And so when we talk about WTO, we're thinking about international trade. When we're thinking about WIPO, we're thinking about uh, intellectual property issues. And then when we go to WHO, and now with the ongoing discussion of the pandemic treaty, we're focusing mostly on health. And so I think it's actually quite important for us to get uh, different people together to think about how to move forward. Uh, I think uh, 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 a lot of the panelists agree that just having a waiver will not necessarily get us the vaccine or some of the health products and technologies we need. But at the same time, I think Samna also has a very good point that there have been instances where we know that uh, patents have become barriers to some of the issues uh, with respect to uh, how to address a public health uh, crisis within the country. And on top of that, I also think that international trade has a very important role to play in light of the fact that a lot of countries are actually very compliance oriented to the point that they don't want to take advantage of all the flexibilities available in the TRIPS agreement or other agreements, fearing that they will face uh, trade retaliation or repercussions, right? So Kali has made a good point about how uh, there are no flexibilities and um, Article 31 bis is, uh, is not used widely due to other reasons. But we are all lawyers here. We can all think of a lot of reasons why a lot of the provisions within a TRIPS agreement are not widely used. The devotee, I think from the standpoint of policy makers in developed countries is, if there are all these possibilities and there are no good examples that it has been used, uh, then they consider that not particularly useful for their own purposes, right? So we have seen that discussion with the Trips Council where the developed pointed out that there are a lot of flexibilities and yet the developing countries feel that they cannot use them effectively. So go on, if I could just, make Please. a couple of quick responsive points to both Sapna and, and Peter. I mean, I think, you know, sure, there have been situations where, um, you know, 
where a patent owner hasn't necessarily licensed to everybody who wants a license. Um, you know, I'd say a couple of responses to that. One is, you know, I, I would never want us to be making, you know, policies like waiving an entire World Trade Organization agreement, which is the foundation of the last 20 years of innovation and trade policy in a lot of respects on the basis of a couple of anecdotes and a couple of situations. Second, I'd say that, you know, that's a case where, to Tony's opening point, we have flexibilities for exactly that situation. If, if there is a belief on the part of a country that a patent is getting in the way of, of, you know, of a necessary access in a national emergency, that's exactly what Article 31 was negotiated you know, to, to, to perform that role. And you know, in the case of, uh, of, of this one, they didn't need the compulsory license because it was Bangladesh, but they certainly could have exercised it right there. Maybe just bringing in the Bolivia point, I mean, I think that one is really an unfair example. This is a, a you know, Bolivia wanted a compulsory license to an unspecified set of patents in a situation where there is no evidence, according to the Canadian government, of the ability of the of the the entity seeking that license to actually make the vaccine. And I guess my last point, which I've made earlier, but I wanted to just put a cap on all of this, is, you know, since we all seem to agree that it's in the case of vaccines, unlike small molecules, I mean, you need a lot more than patents. It sure seems to me like the you know the the productive and constructive way to achieve those things, as I pointed out with the 331 current deals, is to create incentives and voluntary you know, mechanisms for innovators to collaborate with others and engage in tech transfer on a voluntary basis, which is actually what has happened, right? Again, that's how we got to 9.3 billion doses today. Um, I'm, and it's, you know, I, I'm sure there's some points of view that say it's not enough, it's not fast enough, you know, it's not enough entities involved, but and I think it's a pretty good showing, 9.3 billion doses, 331 deals in 10 months. And um, so again, I mean, I, you know, I don't see how restricting the IP, taking it away, you know, putting, um, uh, waiving agreement get you what, seem, what really can only be shared by, by collaborative approaches in, you know, from a practical perspective. Thank you. I think we'll spend the last few minutes kind of addressing that, turning that one round and saying, well, what can IP do? Um, but just before that, just to remind the audience that you can still pop stuff into the Q&A. I think we've cleared off questions as we've gone to a certain extent. We've, we've dealt with some of the kind of political issues and also the know-how issues. Um, there is one sitting here um, from Anne Burkhart about the, and Corey, you kind of touched on this just now, actually addressing the quality risks associated with third party manufacturers. Um, You've talked a little bit about the capacity, um, and we've talked also about know-how and everything. Um, I don't. Is is this a genuine risk you feel? I, I mean, in my view, it is. I mean, I don't want to malign any given entity because there are entities I think that 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 can produce high quality all over the world. By the way, you know that 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 are capable of producing high quality um, vaccines. But the issue is that even the most sophisticated parties can sometimes have quality issues. We saw this with emergent bio, uh, bio solutions in Baltimore, which was one of the manufacturing partners in the US of J&J &J and AstraZeneca at the beginning, um, even though AstraZeneca didn't get approved. Um, we have seen this, I think more recently with Moderna and their Spanish uh, partner um, that was creating part of the vaccines. And we had an issue in Japan with uh, some residue and things like that. And I think it just, you know, realistically, entities that have not, uh, you know, been at this and aren't don't aren't at the latest technological levels have a higher risk, I would say, of having quality issues. Uh, and the problem with quality issues is not just the quality for a particular batch, but it also adds to I think the overall undermining in confidence of the vaccines that leads to greater vaccine hesitancy and safety issues and potential delays and confusion over, you know, source who's getting what. Um, so I do think it's an issue. I, I don't think it's it is the only issue, and I don't think it it means that that there shouldn't be more partnering. It, but but it's something that needs to be dealt with, I think, and 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 is real. If I could just quickly add, oh sorry, just that I agree with that. And when we're in a shortage situation of raw materials, having spoiled doses like that's particularly dangerous. Given right now that you know there's been a bottleneck with raw materials needed to produce the vaccines. Uh, I, I just add that this has come up in the in the debate over the trips waiver, and the point has been made. You know, and I, and I think you know it's, it's quite clear that, in principle, uh, entitlement to 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 make the stuff um, uh, in, in IP terms, whether with a license or with a compulsory license, is is in a distinct category from 
whether this uh, the pro uh, the production is is um, uh, clear from a regulatory point of view, uh, and uh, uh, it's it's true that you know ultimately it is up to the regulator to to determine whether the product is safe and effective, uh, but it, it it really does does underscore the point that. Uh, relaxing the, the effect of IP does not uh, replace uh, regulation. And we've seen this, in fact, in, in uh, the use of the, the, the TRIPS amendment of Article 31 BIS, uh, issues like uh, procurement policy and uh, regulation for safety and efficacy don't go away. Uh, they remain there. Uh, and so it's a reminder that uh, opening up legal avenues for production uh, in the IP system don't uh, just simply wish away uh, regulatory questions and, and nor would you want that to be the case we're talking about vaccines that we're putting in people's arms thank you so for the last few minutes um let's talk a bit about the last couple of points we wanted to to touch on um first of all i think we've had a this has been a fantastic discussion and I've, I've really enjoyed not having to moderate at all, but just watch you guys go for it, which is a nice relaxing session for me. I like that. But there's some th some threads have come out that uh, IP, IP, if it's a culprit at all, then that's highly questionable. Um, certainly isn't the biggest or only culprit. There are much bigger issues. There are, there are, there are pragmatic issues of supply chains. There are um, political issues of vaccine nationalism and everything else. And an IP just sits in there somewhere as one of, as one of them. Often IP is seen as this, uh, as, as, as just a barrier, as just a block, as a wall. Um, it's a monopoly to stop third parties, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, Tony, I think words that have come out from, from your presentation have, have included collaboration, uh, cooperation and coordination. Um, three, um, three fantastic goals. I think we shouldn't forget that obviously IP isn't necessarily something that you use to stop things happening. It's something that you use to provide a fair exchange of, uh, of information, of know-how, of, of everything else as well. And so, um, actually, Corey, if I can come back to you, I mean, you've mentioned a couple of times that some of the initiatives we've already seen. It's, it's really worth reminding people in maybe one or two minutes, you know, what have you seen already where IP has actually done a good thing here? Let's, let's remember this. Yeah, I'll just be brief on that because I've, I've touched on it a few times. I mean, you know, look, of course, a, 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 the owner of an IP right can use it to exclude others. That is its primary functioning in terms of a patent, at least. That's how it works. It can also be used in a different way, though, uh, through licensing. And, you know, it's very situational in terms of, of what role it plays and, and, and what the rights holder decides to do with it in a given situation. And just one more quick thing. I mean, in the big picture, at least for our industry, the the exclu using it for the exclusive nature, as Banu mentioned, is critical in order to, of course, generate uh, the kinds of returns that are needed to reinvest in R and D and enable a, a systemic and sustainable R and D program. But in the context of this pandemic, I think you know IP has played a role not just on the innovation, which happened so quickly, but also uh, and quickly in the sense that over the finish line. But as Banu says, you know, decades before that of building the raw materials and the starting points because of IP. But on the collaboration side, if you are, you know, someone who owns IP and feels, you know, a need to to work with others in order to increase production or, you know, join together with it for innovation purposes, for R&D, having IP is actually what gives you the confidence from a business perspective to be able to do that. If you expect people to open up their compound libraries, share their trade secrets and know how, um, you know, and, 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 and open up their confidences, confidential information and expertise in other ways, the best way that you can do that is to use IP as a tool to bring parties together and give the reassurances that at the end of this collaboration or for issues outside of this collaboration, you don't have to worry because we have an agreement and we have intellectual property rights that define the contours of that relationship. And that, in our experience, has led to sharing more information and these 331 collaborations that I mentioned, uh, rather than the opposite, where some people say, well, IP is going to prevent people from coming together. I think it, if you take away the IP, that's when you get people to shut the door, close everything up and say, I'm not going to share my know-how, I'm not going to share my trade secrets. And you can't get them because, you know, some of them you can, but it's very hard to get the rest without a collaborative effort. So I think, you know, in that way, IP has really played a, a, a 
um, a, a quite a different role than we often talk about in terms of innovation as an incentive. It's worked to, to bring parties together on the collaboration side too. Thank you. Um, I'm, going to last, I'm going to give the last word um, slightly arbitrarily to, to Sapna, um, <laughs> looking at the time. So looking at, so where, where do national governments fit in? How might they be able to do something about this? I think we need to see it at the funding level. Governments spend a lot of taxpayer money funding medical research. And at that point in time, when we're not in a pandemic, that's the time to negotiate with regard to what happens to the subsequently developed technology in the event of a pandemic, in the event of a drug shortage. So the time to plan is when we fund the research and not when we're in a pandemic, when vaccines have already been developed with an expectation of certain IP rights, but rather beforehand so that everybody can agree up front uh, in terms of when they're taking the funding, they know what they're getting into. Thank you. And Tony, hopefully this all sounds familiar and something that, that WTO is, is I, I hopefully working towards in this consensus to consent. Uh, not the WTO as such, because it's, it's beyond our remit, but I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, to some extent, ironically, the, the debate is, is about a form of IP management. And that's the situation where if it is indeed, as we hear, uh, uh, public funds going into supporting research, well, with that comes the possibility of leverage. And how do you exercise that leverage? Well, that's actually partly a function of the IP system. In other words, IP is not necessarily only deployed by, by the private sector. I mean, that's, that's an empirical fact. And, and indeed, we see this in, increasingly in the, uh, the innovation ecosystem here in Geneva, where there's, there's uh, uh, public-private partnerships and, and, and various combinations, especially uh, in serving uh, uh, the, the the least resourced communities, the, the least you know, frankly, where, where there are communities that don't don't constitute a market, but constitute a, a burning humanitarian need, and so there is that possibility of of, of uh, using the leverage that comes with uh, uh, funding and and, uh, and and public support, philanthropic support, to leverage access, uh, whether it's through the IP system or, or, or separately. So, you know, it's a reminder that, uh, uh, yeah, as, as Sapna said, this is this is a broader a policy question. And I think well, well beyond the WTO, the, the, the World Health Organization is uh, uh, just before our ministerial conference convening a, a, a high level meeting of, of the World Health Assembly to talk about exactly these questions of uh, future uh, uh, financing of, uh, of uh, the pandemic response and uh, uh, issues of transparency and, and, and broader questions that you know have to be brought together so we, we do need that that i think everyone agrees we need that integrated connected response uh involving the ip issues sure but setting them in that broader context thank you so we're about to finish thank you so much banu um something's disappeared but thank you cory peter tony it's been fantastic a bit of optimism there and in particular a real feeling that the issues are understood Our sort of mandate and purpose for this panel is to discuss the Federal Circuit in review, which is a very broad topic. We are primarily interested in, among the panelists, in discussing some structural decisions that have come down, primarily as they pertain to the PTAB and to life sciences innovation in particular. So as we go through our various topics, the format we will follow is that each uh, panelists will uh, take the, the lead on a different topic and then others will join in and offer their thoughts. So um, to begin with, of course, uh, one of the biggest uh, decisions of the year, which came down from the Supreme Court uh, this spring, was uh, Arthrex versus Smith and Nephew, in which the Supreme Court held that uh, the administrative patent judges of the USPTO Patent Trial and Appeal Board uh, were exercising the powers of officers under the appointments clause and that the terms of their appointments uh, and, and sort of the, the reviewability of their decisions had to but according to so to lead off on that uh, let me please invite uh, Tiffany for some opening yes remarks. yes of course hi everyone um, I thought I would start by uh, kind of giving us a procedural background of this case so we can all uh, walk through what happened and then uh, discuss it after that 
So uh, as it started off, um, uh, Smith and Nephew uh, challenged uh, Arthrex's uh, patent at the PTAB. Three uh, administrative patent judges found that the patent was invalid. And so when Arthrex appealed to the federal circuit, they argued that the APJs um, were principal officers under the appointments clause. And therefore, because their, review, uh, their decision was not reviewable and was not, um, uh, they could not be removed at will, that it was unconstitutional uh, that they were issuing a final unreviewable decision on behalf of the executive branch, essentially. The federal circuit uh, reviewed it, you know, agreed that there was a problem. And the way that they suggested to fix it was to simply remove sort of the tenure provision of the APJs, uh, which would then allow them to be removed. So it didn't address at all the review of the decision. It, it addressed sort of that second prong. Um, the, the parties all then petitioned for a rehearing on Bank, which was denied. And then they all petitioned up to the Supreme Court uh, for review there. The Supreme Court got the case looked at it and agreed basically that these, uh, they, they really focused on the, the difference between a principal officer and an inferior officer. And so that we all can remember what that means, a principal officer uh, is someone that is nominated by the president and uh, confirmed by the Senate. An inferior officer is someone that can be nominated by or appointed by the president, a court of law, or um, like the head of a department. And so they, the, the disconnect here was basically that they were saying APJs were not confirmed by the Senate. They were appointed by the director, or I'm sorry, the Secretary of Commerce, and they, they never went to that uh, level of having Senate confirmation, and therefore they needed someone to oversee their work or oversee their decisions that did go through that process. So they, uh, the Supreme Court decided that um, having the power to render a final decision on behalf of the United States without any review by a superior or someone that, as I mentioned, had gone through the appointment and nomination and confirmation process was unconstitutional. But the way that they decided to address this was to simply make one portion of a statute uh, unenforceable against the director. And that portion of the statute was uh, it's Section 6C that says the PTAB has the power to grant rehearings. They said that line is not enforceable against the director. It's enforceable against everyone else, but the director has to be able to uh, rehear and, and re-decide these PTAB decisions. Um, interestingly, I thought the Supreme Court does sort of acknowledge that what the Federal Circuit did maybe would address the constitutionality thing, but then they basically said, but we think this is a better solution, so we're going to go with this. And then the case was remanded back. Um, oh, sorry, two more things. One was that they said this only applies to IPRs, not to other things that the PTAB decides. And um, they said that the director doesn't actually have to review all of the decisions. They just need the discretion of whether or not to review the decisions. So that's sort of what the, the Supreme Court said. And that was back in June, uh, in July-ish, uh, the USPTO entered some temporary interim guidelines of how to even go about this um, that, of course, have now sort of been up for debate a little bit, too, because we have an acting director, not a <laughs> uh, nominated and confirmed by the Senate director in that role, at least as of today. Um, so that's kind of the background that I wanted to start with. And I wanted to ask kind of the other panelists of what your what your thoughts are and what you think this might mean for the future. So, uh, Adam, let me uh, invite you to, to offer some of your thoughts as well, please. Thanks. It was a, a great overview, Tiffany. And, um, you know, I, I find Arthrex very interesting because I believe that Arthrex finally settled uh, once and for all uh, kind of this um, longstanding conundrum presented by the PTAB to the U.S. Supreme Court because the PTAB um, has been a bit of a, for lack of a better term, an administrative platypus. Um, it's uh, It has features of an Article Three court duck, <laughs> and it has features of an administrative agency tribunal beaver. <laughs> and you can, and, and that was deliberate because it's supposed to be engaging in 
legal analysis of the of the patentability requirements of issued patents and so it's not supposed to be susceptible to the policy variations that you would expect under under um <clears throat> under changes in administration as implemented through various agencies and as you would expect to see in the tribunals in those respective agencies such as the ftc and the sec and other and other agencies and um and you can really kind of see how the court has been struggling with this in fact during all our argument in arthrex they kept referring to PTAB as an odd duck i prefer platypus because it captures this kind of perfectly and you can kind of and it's kind of captured by the distinctions between like uh quozo where the supreme court said well this is clearly an agency we should give it chevron deference and adopting the bri standard and things of the sort and then sas institute where the supreme court says no it's more like an article three court and it needs to follow rules and Arthrex, I think, really reflects kind of a settling of this kind of confusion and concern by the Supreme Court finally saying, no, we're going to treat the PTAB like an administrative agency tribunal. We are going, we, we want to, we, we want to see this treated as, and we expect to see it structured like other agencies and other agency tribunals within the administrative state. Um, and so, <clears throat> just Chief Justice Roberts rewrote the statute to make it more like an administrative tribunal and more responsive, therefore, to the type of policy decisions that you would expect to see in other agencies um, with changes in administration and um, thus making it, you know, appeals to the director, which were not included because it was supposed to be insulated from the kind of the policy uh, decision making authority that the director might have. Um, and so this is going to really present an interesting conundrum, I think, going forward, because what it means is that we will now see, I think, um, and, we'll, uh, and we'll expect to see kind of variations and changes now in the PTAB rules, um, given the you know changes in director and changes in administration. And this kind of reflects, I think, a fundamental shift in the nature of the patent system, which has you know reflected much more of the elements of a kind of a private law system of private property rights adjudicated mm -hmm. through Article Three courts up until 2011. And so the question kind of that raises kind of, I think, a very fundamental and interesting question about whether that actually is good for long term investments um, and the type, you know, providing the type of stability in the kind of the platform of property rights that drive the innovation economy. So, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add to you. Be a <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, no, I'll, I'll just add a couple of thoughts. I think both of these uh, sets of remarks so far are very well taken. Um, in in my view, I think you know the the decision that the uh, the majority opinion uh, made to rewrite the statute, as as Adam said, um, you know, it's it's sort of a a compromise. It's, it's clearly a pragmatic, you know, sort of response to what the the court was confronted with. Mm -hmm. um, what it has going for it is that it is less disruptive than what the federal circuit did. Yeah. Uh, I think the federal circuit was very influenced, and and I think understandably influenced by the D.C. Circuit decision in intercollegiate broadcasting, in which a very similar question of whether copyright royalty judges are principal officers or inferior officers. Uh, because they are appointed not by the president with Senate confirmation, but the librarian of Congress, and therefore they had better be inferior officers or else we have a big problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that decision, the DC Circuit followed a concurring opinion case that had been written by then DC Circuit Judge Kavanaugh. And now, of course, you know, Justice Kavanaugh sitting on the court um, is, uh, is at least one uh, vote that the Federal Circuit might have looked to and said, well, yeah, that's at least one person who and remove the tenure protections and make the copyright royalty judges um, uh, removable at will. And so the APJs being at will seems like a reasonable move uh, to, to impose the level of control, managerial control, that would make them inferior officers. Now that solves the problem or solved the problem at the time, but it created, I think, a much greater one, which is that you want fairly independent decision-making in the adjudicatory setting whether it's agency adjudication or Article Three type adjudication, the adjudicatory function should be done without the fear of you might get fired by a politically appointed agency head because they didn't like the outcome. Um, and I think there are reasons to expect that the culture of the PTO probably wouldn't make that a huge, but any level of sort of political, you know, uh, pressure on on the perceived independence of the and the, the Supreme Court's decision got rid of that. They are now removable for cause as they were. Um, and there's agency head review. So they could have just said, 
um, this is for, uh, for Congress to re-legislate, uh, as in mm -hmm. fact Congress did in the Trademark Modernization Act uh, to make TTAB de decisions by, by administrative trademark judges. Agency had reviewable. They, they didn't fix that on the patent side. The Supreme Court did it for them, and that's fine. But um, that I think that was a reasonable middle ground that even if Congress doesn't do it, we can at least improve upon the at will removal of you know, supposedly independent decision makers. So that's, that's our one starting point. Um, I think the other major uh, thing that I took away from Arthrex is that it's a continuation of a really important historical arc. Um, there's a lot of antecedent history to inform what we, what we see uh, because agency had review of examiners in chief who were the precursors of administrative patent judges. Um, did exist in, in the patent systems history starting in 1836 all the way until the late 1920s when Congress uh, repealed it by statute and said there's no more agency head review, direct unilateral agency head review uh, by the commissioner. And the reason for that, and I think it was sort of weakly formed, is that it's just impractical for the director to do this. Now, there's no doubt, or excuse me, the commissioner to do this. Uh, that's true. Um, but the commissioner wouldn't have to do it. The commissioner would simply have to have the option to do it in order for the accountability, you know, to sort of flow to the to the commissioner and from the commissioner on up to the to the president. So, uh, reintroducing agency head review now, you know, low these many decades later, is simply a restoration of a long-held status quo uh, that I think was sort of in a, ill advised uh, to remove in the first place. And then the other major historical point is that. Uh, examiners in chief used to be until 1975 appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Now, that doesn't answer the question of whether they were principal officers or inferior officers, because inferior officers can be appointed by that mechanism as well. Mm -hmm. But it sort of didn't matter, right? You could increase or decrease their responsibilities without worrying because they were already subject to presidential appointment with Senate confirmation. So they were previously at least capable of being principal officers because they were appointed that way. Then they had to be inferior officers from 1975 forward. And of course, in 1999, um, Congress again uh, downgraded their status to employees uh, because uh, they said that the office of the director of USPTO it didn't have to be the secretary, the head of a department anymore. And now we're seeing ever since then the, the upswing back in the other direction following Professor Duffy's influential article in the early 2000s, um, they went back to being at least inferior officers who had to be appointed by the secretary and now principal officers um, in scope, so long as uh, it's only with the director overseeing them that they become inferior officers again. So we're seeing this sort of uh, pendulum swing uh, from one direction all the way to sort of the other direction now. And it's in that historical context that we should really understand this. Um, so those are those are some takeaways I had from from the decision. Um, yeah, I was curious too. You know, since since this has happened, it doesn't look like really anything has happened. I think there's been a handful of denials, but nothing really after that. And I'm curious to see if when the new director takes shape, if that's going to mm -hmm. change, or if they're going to change the procedure. Or right now, like it, it like I said, it doesn't seem like it's made much of a difference. Um, but I'm curious to know if in the long haul that will. And if so, what's the standard for whether or not they decide to, you know, review it? Is there any, you know, historical basis for what it needs to be, or is it just purely discretionary? Yeah, I'm having yeah. a hard time deciding whether it's going to matter or not mm -hmm. uh, from yeah. a practitioner's perspective. Um, mm -hmm. it, I, I think I'm leaning toward it's going to matter, but I mean, one result is that it could just slow everything down. Right, like just it mm -hmm. could just bring everything, um, and and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that you know, with with the in terms of things get to trial, maybe maybe slowing that process down is a good thing. Um, on the substantive point, though, I think it's a strategic element in in various disputes, which is that now when we're on the cusp of regime change, we might have a new strategic element of because of you know bringing things through the PTAB or or if there's going to be regime change policy change um, you know court that the then you know maybe I wait a year to bring suit 
hurry up and get the suit in before we know which direction the next the next regime is going to go. And and I think we're going to see time forum shopping now as a addition to to location forum shopping. Um, yeah. That's that's sort of where I'm headed in terms of it mattering the most. I'm not sure it's really going to matter a lot substantively. Um, I think that's right too. Um, you know. The, you know, the Supreme Court has been very interested in this kind of structural limitation that's imposed upon administrative agencies through the Appointments Clause and in many recent cases in La Chia and, you know, these cases were cited by the Federal Circuit. And these cases have had almost zero substantive impact, actually, on the on the outcomes of, of administrative hearings uh, in various other agencies at the SEC and elsewhere. And so I, I don't think it'll have much of a direct immediate substantive impact, but the case is still going to produce, I think, continuing litigation. Um, at, on the least, I've heard at least two grounds for potential further cases. One is, you know, the uh, Drew Hirschfield. This is the patent commissioner mm -hmm. has not been an appointed. Is not. Right. A, is not. Are a, we having the same problem point. again? <laughs> yeah, and he's he's now decided two two appeals. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and that's handing on a silver platter another another mm -hmm. uh, another lawsuit. Um, and also the nature of his appeals will probably be, be similar to the appeals going forward, which is they were summary affirmances. And under the APA, administrative action has to be reasoned and, I, and, and you have to provide some explanations for administrative action. And so that there, 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 may, there certainly may be further litigation on these issues um, now under the APA um, and even potentially under the Appointments Clause. So one, one thing that I would ask, and I see a question in the uh, in the chat that uh, we might uh, productively engage with here, what will it be the, the procedural avenue for a party to appeal to the director? Uh, well, current uh, policy following the Arthrex decision, you know, the current guidance is that at least as an interim measure, the mechanism to request review is quite similar to the current rehearing procedures under uh, 42.71D uh, of the CFR and standard operating procedure two. Now, that is only that um, Commissioner Hirschfeld is performing the functions of the, and it's not actually acting director uh, under the Vacancies Act, right? It's uh, it's not formally the acting director. It's performing the functions of the director and undersecretary. And the, a, an appropriate cautious history of not making big moves during in, periods of interim leave. Really, uh, I think see it as, confirmed presidentially appointed uh, agency had to make those kinds of moves. My guess is that the procedure will probably also, um, if it does change, up through one of three ways. Uh, one is uh, the standard operating procedure, uh, which is something that the agency and the panel rehearing things. Um, it's also possible that the um, the adjudicatory process itself, right? The, the presidential opinion panel hasn't gone away and it might still remain a useful adjunct to what the, the agency head review process yields. And they might say, here's the, these are gonna be done as a matter of uh, administrative common law and um, practice is. The third, and I think the most probably uh, avenue for doing this will be rulemaking. And that will make it, mm -hmm. to Stephanie's point, I think, a little bit more resilient uh, to regime change so that we can minimize, you know, uh, the need for strategic behavior. And uh, if it's done by rulemaking, it's sort of up front. Everybody gets uh, from the public and, and the bench and the bar gets to have their be much more satisfying and accountable way to, to figure out how these things are done. Uh, so that's that's what I would sort uh, of procedure. Um, Laura, any thoughts on on this? Do you, or, no, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I also don't want to. You don't. Okay. No, I think she gestured to move on. <laughs> yeah. Fair. Uh, Muting issues. I think we've had a very wholesome discussion. Waiting for okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Well, then uh, let's let's take a look then at uh, a particular um, structural uh, uh, detail under uh, you know the subconstitutional status of of Arthrex um, that the PTAB itself has been dealing with. Um, 
ever since about 2018, 2019, uh, during the, the, the Yonkou administration at the USPTO, um, in addition to looking at how courts respond to uh, institution decisions, particularly following the SAS Institute uh, you know, sort of uh, decision that ended partial institution and whether stays were being granted, parallel proceedings, duplicative litigation was going on in the courts. Uh, the flip side on the has also been uh, developing in the form of discretionary denials. This is where building on the general plastic framework, dealing with serial petitions inside the PTAB itself, the, the institution uh, stage, the board at the institution stage has started looking at whether the court proceeding, the co-pending court proceeding has uh, gone so far uh, along and is so close to a decision that it's just not worth the PTO's time, the PTAB's time to grant institution because the court will finish uh, well before, uh, before or potentially well before the deadline of the PTAB. This was first memorialized uh, of course, in NHK Spring versus Intraplex, which was sort of an extension of the general. And then uh, a year later in Apple versus Fintiv. And so this NHK Fintiv doctrine, so-called the NHK Fintiv doctrine, has proven to be quite controversial, uh, including an APA lawsuit filed uh, in the Northern District of California uh, about a year and change ago uh, against the USPTO, and uh, a desire to see uh, rulemaking rather than the administrative common law development of this doctrine. So uh, because this is something that I've looked at, uh, uh, I'll, I'll kick off the question. Uh, I think, you know, there are two things about the NHK Fintive doctrine that, that really bear uh, close scrutiny. One is whether the agency even has the authority to do this. Uh, and this was a question raised quite directly by the APA lawsuit that was brought uh, by uh, a number of tech companies uh, you know, Intel and, and Google and others uh, in that APA lawsuit, uh, does does the uh, the PTAB, the USPTO, even have the authority under the AIA to engage in this kind of policy making through adjudication, or must they go through uh, notice and comment rulemaking? That's one question, and then the other is uh, is this even consonant with the assuming they have the power to do it? Is it good policy? Is it consonant with the the aims of the America Invents Act to uh, make action which was extraordinarily uh, costly and, and prone to delay and, and these sorts of problems. Um, is it is it good policy to stay its hand subject to what's going on in the courts? Uh, I think most of us would agree that if the PTAB has already acted, in group, it would be good policy for the court to grant a stay unless there was some compelling reason not to do so. Um, so in, in my view, at least, and I've written about this in and, and in my scholarship and other places, uh, I think it is probably within the legal authority of the court to do this. And, and my sort of thinking on this starts from two, two historical, uh, again, history is, is quite important, uh, two historical antecedents. One is that we've seen a lot of Supreme Court decisions in the last decade um, that construe PTAB discretion at the institution stage very broadly. Cuso went in that direction and said the decision uh, to, to grant it, uh, and it was actually phrased whether to grant institution, either one knows, is soundly discretion of the agency, and it's final and non-appealable. If it's tied to connections, uh, decisions related to institution, that is off limits to judicial review as well. We saw something of a retrenchment with SAS Institute, although that was a case, you know, we, we were dealing with the, the partial institution uh, question, but the only reason that was necessary to decide is because eventually the question posed in that case was whether uh, the final obligation of reasoned decision-making, which is subject to judicial review, whether that has to address all of the claims challenged in the petition or only uh, just the few that were perhaps instituted upon. So to answer that final reasoned decision-making question, uh, the agency, but then again, in five versus click a call last year, the court said the one year time bar, which is sort of uh, at the moment of institution, that's when we're deciding this, uh, is also not subject to judicial review. So, you know, whatever your opinions on the merits of each of those decisions, the court has spoken pretty clearly um, that discretion is broad, and the only times discretion will be subjected to judicial oversight 
sort of pretty specific uh, and, and pretty, you know, sort of few and far between. Um, so that's a sort of baseline that the court has given us. Uh, the other big piece of history as between whether this can be done via uh, adjudication or has to be done via rulemaking, um, there's Supreme Court case law outside the patent system going back to the 1940s, right over 70, 80 years of precedent, uh, beginning with SEC versus Chenery that said the form of agency decision making is usually up to the agency. Um, and uh, and it's really for them to decide the want to proceed uh, transparently, accountably, ex ante, uh, through rulemaking, or do they want to take advantage of the full set of facts that might come case by case and make policy incrementally? Um, and that decision, uh, the Supreme Court has, has repeatedly said, belongs to the agency. Now, I think I would tend to agree that rulemaking is preferable uh, for the reasons of accountability and transparency and predictability in the patent system, um, which, which I'm certainly a fan of. But, uh, you know, as I've, as I've said in those other situations, um, it's there's a different policy preference and a sort of environment. and I don't think the agency is required uh, to do this. Um, so that's the that's the sort of point about history. Now, is it good policy? Uh, I think that's an empirical question, and it's an open question at the moment. Uh, some of the work that I've been doing sort of all year, uh, you know, to date, and and I'm still doing uh, some of my uh, initial findings suggest that. For the most part, NHK Fintive, although it plays a salient role, is actually not playing a particularly widespread role. Uh, and so whatever controversy it's generating, right, it's important, it's, it's uh, well-deserved, but uh, the empirical sort of how big an effect is this having on the ground? And here are some numbers to, to sort of give you some context. Um, over the period of uh, October 2018, so uh, six months after SAS Institute, which is both a good milestone in terms of petitions filed right after SAS, would have gone through um, petition, preliminary patent office, uh, patent owner response, and then institution decision. And also October 18, uh, 2018 is when uh, NHK was decided. So the PTAB has made uh, over 2,800 institution decisions through the period of March 2021. And institution, um, only about a fifth of them were decided under NHK Fintive. And of the decisions to deny institution, uh, only about a tenth under NHK Fintive. So what does that mean for meritorious petitions? If your petition lacks merit, NHK Fintive doesn't come because that's not a discretionary denial, that's just a merits denial. But if your petition has merit and the PTO nevertheless chooses discretionarily to deny it, how frequently is that taking place? Well, of all the meritorious petitions that came before that time period, three quarters of them, 74.5%, were decisions that was not even raised. So three quarters of these decisions just don't even get NHK Fintive at all. And, and 3% institution was granted in spite of NHK Fintive. The PTAB had the discretion and chose not to exercise it. It's only in 7.3% petitions that the PTAB said, this has merit, but as a result of NHK Fintive, we'll exercise our discretion and deny institution uh, for reasons of, you know, sort of agency management policy, whatever, whatever you might say. 92.7% so of the meritorious petitions are unaffected, uh, either because NHK Fintive isn't raised or because NHK Fintive doesn't change the PTAB's mind. And, and I think that's telling. That's, that's a really important uh, framing for this, because it's an important analytical question, and those numbers might change over time, depending. Um, but it is a So uh, those initial thoughts um, might have provoked reactions among you all. Uh, what, uh, what as practitioners or as a fellow academic, Adam, uh, what do you all think of, uh, of this new development in the PTAB's case management strategy? Well, I, I just wanted to say one thing about one of the pending cases before the federal, not the federal circuit, the Supreme Court, the Milan v. Jansen decision, which is being um, Milan petitioned to the Supreme Court and certiorari is pending, the briefing, um, the opposition briefs were just in. And it's one of these cases where Milan had petitioned and there was a discretionary denial based on um, 
the fintive the fintive factors, specifically mm -hmm. timing. And as somebody who practices a lot in the Hatch Waxman area, and we'll talk about this later, but we seldom in the pharma generic pharma side of things are petitioning at the um, at the PTAB anymore. And it, I think that the scenarios where we would do it are very similar to what Milan's position was here, where they were sued after Teva. They're well behind them in the litigation. And then they say, you know, we want to have our bite at the apple. We want to challenge these patents. Maybe we didn't like the way that Teva challenged them. Why should we be stuck with their decision? We're in the same district court as them. The judge isn't going to decide differently for us. We want to go someplace else. We want our choice. And they go to the PTAB and the PTAB says, no, you're stuck with Teva. We're going to deny this on a discretionary basis because not because we think your petition doesn't have merit, but because Teva's going to get a decision first. And that sort of defeats the entire purpose um, as to why I think generics would be looking at the PTAB option. And so it, it troubles me and it troubles me that it's not rev reviewable. So from a, from a purely, this is my opinion perspective, I hope that mm -hmm. something is done because even if it is a small percentage of the cases, I know these are the kinds of, uh, this is the kind of thing that affects my clients and I, it, it feels wrong to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I certainly take on, on board your point that, you know, a single case could prove to be precedential in a lot of ways in the industry and in, in the marketplace and the technology uh, and in the law. So the, the numbers alone, you know, even if they're comforting, which I doubt they are, um, it, it may be cold comfort, um, particularly if uh, if the stakes are especially, especially high, right? Um, so that, that also raises the question of whether um, in individual cases, the decision whether to institute, right? It may not be judicially reviewable, but uh, now that we have um, uh, director level review of final written decisions after Arthrex, but we've always had the option of director review of the institution decision because it's the director's own power to institute or deny institution that is being subdelegated to the PTAB. Uh, so it may be the case, uh, to your point, Laura, that uh, that this ends up being reviewed and appealed, but through the director, you know, maybe the petition or agency rather than the, the courts. And that opens up uh, additional questions about uh, the politicization of, uh, of these issues. And we will be sort of Worried about regime change uh, again. To return to Stephanie's point from before, Stephanie, I see you're unmuted. Any any thoughts? Yeah, sure. No, I was gonna I was gonna also add to the same comment, sort of of how we view this from a practitioner's perspective. And I, I think one of the things is that it's really we know it's gonna have a sh it, it had a short term impact. I mean, we are in the middle of district court litigations, um, litigating uh, scheduling conferences of when we're going to trial, and and we're making the arguments back to the district court judges. Now, the statistics that, that you were mentioning about the fact that it doesn't really change things very often, I think, is going to end up like the, the cyclic part of it. But to the extent that there are increasing over historical rates, there's increased denials. Um, we use that information in asking for schedules from district courts. And it'd be interesting to see the flip side data question of how often mm -hmm. Fintiv discretionary denial arguments, um, you know, before decision um, gets presented to district courts in scheduling conferences or scheduling or, or uh, proposals to change schedules to see if um, <clears throat> if there's going to be a stay or if we're going to move the trial back or if judges, you know, want to want to wait it out a little bit more. Um, those types of questions would be interesting to see. I, I think the long term, it's just going to settle out in terms of we know what the expectation is. And I'm going to lose my headphones. Mm -hmm. um, we know what the expectation is and it's going to get baked into the analysis there but certainly the short term you know we um it mattered a lot right it mattered a lot that this was a new possibility and and we used it yeah absolutely any other thoughts on on nhk Fintech? i will just say as a as a plug for this research um it's you know i'm, I'm constantly updating and uh uh, I'm, I'm trying as a good academic not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good and just get the paper out there so folks like you all can 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 read it and, and use it in, in practical ways. So sure, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question back, which is, 
So it, it's sort of one thing at the authority level of, you know, does the PTAB have the authority to do this relative, you know, given its impact on district courts? What about the PTAB doing this in view of another administrative agency decision? <laughs> so I know that uh, we, we talked about this before, but the PTAB declining, using its discretion to decline to take, um, to, to, uh, to take on, a, on a challenge because the ITC is likely to reach a decision before they're likely to get to the merits, where the ITC decision is not a is not a um, a binding decision on any district court, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that raises particularly interesting questions about both authority, um, mm -hmm. race to race to the courthouse, um, all of those issues. Absolutely, I, I think the question of the yeah. ITC is is quite important. A paper I, I actually do have out now. Um, and, and I can share the link in the chat uh, momentarily. Um, what I find is when you consider ITC and district court overlap, sort of all the different permutations, um, there is no pair of any two of those tribunals that does not meaningfully spill over into the third. So if there's a district court and um, there's a PTAB challenge on the same uh, patent bar, that it will also have been litigated or will be litigated at some point in the ITC cases are also in the PTAB, but those that do are almost also involved, almost always also involved in the uh, the district court and so on like that. So what that means is uh, from a separation of powers standpoint and the race to the tribunal that you're that you're describing, um, it's, it matters very much to the PTAB and, and we need to ask that question. My, my sort of tendency uh, in answering it would be to say, that for one thing, all I've read one by one, in fact, um, the PTAB discretionary denials uh, tend to disfavor exercising discretion in light of what's going on in the ITC. They're much more comfortable doing it in light of what's going on in the district courts. And the reason is exactly what you said, that the ITC doesn't have the same powers in terms of um, uh, remedies or invalidation and, and <laughs> There's also uh, the sort of related question that uh, what goes on in the district courts triggers the one-year time bar in the PTAB, but what goes on in the ITC, at least according to PTAB precedent that I'm aware of, doesn't trigger the one-year bar. So being served with an ITC complaint will not subject you to, to 315B the way district court complaint would. So those kinds of things make the PTAB think of the ITC differently. The concern is more or less the same, and here's what it looks like. In all the cases that we've seen to date go but in which the court has said PTAB discretion in this regard is non-reviewable, it's always the PTAB was granting institution that the patent owner thought was inappropriate, either because the one-year time bar was implicated or not all the claims were being or there wasn't enough particularity. Now, when the PTAB does something that people think they shouldn't have at the expense of other Separation of powers problem in the sense of overreach by the agency. Discretionary denials are the flip side of that. This is the first case that might go to the Supreme Court where the agency is declining to exercise the full scope of its authority. And that's agency underreach. I think that's a problem for all the reasons that Laura pointed out, but it's not necessarily a constitutional problem because it doesn't really tread on other power, whether it's the judiciary under Article 3 or the ITC under Article 1. So agency underreach is a problem, but it's not a constitutional problem necessarily. And so that's sort of my point for, for thinking through this, uh, this well, ITC. Sorry about under, um, you know, uh, under your last point too, I mean, mm -hmm. what, you know, what you're saying was agency underreach. Um, I think the case law is fairly clear from the US Supreme Court that agencies' decisions not to exercise their power mm -hmm. is clearly within the scope of their discretion. Mm -hmm. And they, in fact, even more expansive discretionary authority um, under, uh, under, the, under the law um, uh, when they choose not to act as opposed to when they choose to act. So I don't, so I think, you know, this case, if, if something comes up to the Supreme Court on the PTAP not acting, I don't think the issue of it not acting will be the dispositive aspect of, of what the Supreme Court might think of this. But, um, but I also just had two very two quick reactions and, and then uh, move on to, um, 
to the other uh, topics, but that one is, I think this might end up uh, being effectively a tempest in a teapot in the sense of it's, it is a very important issue. It, and as and as Stephanie said, it's had very real world impact. I think that that's undeniable. And I think that the next director, I, my prediction is one of the very first things the next director will do will be to repeal the NHK Fintive rule. It has proven to be so controversial, and there is such strong opposition to it from, a, from so many pe uh, uh, people. In fact, if you look at the list of the top 10 uh, filers at the PTAB, I think about all 10 of them <laughs> have either joined that litigation or on record, uh, you know, in, in not publicly saying the, the rule needs to be uh, withdrawn. It's, you know, it's the key part of, you know, Senator Leahy's restoring the American Vents Act, where he, you know, wants to abrogate this rule. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of pressure um, to, to remove it. And, I, and given the signals that we're getting from the Biden administration and what they think our patent policy should be and our IP mm -hmm. policy more broadly, I think that that would be consistent with what the Biden administration would like to see happen at the, at the USPTO. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, um, that's kind of, so I, I think that this may get your article out soon because this may, yeah. <laughs> this may go away. <laughs> That's always good advice. I'm sure my dean would agree with you. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, well, uh, you know, with with the structure of the PTAB changing and in flux, uh, there might be good reason for to try and avoid. Um, and, and one of the ways in which we've seen parties do that is through uh, the same thing they use to, you know, to in uh, in other settings like the courts, and that's forum selection clauses. So there have been um, a proliferation of forum selection uh, arguments for avoiding the PTAB and whether traditional forum selection clauses that would get you out of this court or that court and land you in this other one should apply and be read in the same way to the PTAB. Uh, so Adam, I know you've given some thought to these issues. What uh, what are your initial uh, remarks in this regard? Uh, certainly, and and, um, and I just and I just want to spend very little time on this, um, although I think it's it, it is a rising issue of importance. So there was a recent decision by the Federal Circuit as past October seventh, and a decision called Kanu versus Samsung. It arose from a uh, <clears throat> the background of the case very quickly is that um, Kanu is a very small tech company, and Samsung engaged in potential patent licensing negotiations with Kanu to license its patented technology um, back in 2011, 2012, they entered into a, a non-disclosure agreement as part of the licensing negotiations and Kanu gave as part of the negotiations um, access to uh, its server to Samsung. Um, Samsung <clears throat> uh, concluded the negotiations and, uh, and ended them after about a year. And um, and then Kanu discovered a couple of years later that Samsung had continued to surreptitiously access its server, and lo and behold, also discovered that Samsung had incorporated its technology into its products. Um, and so, what ensued was some continuing negotiations <laughs> over the next several years, um, where Kanu was attempting to get Samsung to agree to pay a, a license. And when and when it eventually and Samsung refused, and so eventually in 2019. Um, Kanu brought suit against Samsung in New York for patent infringement. Um, and the reason why it sued in New York was because the non-disclosure agreement that it had in that it had entered into with Samsung had a form selection clause that required all suits and disputes arising under the agreement to be brought in the state of New York. Samsung immediately turns around in, in addition to its defenses that it's fought, you know, filed in the suit, files a PTAP uh, 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 petition uh, to invalidate Kanu's uh, patent. And um, and Kanu then contended, it sought a preliminary injunction contending that Samsung could not file this PTAP uh, petition because of the form selection clause in, in, in their non in their non disclosure agreement that required all actions pertaining to uh, disputes arising under the agreement, and and the agreement was pertained to a uh, patent license potential patent licensing <laughs> um, uh, goal at the end of the day uh, must be filed in New York. Um, and um, and the district court uh, uh, ha denied the preliminary injunction. Um, and interestingly enough, the district court, in addition to kind of construing the language of the of the form selection clause, relied very heavily on Lear, um, saying, "Oh well, you know, there's a public policy argument against uh, against uh, you know limiting people's ability to seek to uh, to invalidate patents." Um, <clears throat> 
and um, and the and there was a supporting academics who filed an amicus brief in support of Samsung on the appeal to the Federal Circuit, which also relied heavily on Lear as well. Um, it, Kanu, when it it in it uh, filed its its uh, appeal, and I was part of and helped organize a, a, an, an amicus brief on behalf of law professors in support of Kanu, argued that no, no that the district court was first of all wrong in not enforcing the form selection clause. Form selection clauses are very common; they're very prevalent in and in, in, uh, in non disclosure agreements as part and parcel of broader uh, negotiations to engage in licensing uh, uh, deals and. Um, and these are pricing provisions. These are, you know, these are part of how parties are considering, you know, what is the consideration that they're offering in these agreements. And this, and this, so therefore they're enforced very strongly by courts. There's a very strong norm of, of, of enforcement of form selection clauses, both at the U.S. Supreme Court and in lower courts. And also we pointed out that there was an opposite because Lear involved an agreement not to challenge a patent at all, and the point and, and a form selection clause doesn't raise that issue at all. At all. It doesn't prevent someone from challenging a patent. It just says if you challenge a patent, you have to do it in a particular forum. So, um, interestingly enough, the Federal Circuit just ignored the whole Lear issue and just drilled down into the language of the non-disclosure agreement and the form selection clause. And in Judge Chen's decision in a two-one split panel. Uh, with Judge Newman dissenting, not a great dissenter in, in, in patent law, um, you know, uh, Judge Chen engaged in a very fine linguistic split, uh, uh, splicing of the language of the form selection clause, basically concluding that because you didn't ultimately enter into a patent licensing agreement, this form selection clause is not really applicable, uh, among other reasons. But that you know that was a very large that that he uh, had, which would you know, raise a lot of serious questions about the enforceability of these form selection clauses more generally in a lot of agreements. Um, Judge Newman dissented saying, no, that this form selection clause is, is clearly applicable. And these issues really are rising, I think, uh, a lot more. Um, as, as Sarah mentioned, you know, given the nature of the PTAB and, and the high invalidation rates that one's seen, you know, that what litigants are starting to position themselves as part of the pricing provisions of their negotiation agreements to try to argue that what you know that you potential licensee should not be able to bring actions at the PTAB. There was a non-precedential decision from 2019 called Dodo case versus Merch Source um, in, uh, involving another uh, form selection clause, not involving the PTAB, but involving Samsung uh, who successfully took a case out of the Eastern District of Texas and put it in California. But there was also a new current versus Samsung. I'm sorry, that was a new current versus Samsung. Dodo case was another form selection clause. I, I non-presidential in 2019. I apologize. I'm getting cases mixed up. But, and then, um, and then there's a there was a uh, an Arthrex case, a New Vision gaming and development, which had a preliminary issue on again the form selection clause as well. This this case th this issue could potentially reach the Supreme Court because this is exactly the type of kind of procedural issue that the Supreme Court seems to. Feel very comfortable engaging with in the patent space and and ruling on and raise this kind of broader questions and institutional relationships between institutions, contracting parties' rights, and um, and 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 kind of well stand you know well established long standing Supreme Court precedent on the enforcement of forms selection clauses. I one thought here. I'm, I guess I struggle with how this forum selection clause could be impermissible, notwithstanding Lear v. Atkins and all that, because I mean just about every settlement agreement I've seen has had something that says, no, you defending party who's been challenged can't challenge this patent. So how is that any different? It's just the same thing with a different name. Um, so I guess I, I have, I struggle to think that the courts are going to say you can't, you can't include these kind of provisions in a contract. I, I, I don't think, so they weren't saying you couldn't include this in 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 the contract that was, so that wasn't the decision in kanu this is um although that was in part that seemed to be the argument from the district court <laughs> and it did seem to be the argument from the academics who filed an amicus briefs in support of samsung in this case um so and that uh and and that argument will certainly be out there um and i agree with you that i i, I don't i don't see how that 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 is applicable um you know that one could argue well you know the language in the form selection clause in this particular case in kanu you know since it re referred to disputes arising under this agreement as opposed to referring specifically to patents that you know that was the kind of the 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 you know questions of concerning patent you know validity and, and and infringement can only be adjudicated in new york if it had said that i think chen judge chen would have been much more happy in 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 affirming it 
Um, I don't think the language that was used in referring to disputes from rising out of this agreement is that unusual and weird. I think it's fairly standardized. And so I, I, I'm concerned about kind of some of the unintended consequences of this kind of very fine linguistic splicing of the of the nature and enforcement of this form selection clause that Judge Shen engaged in. Kind of. Great. Any other thoughts on, on these structural issues? Okay. Not on those. Well, we have been, we have been, yeah, <laughs> we have been nerding out pretty hard on the the structural issues, and that's that's always more fun for for me certainly. But uh, uh, because we have some, some really true panel uh, who focus uh, quite quite robustly on the life sciences and in Hatch Waxman in particular, um, for the rest of the panel, we'll we'll turn our focus now uh, to more life science specific issues. So first. Uh, BioRed versus ITC. Uh, that's a case that uh, has generated a lot of interest, and uh, I'm not sure it's all that controversial, but uh, maybe there's controversy. Uh, we'll also look at uh, Hatch-Waxman uh, litigation, which uh, Laura mentioned earlier, and then we'll close out with a, a discussion of GSK versus Teva and bullying issues. So uh, BioRed versus ITC. Stephanie, would you uh, like to frame sure. the issue? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to. And uh, I'm certainly capable of my own nerding out, so I'll try to I'll try to keep it to a minimum. Um, but I, I, sort of picking up on some of the themes that Adam was touching on, the, the Federal Circuit's willingness to dive into I don't now I'm not I'm going to miss the phrase that he used. The linguistic uh, um, splicing is is the right way to think about it. Um, in in a couple of recent cases that. Um, assignment clauses, the Federal Circuit and, and specifically um, Judge Toronto's opinions have been really willing to dive into some of the details at a at a very, very, with a <laughs> with a very fine tooth comb in some of the assignment clauses to try to um, map out what uh, those obligations are. Now, I think that there probably shouldn't be anything controversial about this opinion. And some of the people who are the commentators who are commenting on BioRed VITC, I, I think are just wrong. Uh, it's a pretty vanilla uh, inventorship ownership opinion, and I think it is completely reconcilable with with what the Federal Circuit has done in the past. In that sense, it's not particularly interesting. That said, there are handfuls of commentators who are saying this was just wrong and irreconcilable, and it's raising new questions that are going to come up to the Federal. Circuit. I, I I'll I'll give some background on the case that sort of suggests that no, this was just a vanilla outcome, and nobody should really be concerned about um, about what the what the base holding was. Now, vanilla is my favorite flavor, by the way. <laughs> um, I don't mean to disparage vanilla. I was outcome, um, but but really, I think that there is a what's not receiving attention in this opinion is something that I think is really important in that. What the Federal Circuit is saying in the BioRed VITC case in, in aspects that weren't really part of the holding is that non-competes and the language of non-competes in state law um, are, is going to be very important for understanding patent ownership. And some of the things that the court suggested in, that, in, that, um, in those passing comments about California non-compete law, I think is going to have really major implications going forward um, in a lot of um, different patent cases. And, and I think it's really meaningful. And, um, and I think people aren't paying attention to how to, to that non-compete issue. So with that said, let me give you a little bit of background. Um, so let's just talk about the, the holding, the inventorship holding. So this is a story between BioRed and 10X. And for those two competitors um, in, in the uh, biotech space who been with each other for many years, and I don't know how many different fora they ended up fighting in. I was involved in more than a half dozen, but I think there were more than 10. Um, it was ITC, several Delaware cases, you know, multiple PTAB um, cases, Northern District of California, state court in California arbitration, um, and Germany, and uh, all over the world. So, so they've been fighting for a long time. Um, it is full, now fully global settlement as of July, so so all, all all bets are off now. But the way this started was two inventors, Ben Heinsen and Serge Saxonov, who were at a company called Quantalife in 2009 and 2010. The, while they were at Quantalife, they signed uh, uh, 
somewhat conventional um, assignment clauses saying, I work for you, everything and I, I invent for you on your time with your money will be assigned to you. Quantalife was then acquired by BioRad, including the technology, the employees moved over, they signed new employment agreements similar assignment clause, everything I conceive of, develop, ideas, trade secrets, everything shall be assigned um, if done during the period of my employment at BioRed. Okay, that's fine. That's 2011. In 2012, several of the employees that had been at Quantalife that went to BioRed left BioRed and formed their own company. Then uh, shortly after they formed their own company, um, you know, half a year later, they had developed a new technology called what they call their gem architecture, and they started filing patent applications. And the, of course, the question, and then eventually they released products, um, the patent applications were published, like all of this game. And so starting in 2014, I think that's right, 2014, uh, was the first lawsuit where BioRed brought a suit against the new company 10X saying that they, uh, for trade secret misappropriation, for breach of contract, for failure to assign technology that was developed in part at BioRed or at Quantalife. So tumble of events, uh, multiple lawsuits, the trade secret misappropriation case and the breach of contract case that were in the state court and were in arbitration in California, will say um, they went away uh, without resolution. So they were still sort of back there in the background, uh, unresolved. And, you know, four or five lawsuits later, uh, 10X decided to the ITC against BioRed, asserting a handful of patents that were the subject of this early assignment dispute, ownership dispute, inventorship dispute. So they assert this against BioRed, and, and that gave BioRed the opportunity to bring an affirmative defense of own those patents, at least co-own those patents, because they were developed in part from contributions from your inventors who were at BioRad or Quantalife at the time that they developed some of those ideas. So ITC, we go through the whole ITC investigation. There's a finding of a violation, infringement, domestic industry. The ALJ says you don't co-own the patents. Um, the uh, the commission agrees it's appealed to the federal circuit and then uh, we the federal circuit gives its opinion so what the federal circuit did is dive in to word by word the details of the assignment clauses that were at issue and it wasn't an issue about whether the difference between the two assignment clauses there they were um, close enough to not matter um, and they only dived into the the actual arguments that had been raised by BioRad at the ITC, which is limited to ownership in the patent, right? So there were all these other provisions in the assignment agreements that could be you at least co-developed ideas. Well, BioRed didn't seek ownership of whatever consequence of the ideas. They only sought ownership of the ultimate patent. So the Federal Circuit looks at this and says, look, if that's what you're seeking, is a patent right. Patent rights don't exist until conception. Conceived after these inventors, there was nothing to own during the period of their employment. If there was nothing to own, there was to assign. So they so they don't co-own the patents, right? Now it's not an inventorship opinion in any way. There was no dispute in any of these facts that the inventors are the inventors. There's Ben uh, Ben Heinsen at Heinsen at 10X Genomics. He's an inventor. There's no such thing in patent law as uh, you know split personality and time being not being co-inventors. The, the the patent doesn't say Ben Heinsen while at BioRed, right? It's just Ben Heinsen. Same thing with Serge Saxenoff. So there's no. This isn't an inventorship case in any way because the right inventors were named on the face of the patent. So there's no question about that. And you'll hear that in the oral argument where the judges are asking questions. Judge Chen, I believe, asked the question, look, we have the right inventors, don't we? Yes, we have the right inventors. So it's only a question of ownership. And it, they they very, very carefully went down through the language of the assignments and said, you assign 
IP that exists during the time of your employment. You, this didn't exist, so no duty to assign. Game over. They also said if you if Biorad had had challenged other aspects of contributions to other types of things like ideas or things that come out of that, um, they suggested that the answer might have been different. But that was a that was a litigation choice by Biorad. Okay, so plain vanilla, in my view, doesn't raise any new questions. Um, it's not inconsistent with prior ownership or, or inventorship cases. All of those cases, Amgen case, Film Tech case, Stanford case, similarly went down to the same questions of at the time that you were under contract, did the thing that's supposed to be assigned, right? And if not, um, then, then no duty. Okay, so then what is interesting about this? Well, the court's holding um, depends on that contract interpretation under California law. And everybody knows that California has these non, uh, strong non-compete statutes that say that you cannot, um, uh, that any, any agreement that somehow prevents workers from moving on to their next job in any way is against public policy and unenforceable. So the court in Biorad looks at, at California statute 16600 and says, you know, just by the way, this might have come into play um, if we had interpreted these assignment clause the other way. If we had said that Biorad had a claim on things that were conceived later after they had left, then we might not have been able to find that six, uh, that, that was an enforceable assignment clause under 16600. So, this is really important because the language that they use to talk about this is the reason that that would prevent worker mobility in violation of 16600 is that at the time of departing your old employer and starting with a new job, the set of rights, the set of things that your old employer has a claim over into the future is unknown, right? Patent rights may not exist yet. The patents that are to be conceived later are, you, you can't write them down and say, we own these things that are not yet conceived. And so that puts a cloud over mobility, which is a real problem and might be unenforceable. Okay, so a couple things. This is a problem. This is a problem because in Whitewater in November of two, uh, 2020, the Federal Circuit also said that the old Stanford case from 2009 um, didn't implicate any of the non-competes because non-competes apply to workers. Okay, so now in Biorad and Whitewater, they're reinterpreting the Stanford case to not to now say that patent rights that would traditionally that may be traveling with now puts a cloud over their movement, and so they might not be able to take it with them. So it's introducing an idea of unenforceability. So why is this important? Non-compete. What else do we have? Washington, D.C. just passed a very strong non-compete law last year. Um, historical states are Oklahoma and, and North Dakota as well. Um, Congress introduced a Workforce Mobility Act in 2021, unlikely to pass in its current form, but Congress is paying attention on non-competes. Uh, in July, President Biden signed an executive order um, um, saying that they're not going to uh, pursue non-competes. Oregon just passed a law that's effective in Jan this coming January. Nevada passed a law that's effective October 1st of this year. Illinois passed a law that's now effective in January 2020. We now have a regime where non-competes are not being enforced, are, are being challenged and are and we have a federal circuit that is looking at those level and saying patents probably can't follow employees into their neck, uh, you know, patent provisions that prevent, um, that require assignment of future employees, of uh, future inventions can't reach back into the, into the past. So th there's a real possibility here of a substantive change that's flowing from the federal circuits diving into these state non-compete statutes that is something really new. And I don't think people are paying a whole lot of attention to it yet, um, but I think that it makes it makes the Bioid case um, more interesting than just the vanilla uh, co-ownership that that it appears to be on its face. Great. 
Stephanie, thank you for that uh, terrific discussion. I think, uh, um, you know, far from your starting premise that there's there's not much to see here. There's quite a lot of, uh, of interesting stuff to, to consider regardless. Um, so since we are in the uh, in the sort of home stretch here, how about we uh, turn to um, Hatch Waxman sort of, you know, our, our principal thesis there was uh, a lot of people thought the PTAB was going to make a big difference. Turns out it uh, it hasn't. Uh, and I'm happy to get in the chat to the fact, but uh, Laura, uh, if you have any thoughts on Hatch Waxman generally or perhaps on GSK versus Teva and skinny labeling in particular. Yeah, um, generally on Hatch Waxman, I would say that if you look at the federal, this is the Federal Circuit Review Panel, right? If you look at the Federal Circuit decisions from the last year, you're not going to find too many um, pharmaceutical patents um, outside of the biologic space that are challenged and have precedential patent decisions. It's just not that common. I think only 7%, according to the September um, 2021 statistics, only 7% of the petitions filed in the PTAB are in the biopharma space. I work in this space. It's something. And that's because the, the outcomes, um, the PTAB doesn't publish these statistics anymore, but if you go back a few years, you can see that your chances, I think it was 32% of claims are found patentable in the biopharma space as of September 2016, which is more than double the next highest um, success rate for patent owners at the PTAB. So it's not not very common. Um, mo most of the Hatch-Waxman litigation, in my, in my view, is happening in the district courts. And um, there is one really exciting federal circuit decision. We only have a minute to talk about it, but um, that's the GSK versus Teva decision that came out um, in August of this year. And <clears throat> it's it, 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 for those of you who are not immersed in Hatch-Waxman law, I'm gonna try to make this as simple as possible because we have very short time. But um, the, the case involves Carvedilol, which no matter how many drug cases I work on, I can't pronounce the drug names, but it's the brand name Coreg. It's sold by GSK. And the Coreg label has three indications, one, two, three. The first one is chronic heart failure, CHF. And then there's another one that I'm going to just call heart problems that aren't necessarily heart failure. And then there's a third one that's hypertension. And Teva was selling um, Carvedilol for a number of years. Um, after GSK's patent for the compound, the actual drug had expired, but GSK had another patent, a method of treatment patent. And that patent reissued in 2008. So under the law for Hatch-Waxman drugs, the generic has to copy the brand's label. But Congress was worried back when they enacted the Hatch-Waxman Act about just this situation. What happens when a compound patent expires and that there's a method of patent and there's multiple methods of treatment available? Shouldn't the generic and the public be able to enjoy um, a generic product for those other unpatented methods of treatment? And so they have a scheme that's called uh, the Section 8 statement that allows a generic to have a label that doesn't include all the indications. And that's what Teva did here. They skipped that number one indication, chronic heart failure. That was what was covered by the patent. And they said, we're not going to put that in our label. And they sold it. They get sued. And this isn't actually a Hatch-Waxman case because Teva was already on the market, but it has really important implications for Hatch-Waxman because it indicates that a generic can be held liable to the tune of $234 million here, where they had a, a carved out label, which under the pre-GSK v. Teva world, most of my clients were saying, hey, we got a carve out, we're free and clear, we're good, no litigation. So I, I, don't, I don't have time to talk about this more, but it's an exciting case. It already has been reheard by the Federal Circuit once. Now Teva in the, the, the panel reinstated their decision with a very, very strongly worded dissent from Judge Prost. Um, it's now in the second round of Unbank. There's been multiple um, uh, amicus briefs filed from generics, from the Generic Association, from law professors, from Senator Hat, uh, Waxman of the Hatch-Waxman Act, um, all saying, you know, this is wrong. And uh, it's a contender for Embank Review. It's an exciting case. Lots of interesting things written about it. So I encourage you all to read about them in your spare time and embrace Hatch-Waxman Law. It's the best. So um, with that, um, I would just uh, give you a brief outline. Uh, the topics uh, we want to cover um, are um, anti-suit injunctions, which are, are, of course, a hot topic in these days. Um, we uh, then have generally the question of jurisdiction, where should when be decided? Um, 
leading to the question of alternative dispute resolution um, and then over to the recent developments in Europe and also in the US. Um, and if time allows, I would also like to discuss licensing in the value chain, especially in view of the connected cars dispute that have been ongoing in the uh, last couple of years. So that's a bit the program uh, for this, um, this evening. Um, and uh, yeah, let's uh, write jump into it and start with the topic of uh, anti-suit injunctions. Um, and maybe uh, the first question uh, to you, Ken, uh, what is your opinion about anti-suit injunctions? Uh, do you find them justified or would you say it is an unconstitutional and maybe even illegal means um, to uh, ensure uh, the, the right court besides? Uh, Anti-suit injunctions have a, a long, uh, honored history, so to speak, in trial courts in the in the United States and our, our federal court system. You know, all our patent work is done in the federal court system, and uh, while SCP Friend may be contract actions, the state courts, for the most part, also uh, follow and honor the concept of of anti-suit injunctions. Uh, most of the courts are fairly good at doing the, the necessary balancing, bringing in the concepts of comedy, uh, trying to figure out jurisdictional issues and, and et cetera. Um, do I think they're fair? I think uh, as a good trial lawyer does, it depends upon who I'm representing, right? I'm, I'm representing the innovator, right? In contrast to the, 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 the person uh, using, uh, I might have a certain view uh, and uh, depending upon who sued whom first, I mean, if it's a declaratory judgment action that was brought by the by the innovator uh, rather than the the, uh, the end user, uh, I might have a, a different view than if it's 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 the opposite way. So I'm fairly agnostic. I, I am not outraged by the existence of anti-suit injunctions. Uh, I'm not uh, overly thrilled with them. Sometimes I would note. Uh, just for interest, and I think we may talk about this uh, later, the Samsung Ericsson case, which is probably the most recent example of an anti-suit situation in the United States, which obviously involved uh, Korea and uh, actually the Eastern District of Texas here, is a, a sort of anti-suit uh, situation, which uh, we'll, I think we'll talk about, talk about later. But that, those are my views. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anybody uh, taking a bit more um, contrarian view? Um, who would speak in favor of them and who would speak in, as a matter of principle against them? And um, I might call upon Detlef here. Um, uh, maybe I can add here that from the um, continental view, we uh, have the basic principle of access to the courts. So uh, I think the general concept of anti-suit injunction is less common um, uh, here in Europe. Detlef, what do you think on that? Absolutely. And, and as Judge Grabinski pointed out earlier this morning, um, it's something coming from, from um, common law countries and we, we simply didn't know them in, in a civil law system. And I guess uh, China also being a civil law country is the first country in the civil law world uh, that really uh, issues them now and uh, yeah and and um, are they constitutional well um, uh, we, we, the we 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 ha yeah it depends <laughs> on the country but well we we we, do, we did have a, a one common law country oh no ireland is also a common law country but but we had one common law country great britain within the european union which gave the uh, uh court of justice for its european union um the opportunity to to rule on them and they said it's uh they are against um what did they say mutual uh, recognition of the courts or mutual trust of the courts between each other and and that's why they are not allowed under uh, under European law. Um, mm. Now, as as you mentioned, Cordula, it's uh, it's a, a question of um, the the legal judge that that you are sued 
uh, before the right judge. So what we do have in, in Germany um, and they have been granted uh, is anti-anti-suit injunctions. Um, and because they have a more d defensive character. Yeah. No, you're 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 right there, um, and I think we have a bit more the approach approach of just leaving it to to the court to decide whether that's competent or not. But yeah. um, uh, we have different legal traditions. But um, uh, maybe a question to you, Stephen, uh, considering where anti-suit injunctions have gone now in the last years, do you think uh, this has been taken to a different level? Um, is it is a different kind of anti-suit injunctions, which then also provoke the anti-anti-suit injunctions um, that we have been seeing now? Sure. Uh, first, just a quick disclaimer. I, I'm just giving some personal thoughts. I'm not um, uh, trying to present any kind Steven of may be position of, of my employer or, or clients. Um, well, while we're waiting for him to come back, Cordula, maybe I can address a couple of those issues. Um, I, I think me? it's da Wait, Dave, Dave. I think Stephen is is uh, he's talking. Answering. Oh, oh, I, I I can't hear him. He I must have. Heard him. I apologize. Oh, Steve, I, you will you will have the word next one, Dave. Okay, <laughs> Stephen, go I'll, ahead. I'll, I'll speak up. Um, but uh, to to your question, I I do think that this has risen to a, a level that uh, I, I I think is somewhat regrettable. Now it's also I think somewhat predictable. Many people are viewing the current state not only as a global race to the courthouse, but a winner take all race to the courthouse, being that if you get your case in the jurisdiction that you prefer, and if it is going to set the global rate, so it is going to have global impact, then you can imagine how incentivized people are to make sure they get their case in the court that they want, or if they're not the first filed party, to do whatever they can to then start shutting down or at least boxing in that that case. And so this this has brought the importance and the uh, incentives for filing these up a notch clearly. And that's that's why now we're, we're seeing so many of them. The other thing is, um, and this is, I guess, at least on a personal level, one of the concerns I have is if you look at some of the declarations, some of the arguments that are made in support of or against some of these anti-suit injunctions, you get one country talking about the legitimacy or the professionalism of another country's judges or courts. I don't think that's necessarily a good way to support and, and further international comity. And so I, I view this as, as an unfortunate episode that we're going through. Um, I generally think of these, though, as a manifestation, as a symptom. They're not the underlying problem. The underlying problem, like I said, is this at least perceived winner-take-all global race to the court. So if I may summarize... I'm not it. sure. I'm not sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm can sorry. I go ahead? get in there also uh, before we... No, I was going to say, Steve, I'm not, I'm not sure that, that the uh, bad-mouthing of, of counsel uh, back and forth, side to side, uh, I think it's calmed down a little, frankly. I don't. I don't think it's bad as bad as it was because, it's as you know, that's just not acceptable in trial courts in the United States. Judges can't stand lawyers deprecating the professional skills of other counsel, irrespective no. of whether they come from Antarctica or otherwise. So I think that's calmed down a lot. But, but I, I agree not, with you. It's totally in. I'm not talking not about it. counsel versus counsel. I'm talking about one country saying yes. that another country's courts are not competent or proper jurisdictions to handle patent or fram cases. And that's the concern that I have. I That's the point. Oh. Is one country talking about okay. another country's legal system. That of course, is going to be problematic. And, and that's where we are. And, and we do see that in, in some is of these that, cases. So well, is that not the essence of an anti-suit injunction? One court telling the other court, no, you're not competent. It's my case. Stay away. Well, Dave, what is what are, what are your views on that? Maybe. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, yeah. Sorry. I'll <laughs> so, th thank you, Cordula. And I apologize to Stephen for earlier. I, I thought he was frozen and apparently I was frozen. So I apologize for talking over you. I reloaded my page and hopefully we fixed Let's that. get some heat into the Adam. <laughs> That's right. Well, so, so um, I, I would respond. I'm glad that Detlef brought up the issue of anti-anti-suit injunctions. And I think that the, the proper way to look at this is not through the, the legal jargon that we use when we're in this world, 
but through sort of the common sense practicalities of things. When you have a court that is uh, has jurisdiction to or has consent to set rates on a worldwide basis for a, a FRAND rate setting process, using injunctions, using product injunctions in foreign jurisdictions preempts that process. It means that the court who has the right to set rates never will get to do so because a you know injunction in Germany or the UK or somewhere else is going to preempt that process and force a settlement. And so the anti-suit injunction, when a court has jurisdiction to set rates or when it has consent to set rates by both people, is not only something that would be, I think, procedurally pop proper under US law, but necessary to protect the jurisdiction of the US court, which will be undermined by foreign decisions in joining products, forcing settlements before the US process can ever complete. Now, I think that Detlef was smart to bring in the concept of anti-anti-suit injunctions. And you know, we've we've heard the phrase, you know, it's it's anti-suit injunctions all the way down, right? You've got, you know, anti to the third, to the fourth, et cetera. Um, I think that the fundamental problem that we are facing is what I'll call the 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 foreign injunction based on non, the, what I call the unwired planet issue. Um, when you have foreign courts who are using local injunctions to set rates for US patents, that reads the US court system out of the prospect, out of the prospect well, it's, of setting may rates I... for US. For, for, wait, well, hold on. If a US court cannot set rates for US patents, or to establish infringement for US patents or non-infringement or invalidity because a foreign court has forced that issue by saying you can't have access to my market unless you accept the rates my court set. That is not a legal issue. That's a great issue. That's a diplomatic issue. That's an issue where I think administrations are going to clash because that's one country sort of usurping the right and the obligation as, as decision maker under another country's laws. And, and I think that's what the anti-suit, anti-anti-suit injunction uh, issue is all about. But Dave, aren't you yeah, assuming in your reply, can, one, one sentence, one minute, please. Aren't you assuming in your reply that the US is the right forum and all the other national courts are not the right forum? That's why the US is entitled to anti-suit injunctions and the others are not? No, I, I very carefully said that where the court has proper jurisdiction or has the consent what, of both Who parties, decides that? What the, well, what the U.S. has done is require the consent of both parties. You could read the Fran promise as consent. You could read consent as me agreeing to jurisdiction. What I actually disagree with is, the, is what I think the German and the U.K. courts have done, which is say, we don't care if we have the consent of the parties. If you don't agree to take the rates that I say for Chinese patents, for U.S. patents, for Brazilian patents, for Canadian patents, then we're going to kick you out of our market. And, and that's, oh, yeah. that's, that's, that's adjudicating the national laws of foreign countries without consent. That's, I think, the fundamental problem. And then now we get into this issue of how do you protect your jurisdiction without the territorial. Ken, go ahead. Uh, I think it's my turn, uh, Cordula. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. George, George and then Ken. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, so listen, we, we haven't really been skirting around this, this issue, right? Obviously, anti-suit injunctions have existed for centuries, um, and they're pretty well-established rules for how they work. Why, why did they all of a sudden pop up in the last few years in these SEP cases? I mean, it is the point that both Steve and Dave have made in different ways, right? It's the courts, uh, a national court's seizure of the right to set a global rate for Fran. Now, I, I don't know that I agree with Dave that this is not proper, not permissible. Legally, these Fran cases are contract cases, and we have, for hundreds of years, had contracts with international scope that, um, you know, courts in one country can adjudicate what the terms of an international sales contract or distribution contract um, are. And, and that's how courts contractually are interpreting their ability to set these global Fran rates. You usually don't need the consent of people in other countries to do that if the court has proper jurisdiction over the case. But it is a problem in these Fran cases. And this started with the UK courts in Unwired Planet. Um, and then the Chinese courts um, sort of, you know, 
uh, met the uh, the UK bid and and uh, you know uh, doubled doubled it right they um, they they really uh, took 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 it uh, of their own to set worldwide rates and now we're in the situation where many countries are trying to issue ASIs and AASIs in response because of that and so the fundamental problem is that courts are stepping outside of their national boundaries with respect to patents cloaked as this kind of contractual issue. And, and if we want to see fewer anti-suit injunctions, anti-anti-suit injunctions and so forth and restore some of the global judicial comedy that existed before all of this, um, courts should stop doing that. They should stick to their national patents and not attempt to, uh, to adjudicate royalty rates for patents all around the world. Ken, now it's your go. Okay, well, first of all, everybody doesn't consent. The only time people consented was in uh, Microsoft um, and, and Modo and InRay and Avadio, and those cases are now five years old. So that's point one. Point two, if you worry about how to get past the issues of comedy and et cetera, I suggest that you look and see what happened in Samsung versus versus Ericsson and how Chief Judge Gilstrap got around uh, these issues of everybody stepping on top of everybody else. And it, it was very simple. Samsung asked the Wuhan court to determine the global licensing terms, okay? Ericsson very brilliantly asked the court in Eastern Texas to look at the party's pre-suit negotiation conduct and determine whether the parties breached or complied with their mutual friend obligations. Wuhan court is asked to provide a number. This court is asked to evaluate conduct. The legal que questions presented to each other are different. There's a little more to it than that. He's dead right on, he's dead right on that. I mean, that's just, that's just unarguable. Now you remember in Unwired Planet, and Stephen's got to stay out of this conversation, the issue of whether the Chinese could involve themselves and fight back to what was going on by saying, we can do this. At the time, the court of the, uh, the Supreme Court of the UK looked at this and said, oh, the Chinese courts have said, and they did, we don't have the ability to do this. Well, Wuhan then woke up watching the piling on, and that's how we ended up in this situation. The biggest problem, George, under in the circumstances that they are that, as they are now, seeing what Chief Judge Gilstrap told everybody is the answer to this conundrum. Nobody is going to go first, right? If if a race to the bottom starts, and I'm a trial lawyer in this country, and I represent one side or the other, I can't be the one who puts his hand up and say, "Nah, it's a bad idea." You know, we we really believe in comedy. You can't do that. You've got to have you you either have to get everybody agree at once to stop doing this or it's never gonna stop. And that's the real problem, except you can go the way Chief Judge Gilstrap went. Somebody's gotta go first and nobody's gonna do it. That's the problem. We backed ourselves into a corner on this is, is frankly the bottom line of my view. Yeah, I, uh, one, that's why one I point it's... that, uh, ahead, sorry, one, one point that, that, uh, that Dave and I, I think also you, George, um, uh, brought up is that uh, national courts um, setting global rates, and you mentioned the UK and Germany, um, and isn't it that they didn't really set global rates, they just said, if you want to keep on using the patents in front of me because you're infringing these patents, then you better get a license because I'm not allowing you to keep infringing this national patent. And because friend is in this context a global license because that's what's been done all around um the license um that you should take is a global license so it's a very indirect effect it's not global rate setting it's not the the courts would not set the license and say now the license is in place but they would just give the option either you infringe or you take a license that is that is friend yeah, and yeah. Carl, if, if I may add, German courts not yet have even set a, a rate for Germany. They're just reluctant to do so. But they have not really been asked to, but if you talk to judges, they say, well, that that, that is a market. Uh, we, we only look, uh, is it a friend behavior or is it not a friend behavior? Is it a friend behavior? Then we, we, uh, we uh, 
uh, if it's a not a friend behavior, then then we issue the injunction. Otherwise, we do not. That that's all what they decided so far. Uh, question to, to my question to Dave. Question to Dave. So should a national let's take the German should a national German court then allow infringement of the German patents because there is a rate setting proceeding somewhere else? No, I, th I think where the, I mean, first of all, I think the argument that you're not setting rates or that you're not requiring that rates be set worldwide is a bit of a sophism, right? We know that an injunction, you know, is the death penalty in a particular market. And by saying, well, you have to take this, this license at this rate in, you know, for U.S. patents, you, you are setting rates for U.S. patents, whatever you want to call it. Um, and no, of course not. You don't have to, to allow for um, infringement in, in your local markets. You can set rates for local patents, right? The, the fundamental reality that we're dealing with is that patents are national creatures. They, they're made up of, of national law. This is not the contract enforcement situation that George is talking about. The implementer is not signing and, and agreeing to the FRAN contract. The patent holder is. The patent holder has agreed to license its patents on FRAN terms. And if there's a dispute, mm -hmm. Then the German court should settle that dispute as to Germany, just like what happened in the Apple Motorola case, right? If you recall in the Apple yeah. Motorola case, what happened was Apple was viewed as an unwilling licensee because they hadn't made a FRAND offer until their sixth FRAND offer. They made their sixth FRAND offer, which was limited to payment for patents in Germany. And at that point, the European Commission said, now you're a willing licensee because you've now agreed to pay for patents in Germany. The German court should no longer be enjoining you uh, because you've now agreed to have the German court adjudicate a German rate. The, the issue that I have is when the German court adjudicates a rate, you know, whether it's because it adjudicates a rate or because it says, oh, they've got a couple other licenses at this rate, so you have to take that, and says, if you don't pay that rate, for foreign patents, then you're enjoined and kicked out of our market. That is a trade issue. There is no situation where the U.S. government should be allowing foreign governments and foreign courts to take the place of U.S. courts and set rates and find infringement for U.S. patents. Whatever, whatever we use to call what they're doing, that is what they're doing. When they're requiring you to pay a rate for a U.S. patent or be kicked out of their local market, the, you know, the U.S. trade representative, the U.S. administration should be taking action against our, our trade partner, Germany, to make sure that the German government isn't allowing that to happen under its watch. Well, I, I, hope, uh, I hope not. But how many, how many license agreements uh, have you seen that have been licensed country by country in practice? You can have a number of negotiations like it depends on where, the, where yeah. you operate. And, and there are lots of incentives on all sides to come to a global agreement. Global agreements should be and are the norm, but that's not exactly. the same that's thing. The point. No, no, it's not the point because it's very different to say that negotiating parties, when they agree, might be able to come to a global agreement than it is to say a, a court in one country should force the compliance with foreign laws in their view on another party. It, you can't take the common agreed upon handshake practice where I say, okay, fine, let's make peace and turn that into some new legal right to adjudicate foreign patents. That's, that's, not, um, that's not how the legal system works. Ken, do you agree? Should there be a new trade war between the US and Germany? I wouldn't, I would, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend I don't think it. I said trade and, war. And, and the last, the last time, the last time SEP Fran was used as a, as a, as part of a trade tool was in 2013 when the uh, USTR uh, refused to honor uh, the the which they could refused to honor the order keeping uh, infringement out of a, a, an ITC situation where the the, the party had wa had won Apple had lost and they blocked Samsung from from uh, putting on the trade remedy, which is uh, uh, was a limited exclusion order in that place. Look, let me just read what, what Chief Judge Gilstrap said here so everybody understands what's going on in the United States. Nobody can be forced to do anything, right, even if you've got personal jurisdiction and you can enjoin them. And he was very careful there after a, the part that I read to you earlier to say the following, the causes of action here have no implication on the speedy and efficient determination of the issues raised before the Wuhan court. The Wuhan court can continue to adjudicate the claims that Samsung brought, 
were brought before it pursuant to its laws and its rules of civil procedure. Boom, comedy is satisfied. He goes on to say, this court does not intend, nor does it wish to frustrate or delay the speedy and efficient determination of the case brought in Wuhan, which, which was setting global licensing rates. Without hesitation, this court equally insists that it be permitted to adjudicate the issues raised before it, pursue it to its own legitimate jurisdiction and without interference. Bottom line, if you use the Gilstrap method, comedy is satisfied on both sides and no one is getting their arm twisted past what equity allows in the United States. And we're not even involving juries at this point. Yeah, well, I, I actually, I, I disagree with that, right? I mean, I, uh, so I submitted an amicus brief um, to the federal circuit uh, opposing the, uh, the Texas action in that case. Um, not because I think that the Wuhan court should have set out to establish global rates for the um, for the parties. I think it should not have done that. Uh, but as a matter of international comedy, every judge in Texas deciding whether or not the laws of another country and uh, whether or not the judicial system of another sovereign nation are good enough um, to defer to, right? I mean, I think um, in the US, we have expected courts in other countries for decades to uh, to honor um, the judicial processes in the U.S. And I think we owe that same respect and deference to other countries. So while I think the Wuhan court was wrong um, in trying to set a global friend rate, just as I think the U.K. courts were wrong in Unwired Planet in doing that, um, I don't think it's the place of courts in Texas or elsewhere in the world to, um, to prevent parties from litigating courts that have jurisdiction and are, you know, part of uh, sovereign governments. All right. My last comment on this, Chief Judge Gilstrap, I can guarantee you, is very comfortable with what he said that I just read back to you, that he is absolutely honoring what Wuhan did, what their system did, and what our system does. If that's true, George, I don't know what your brief said, but not too long after Gilstrap handed this order down, the whole thing settled, which I'm sure everybody's aware of, because it was just a way to get people to, 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 to re-up the license, right? Standard licensing practice. But Gilstrap, there's a lot to be said for the way Gilstrap handled it. Frankly, you know, I thought whichever of the Erickson lawyers came up with this approach, I think it was brilliant. It was trial advocacy at its best because it got where everybody really needed to go, which was a business resolution of a messy problem. That's just uh, my- yeah, I don't think it was all that brilliant considering that everybody is filing these uh, ADSI um, May, actions these days. Well, everybody um, is, maybe, everybody is filing, but they, they don't have people like Gilstrap countering their move in other countries. I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe in the continent you can't do this in Germany or you can't do this in the UK. I'm not aware of anybody trying it yet. And that may be one of the things that they ought to be thinking about is trying the, a Gilstrap version uh, in front of, uh, now it's uh, Judge Arnold is on the Court of Appeal. Uh, Mr. Just, was Mr. Justice first then. He's on the Court of Appeal. Maybe they'll get a different, uh, get different response from the UK this time around. I don't know. Um, maybe getting uh, getting Steve and a bit more involved here. Do you think we're going to see as many anti suit and anti anti suit injunctions as we did in the last two years, also in the future? Or do you think it's it's eventually also becoming out of fashion because um, it hasn't really um, helped that much? Um, and if there's an ASI and ASI is coming quickly, and uh, in the end, it's just keeping lawyers busy busy is it a fashion thing yeah I, uh, first I, I hope it's a, I hope it's a fashion thing uh, just because clearly I at least personally I, I I have some discomfort with with what how they're they're going I, I don't I'm not saying that they're necessarily bad I just think that the current crop of them is is unfortunate um, the way they've been presented I do think they're going to stay we're, we're still going to see them um, in terms of the exact number, uh, certainly I wouldn't try to quantify to say it's going to be the same level, same quantity of, of ASIs filed as uh, 
come going forward as, as the past two years. I will say though that clearly there are some courts or some jurisdictions that seem somewhat immune to them. Uh, the, the German courts don't seem that entertained by ASIs filed elsewhere. And so I, I think as you're accumulating precedent, knowing that if there's a case in Germany, the Germans are not going to be very entertained by it, then maybe uh, you don't file um, against those. But but there's still going to be some, I, I think some of the hot spots between China, India, UK, and US, I, I still think we're going to see volleys of ASIs, AASIs, and, and so forth. Uh, because Volley you still, is a good, good you still can get some play in, in, in those yeah. sports at least, absolutely. It, it indeed is a volley match. It's a, a, yeah. a, a match. It's 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 very quick, and it has cost me many nights. Yeah. Um, um, but yes, as uh, you you rightly pointed out, uh, as not everybody may be aware, uh, the the Munich court in Germany has ruled that anybody asking for an anti suit injunction is per se considered to be unwilling, and therefore lo has lost his friend defense. Um, that, of course, is a very strong statement and, and should be quite deterring, as you rightly say, Stephen, um, if you are litigating in Germany to stay away from these um, uh, measures. So maybe um, uh, as we are uh, uh, concluding on the topic of, of um, anti-suit injunctions, um, and maybe we, we'd already touched upon it a bit, um, moving to the topic of, of jurisdiction. And as I think we all concluded that anti-suit injunctions are there because there is uh, a dispute about the right court and the right, uh, right, uh, right jurisdiction and uh, the, uh, the reason is in the parallel litigation that is going on. Um, so, um, Ken, what is your view on that? Uh, should just every national court uh, decide which is called upon? Should uh, one court wait for the other freely, maybe not with an anti-suit injunction? How do we solve the issue that basically squaring the circle? We have national patent rights, but we have right. global license agreements. That uh, seems kind of impossible to really set that straight. Well, I, I I agree, as as David said. I mean, there are so many business issues that are that really are involved here, right? I mean, if you can't have everybody using their border interdiction laws and provisions, which of course are trade acts, they using their ITC, using uh, the uh, EU equivalent of of the ITC, which there is one, which a lot of people don't know. And the last people in the world you want to get into that kind of a fight with is the Chinese, because the Chinese don't only interdict coming into the PRC, they're the only country that I'm aware of that interdicts on the way out. So if you want to start those types of wars, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pick, I wouldn't pick the uh, pick an ITC type remedy to do it. I don't, I don't have a good, I don't have a good answer to how you get, how you get past this, other than. You've got to come up with business business resolutions here. Uh, I mean, George has written, and others uh, academics have written uh, about coming out with uh, you know non governmental entities that will decide the number, which is usually what sticks people up and starts lawsuits when the license expires. They have, they want to re up the license, but they can't agree on the number. Uh, getting a better way to front end load the damages determinations, which you can do under U.S. practice. It's not easy, but it can be done. You can forward bifurcate things uh, and move the damages into the front end and have a person go out and determine what the real correct SEP friend number is. And usually once the business people see the number, the matter goes away because they don't want to be paying people like me and Deborah and Steve back when he you know, was a real trial lawyer in Cordula. Uh, to be doing this, it, 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 but I, I don't have the answer to the question because it is a business issue. I don't think it's a trade issue. I think it's a flat out because they are contracts. I think it's just a, a straight up licensing issue. And that means the people involved in the licensing uh, need to work it out with each other. They have to use it sounds like I'm talking it, but I'm saying it that way because I don't have a better answer. I don't have a better answer. Than that. You, you, so you, um, uh, according to you, your view, you always need consent, and usually the people litigating they don't have consent on which court should decide the matter. Would would you have a solution, George? What what would be your suggestion to how to solve the jurisdiction issue? 
so so there's the court jurisdiction issue and then there's deciding the friend rate issue right and and they're both they're both related um and i think the i think as, as uh, you just heard you know there there are proposals out there that the friend rates could be decided by a governmental rate setting tribunal um if that were the case and uh, standards organizations said you know the friend rate uh, if there's a disagreement over a friend rate for licensing of these standards, it goes to this tribunal, and it's a tribunal that uh, collects everybody together, like a copyright rate setting tribunal. All of the potential patent holders, all of the potential implementers who want to go are represented, and you could uh, come up with a rate there. If, if such a rate were created uh, for a particular standard, then you wouldn't have the sorts of friend litigation that we see today because this is a contractual matter. If the SDO says the rate is the rate that this tribunal comes up with, then that's the rate. Uh, an implementer can't complain that it's too high um, and a, um, a patent holder can't complain that it's too low. It, it is what it is. Um, without that, and we don't have this kind of tribunal today, um, we've got the jurisdiction problem. And I think the best solution for that is um, not to have a trade war and uh, not to uh, do anything too <clears throat> radical, but also not to have courts continue to uh, set global rates. That the courts, the the judiciaries of these various countries should voluntarily um, agree to step back or stand down from the global rate determinations and just determine the rates for the patents in their countries um, with an understanding that global rates can be set by some tribunal that may arise in the future but um but not not instigate these uh, these disputes among courts by trying to set the global rates whether they use a contract theory or not it, it just isn't working um steven in in your experience um, um is is uh, any type of alternative dispute resolution uh is that is that working what's uh what's kind of the Percentage is that a very rare case that the parties actually do agree on on such um, ADR mechanisms, or is uh, most most license agreements are anyway concluded outside court and we never hear about them, and it's only the ones uh, the parties that really don't like each other that go to court and that would then also don't agree on uh, uh, on any alternative dispute resolution. So it it, it is it probably does fall somewhere in the middle. Uh, a lot of licensing deals, of course, are, are concluded without disturbing any courts, without any action filed. There, there's a lot of that. Um, and, and so that, that's probably the, the, the good part of this. In, in terms of the cases, uh, things that do go to, to court, you know, a lot of people see it. Um, uh, they think it's one extreme or the other. It's a hold up or hold out. Now, now, certainly, and, and I know that the academic literature uh, certainly points more toward the possibility of hold out. Um, that said, though, just because two, two sides don't agree on a rate doesn't mean that someone is holding out. You can have a legitimate dispute on whether the rate should be $2 or $1.80 per unit on, on, on a given product. And, and that 20 cent difference multiplied over millions of units or billions of units is, is a lot of money, and that's a legitimate dispute. But the difference between $1.80 and $2 is certainly not the same as $2 versus two cents. And that may be more of, of the true holdup. And, and that's the litigation. I, I, exactly. I, I'm not and, sure whether parties between $1.80 and $2 actually go to court. Um, oh, so, well, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> it will. But, yeah, you know, I, I, you, I, I've <laughs> only seen gaps of uh, oh, sure, 100. Sure, sure. yeah, that, that's <laughs> the, more, the more infamous ones. But but going more to, to the heart of your, your uh, question. Many companies just do not like or do not trust arbitration. They, they've had bad experience about it or, or for other reasons, they just don't want to go that route. Uh, you know, consent, we, we keep talking about that a lot. Consent is very difficult to, to achieve, at least in certain industries or certain corners uh, of, of uh, the market players. And so that's why arbitration, sure, many Many companies like arbitration, and there, there may be license agreements that, that require it um, in, in the future going forward. But there still, obviously, are many instances where arbitration is is not consented to, and that's why we're in in the courts of a nation. One thing I will throw out, and this is kind of a pet issue that I've I've developed recently, is uh, while thinking through these, uh, 
these problems because this, this is a, a global uh, problem. It's international. We need to figure out how we're going to all get along between countries. But uh, within the U.S., one of the oddities we have is even though we have the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which is specialized, which is supposed to preside over and decide all substantive patent law issues, if, if a case comes in as a contract case or an antitrust case, even though at its heart it's dealing with France, it goes to a regional circuit. So in the United States, we now are putting, um, uh, having, having regional courts, the Fifth Circuit or the Ninth Circuit, um, addressing FRAND licensing issues rather than the federal circuit. And what that means then looking uh, over overseas is the United States may not even be speaking with one voice in terms of what at the appellate court level is going to be our approach and, and our policy. Uh, so just speaking internally as an American, I'm not sure that we're on the, on the correct footing there if we're going to have at least a unified approach even within the United States. And then once we do that, perhaps then we can get on the same page as as the Brits and, and the Germans and the Chinese and uh, Indians and everyone else uh, around the world. Yeah. That's Boy, I'm glad I never suggest. I'm glad I didn't just suggest that. <laughs> you want to put, you want to, you, you know, the, the, the Fifth Circuit has been doing a pretty good, pretty good job, right, in the, in the last couple of cases that, that they had, the, the, you know, the H, on HTC and uh, Chief Judge Lynn's uh, summary judgment case where she said, uh, these are contract cases. They're not antitrust, and she blew all the antitrust counts out. Of course, that's on appeal. But you're you're going to have the ninth and the fifth and the fourth and the first. You're going to have such a race to the courthouse if they if if you if you that's the way we're going to start to do it now. You're not going to be able to keep track of it all, and it is going to turn into a nightmare. It is absolutely going to turn into the night a nightmare, particularly since. You don't, we, none of us know what the DOJ and the FTC is about to do because they're not on the field yet, right? I think, Steve, if everybody had the, the experience that the Ninth Circuit does and the Fifth Circuit does in these types of cases, if all 12 of the, dis, well, you, you wouldn't have all 13 because you, you're, you're getting the Federal Circuit out of it if it's contract only. If all 12 of the, cir of the circuits had the same level of experience, it, it, it might be interesting, but you're just going to change the, the, the run to who's going to go where first. Right. It, it, it's it's yeah. going to be a race. It, it, it's, it's, just not the way the, not. it's just not the way the U.S. system is intended to work. I mean, there's no reason in the world why the federal circuit should hear all of these cases. There are hundreds of other international commercial issues around banking and M&A deals and uh, uh, so forth that are heard by the regional circuits. They do a fine job. I mean, we have one Supreme Court, that's why we have one Supreme Court, but you certainly don't need at the intermediate appellate level. Uh, there, there's no compelling reason to have the federal circuit um, be the one to adjudicate these cases. I think the regional circuits are very competent. Um, I mean, I disagree with some of their decisions, but I still think as a systemic matter, they're perfectly competent to hear these cases. Well, may, may, maybe yes, may, maybe yes, maybe no. There's been a bunch of blog postings, George, which I know you've seen over the last, I think, two two weeks of a bunch of your colleagues, various academics saying, isn't the Federal Circuit after 40 years a failed experiment because it didn't do what everybody was told, Congress was told it was going to do. It's a failure. We just sort of throw the Federal Circuit out. And if that's true, then all of this, well, the only place it could go, contract or otherwise, would be, would be, the, would be the regional circuits. You would end up there. But well, I mean, isn't it in the end, uh, also judges are just humans. And uh, if you have two judges, you would always also m or might end up with two different decisions. Um, and each case is different. So I'm, I'm not so sure how much harmonization can eventually um, uh, can eventually bring. So we, you will always have a case by case uh, decision. And that's why we're here. That's why if you wouldn't need lawyers if everything was harmonized and the outcome was, was foreseeable. Um, um, isn't that, uh, isn't that um, the point? But maybe just, just a bit going back on the alternative uh, dispute resolution or, or uh, trying to solve this whole um, friend issue. Would it be a solution if 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 the standard uh, uh, setting organizations uh, demanded uh, some type of um, arbitration or something? Um, I uh, maybe I can can um, 
a bit um, voice already my concerns a bit it's the same coming from the civil law uh, tradition saying why I have concerns with anti suit injunctions it's it's this uh, fundamental right of everybody to go uh, to have access to state courts so I'm I'm skeptic about any type of obligation to go to a non state uh, court um, if if parties consent on that that's fine but um, I'm I'm skeptic about any um, uh, obligation has someone a different view on that yeah, well, Dave, quite, Dave, quite, you, quite, you've been quiet for a while. What, what's your view on this? Sure, sure. No, it's I, a real, I'm being very serious. I really would like to hear your view on this. I'm, I'm usually a shrinking violet on these pa panels, so I, I appreciate you turning it over to me, Ken. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I actually agree with Cordula. I think that, uh, but though I come at it from a different perspective, I think that mandatory arbitration is is a bad idea. Uh, I think that it certainly is possible under the rules of a SSO that you could say, hey, if you want to be part of this SSO, you have to agree uh, as a member that you're going to arbitrate. Some some SSOs do that, and it can affect membership. It can affect, you know, sort of desire to participate. But I, I also think this whole ADR issue is another symptom of the same problem. We've got a, a practical issue, which is, gee, it'd be great if people could agree on a global basis. And we're trying to turn that into some sort of legal obligation or legal remedy that doesn't exist, right? If, if as George was saying earlier, if, if the German courts find infringement of a German patent, they, they might, you know, have the right and, and the obligation to set German rights. But it's when we, we take this myth that if you only set German rights, you're somehow undermining the rights of the patent holder that we then try to now expand Not a myth. those rights. Not a myth. Well, it, it is because it is a myth, actually. It is a myth. Both sides have, have a desire and a goal and, an in, and more importantly, an incentive to find a global solution. It's not cheap for anyone, patent holder or licensee, to, to, to litigate on a country by country basis. Nor is it not compensable if one side litigates and the other one does as well, right? The winner can pay attorney's fees and the loser can, you know, if they operate in bad faith, can pay sanctions and treble damages for willful infringement. There's all sorts of ways to monetarily disincentivize that type of behavior. And this myth that we have to create a new proxy global system for IP, whether through extraterritorial decision making or through mandatory ADR, I think is fundamentally mistaken and, and, and we're, we're hitting it from, from a bunch of different angles, but that's the problem. Dave, or could it be that um, you dislike the way the courts in, for example, Germany come up with a global rate because you don't like the global rate that you don't want the German courts to decide it, if I may may yeah. ask a bit uh, provocatively? No, I, I mean, because in the end they look at they look word. when they assess whether the the offers on the table are friend they do assess the comparables they do assess the situation and eventually um say this is what uh, parties that negotiate in good faith have come up with look cor courts in uh, the netherlands may not prosecute you if you get caught with a bag of, of, of magic mushrooms courts in uh in texas might prosecute you if you get caught with a bag of magic, magic mushrooms whether I like magic mushrooms or don't like magic mushrooms is sort of beside the point. The point is, if you caught with a bag of magic mushrooms in Texas, you shouldn't get prosecuted by a Dutch court or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And and that's what's happening. In other words, I could talk. But to we're you not. The German court is not assessing the the infringement of of the of the of the U.S. patent. Of course they are. It's not. How it's not injunction. There's no injunction on 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 there's, the U.S. And isn't the an isn't the if effect? You don't take there's an injunction yeah. if you don't take the rate that they set for U.S. patents. That entails a finding of infringement. You don't have to pay for patents you don't infringe. Whether you do it explicitly yes. or implicitly, it's still. But being isn't done. that just that's just because here in the example, uh, the German sophism. market is a as a relevant market. If it was, forgive me for any anybody coming from Luxembourg, if it was Luxembourg deciding it, nobody would care whether they issue an injunction or not. So it's it's an indirect no. effect. Isn't it purely to the it, size of the market. It, it's an obviously intended indirect effect, and it's, it's sophism to say otherwise. Look, if the German courts want to say, stay, set rates based on methodologies for, for German patents that I personally think aren't the, you know, the best laws, um, that's their prerogative. 
when German courts set rates based on methodologies that are unique in the legal system and then apply them to patents in foreign countries that use different methodologies that would come to different rates if applied in the, in the particular case, that is a problem. And, and I don't see how it's not a, 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 a more widely recognized problem that, that really should be concerning U.S. lawmakers, U.S. politicians, not just lawyers. Right. This this really is a fundamental encroachment on the U.S. legal patent system. Anyone yeah, to I, comment before we can? Yeah, well, and then I, I'd like to comment. Um, so I, I agree with almost everything that Dave said, except referring to this idea as a myth, because a myth implies that something has been around for a very long time. And, and this idea that a national court has to develop a global rate um, because that's what parties do on their own. That that's just a mistake. It's not a myth, and it it has a very recent origin. The origin is in 2017, um, in Mr. Justice Pierce's opinion, in the first opinion in Unwired Planet. That's where it came from, um, and and that German courts also before that have have uh, have decided that a friend offer is a global uh, is a global friend offer, a global license offer. But yeah, that's, had, what courts courts do that. that's not what courts, that's not what courts, patent, this is not how patent litigation works. In every other industry, take the pharmaceutical industry, um, companies litigate all around the world and it's expensive, but they do it if they want to stop people from counterfeiting their drugs or whatever in other countries. A, country, a, a court in France does not affect, you know, the, uh, the pharmaceutical litigation in the United States. That's That's just unheard of. And that's how... Patent litigation plays out in every other industry. There's just this weird new idea here that just because parties will negotiate global licenses sometimes, the courts ought to step into their shoes and, and uh, determine global license rates. But that's a very new idea, and it's a very bad idea. Okay, well, hi. Except, any final sure. words from you, Ken? Where's that? Oh, First was very careful to point out that, and the reality of it is, I mean, I, I, I spent a lot of time over the years representing a particular company that was a huge worldwide licensor. And every five years when the licenses expired, I had to go out and dance and get everybody to, 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 to sign up again. First is absolutely right. In certain industries, everything is done exactly the way Burst said it. Nobody negotiates country by country. Proud lists don't work that way. It just doesn't it just doesn't work that way. So he's right. And I've got two good solid German lawyers who know that the infringement gap makes everybody on the planet really pay attention to what happens in Germany because we don't have country by country products anymore. Everybody makes products on the world on a world stage. And if Germany shuts you down uh, after an infringement uh, decision on patents that uh, Dayliff and Cordula, I think the numbers are, but if you ever are around long enough to get the validity, something like 45 or 50 or 55 percent of the patents that had led to an earlier infringement verdict are being found invalid. You want to talk about the tail wagging the dog. The system is full of these types of situations. It's not just the United States. It's full of these things. Well, can I adopt yeah, that number? Right. Yeah. Um, Can I adopt that the number that the number of revocations is that of, of full revocations is that high? Usually, the patents are maintained in a limited form, and yes. and usually uh, the infant the the proprietor is looking uh, when when he um, accepts limitations that it's still the, the accused product is is uh, still caught. But that that's a different story. Um, <laughs> Should one court set rates for, for other jurisdictions? Well, um, Dave, I I'm fully agree with you. No, they shouldn't. And they shouldn't also not do it indirectly. But people who knows me in litigation um, know that I'm a fan for, for amicable settlements because they give quick and almost um, every time cheaper um, legal uh, certainty than, than, than a court dispute does. Even here in Germany, where the courts are quite click, quick with, with one year uh, first instance litigation and two more years for the second instance. Um, 
so I'm I'm a fan of of RDR here, but um, problem be, being is uh, we, we cannot uh, oblige anybody uh, to agree in a in a in a um, mediation or arbitration, because um, generally the, the implementer will not be a member of of the uh, of the standardization group or very often isn't if if he is a member of there of that then usually this this standardization organization at least here in europe they have some idea of what what a front uh, friend license is so i um, think I'm, I'm, I'm conscious a bit of time and we still have to cover some ground um, mm. and I think uh, what we can take from the previous discussion is um, uh, that uh, 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 European courts are setting uh, global rates uh, uh, and uh, favour the patentee and I think uh, in the last years we've, we've also seen quite some favourable decisions coming out of the US uh, question is, is that going to stay or is it going to change in view of the new Biden administration and the latest changes at the DOJ and, and uh, the FTC? Um, I think, Ken, you have an opinion on that. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, uh, Del Rahim is gone. Uh, so how the DOJ uh, ran itself uh, last year, even, or slightly before that, uh, is apparently gone with it. Well, I should say apparently. It's gone as well. So we're not sure exactly what's going to happen uh, past, past this point. Um, but it's a very interesting uh, situation. Uh, I, hopefully most people who are listening to this uh, are aware that the Department of Justice has an antitrust division and their major responsibility is enforcing the, 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 the Sherman at Sherman One, Sherman Two, they have other. It's just Clayton Seven and other other provisions, but that's what they do. The FTC is a separate body that is essentially charged with enforcing Article Five or Section Five. I'm sorry of their Act. So you've got two different uh, competition bodies here in the United States that can get involved in all sorts of different studies and conduct and try to decide whether they're going to bring an enforcement action or, or not. Those of you who remember FTC Qualcomm watched the DOJ basically file briefs contrary to what the FTC was doing, which had never really happened before. It was just madness, which is what Mr. Justice Burst said when he said anybody who would license other than uh, worldwide, it wouldn't happen because it's madness. Well, here's the problem we have right now. It's November 4th, we haven't got yet a person officially in charge of the Department of Justice Antitrust Division. We have a nominee, uh, a gentleman named Jonathan Cantor, who is well known for being uh, uh, a person who has not liked the large, the, the uh, alphabets and the Googles of the world. He's the nominee. He recently went through his uh, uh, interviews or his questioning uh, in front of a congressional committee, and he did a wonderful job, essentially, on not saying anything that could be uh, held uh, out uh, in, in, in later on if, if and when he gets uh, the, the job officially, which everybody says is going to happen. There are two very good articles, IP Watchdog, October 24th of 2021, and an I Am article, October 8th. If you want to find out what Cantor's views are, you can look at them, but the bottom line is you don't know. But what you do know is Wilder, who is the gentleman who's been running the antitrust division uh, since Del Rahim left, so pretty much since Biden became president, uh, president, excuse me, has very clearly said things are changing. This is not going to be the way Del Rahim did things. Things are going to change. We are going to toughen up in a lot of in a lot of areas. Uh, it was an extremely good article, October 27, 2021, in IP Watchdog, explaining all these things that, that may happen. The bottom line is we may start moving towards where the European concept is, opposite where Chief Judge Lynn came out, where we may start thinking the competition law is available to, 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 to figure out some of these SCP friend issues 
And we're going to see this sooner rather than later. If you listen, if you read what they what Wilder has said in various speeches, that seems to be the direction that he's intimating things are going to go. So it could change rather quickly and rather radically. Two days ago, right? Today's no three days ago. Fate, uh, Federal Trade Commissioner Rebecca Kelly Slaughter, this is the FTC now, gave a speech in which she said she's calling on her agency to investigate antitrust violations related to standard essential patents and bring, quote, tough cases, close quote, against patent owners who won't license those patents on fair and reasonable terms. The chairman of the FTC now is a, is a Ms. Khan. Uh, out of Yale, very well known as being very tough on big corporations. So I'm not sure what's going to happen other than it's not going to be business as usual. And now you've got both the FTC and the DOJ antitrust division looking like they're talking in parallel. So I'm, contract so I'm, may be what based these things on, but that might, might, may not be the only solution. Until that get resol gets resolved, everything is up in the air. Um, I'm a bit. I'm. Uh, I. I'm a bit. A bit again from the kind of external view. Surprised uh, uh, the impact of of such offices may have on the application of the law. I think we are, we have these things are a bit more separated uh, in 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 Germany. The courts just do the same job. Never mind who heads. Uh, the antitrust um, authorities, um, or who is uh, who is uh, chairing some type of ministry. Um, uh, Stephen, what is your view on on the on the future um, years uh, to come for for litigation in the U.S. on on standard essential patents? Is that going to change, and in what, which direction do you think? Uh, what impact will it have to have a different administration? So, certainly, I, I, I'll be the first to admit I'm not following it as closely as, as Ken is. Uh, clearly, Ken is, is reading a lot, and I'm sure George is as, as well. Um, it, the, the pendulum certainly does swing. I, I, I think, Cordelia, you, you made a great um, observation, I think, from the outside looking in. It, it's, it's quite strange. The, the law itself doesn't change, but because of the enforcement, whether to enforce and how to enforce, when to enforce, uh, does change, just night and day difference uh, from one administration to another. It, it does completely change the environment in which these these cases are, are, are going to be presented to, to courts. And uh, compounding that, it, it's not only a change within the, the antitrust division, but as, as Ken was talking about, in the past we had tension between the FTC and the antitrust uh, division, and, and the Qualcomm case was, was certainly where, where that was laid out in, in, in the open. Um, I, I do think, though, on, on the whole, the we're, we're going to see more uh, antitrust involvement, whether it's the government, uh, FTC, or, or um, antitrust division, or whether it's private parties with antitrust claims. I, I do think we're, we're going to see that for a while. It's just it, it's low hanging fruit for some people to to add that to a complaint or to a, a uh, to an answer, uh, uh, in, you know, in a lawsuit. So I, I do think we're, we're going to see it. But in terms of how it plays out, I, I don't know. At, at this point, clearly, you know, our conferences, we've been talking about this type of, of uncertainty in FRAND licensing and litigation for a number of years, certainly since Unwired Planet versus Huawei, which I'm not commenting on the case itself, but since that case occurred, all of this has gone up a notch in its complexity, uncertainty, and the ramifications around the world. And adding this layer of antitrust versus also the, the case that we're going to get the opinions in contract law, layering all of that on top of itself, it, it's just turned into a, a very difficult, it, it's just overly complex. And I think it's, it, it's undue complexity. It shouldn't be this difficult to do SCP licensing and litigation. It just, it shouldn't, but unfortunately it is. George, what's yeah. your view on the next years in the for litigation in the US? Yeah, thanks. No, I, I mean, I, I see the developments that we've seen over the last few months. It's basically restoring the, uh, the executive agencies to normal. Um, the, the Trump administration was an aberration in US politics in, in many ways. Um, including in the antitrust area. But 
for at least three or four administrations before that, um, when as long as these SCP cases uh, existed, the FTC and the DOJ cooperated and, um, you know, had a consistent view, which is productive and what you would expect. Um, you know, whether prosecutions uh, will increase or not, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to predict. But, but there are a lot of other useful things that the agencies can do um, short of actually bringing antitrust cases. Um, and one of those is the business review letters um, that they issue in, in cases uh, back from Vita and the, uh, the, the DVD uh, pools and um, even the IEEE's uh, 2015 uh, letter, which uh, indicated uh, pro-competitive effects of the IEEE's uh, policy changes. Th those are very productive and very useful. If we've been talking about the potential of rate setting tribunal, one of the obstacles to those being implemented is the um, alleged fear uh, that uh, floats around the uh, the marketplace that that it may uh, violate antitrust laws in some way for uh, groups of implementers and SCP holders to uh, to agree on rates as as a group and. I think uh, many uh, of the antitrust enforcers in the past have not believed that it is, um, but those fears have um, have remained, or at least are stated, uh, by those who find it in their interest not to uh, not to have that kind of rate setting. I think that our agencies can, though, um, remove that kind of fear and say that at least from an agency enforcement standpoint, uh, this is a pro-competitive activity that wouldn't result in prosecution by the agencies um, and could seriously move the ball forward in trying to resolve some of these issues that we've been talking about. Um, just, uh, um, can we ask, I, can we ask, yes, Dave, can we ask Dave for Dave's news? Dave, come on, okay. man. Yeah. Be your normal okay. self. Jump Ken, in. You're awesome. I love it. This is great. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be happy to, to, to share that I that I, I share some of George's views. Um, we've had a long uh, historic tradition of American treatment of antitrust issues around SEPs. Uh, it goes back uh, not just to Reagan, but but as George's, um, if you haven't read it, his, his enormously helpful a historical article about the development of FRAND as a concept in the first place and its adoption into the American National Standards Institute and then its blossoming out beyond into other organizations, be it Etsy or, or IEEE or any other. FRAND was created as an antitrust safeguard. That, that was its purpose. That's why it was adopted in the first place. That's why it came to ANSI and that's why other, comp uh, other SSOs took it. Um, the notion under the prior administration at the antitrust division that FRAND was not an antitrust issue was radical, absolutely unprecedented, completely a 180 degree turnaround from everything that had come before it. And I uh, think that it's not a partisan issue. It's not Democrat, Republican. It's not anything like that. This has been a historical American way to look at the FRAND promise as something that is subject to antitrust scrutiny. Not every breach of a FRAN promise is subject to antitrust, but when it harms competition, the antitrust agencies have always said that they're gonna be there to backstop and protect the, the, the competition in the industry that can be caused by an antitrust, by, by a FRAN violation. But why and, is and that not that up to the sense? courts to decide? Why is that not up to the courts to decide to well, have it, the SEP litigation in front the of them? I think courts enforce the law. Um, the the, the Antitrust agencies are designed to be able to bring antitrust claims on behalf of consumers, uh, and they can also uh, make policy statements, just like the prior administration make policy statements. I agree with you. This should not be a political issue. This is a legal issue. The, the problem is that the politics of the, the last antitrust division got in the way of the legal issue, and now we're going back to basics. I, at least I hope we are. Yeah, it's um, so I, I uh, again and again I I um, uh, feel it's a strange country, um, but I'm I'm happy to learn more. Um, the, the European Commission exercises far more direct yes. uh, semi-legislative authority than any of the U.S. But not on the courts. The the the, 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 the courts are not um, influenced at all by who is heading which department. 
the decisions, the outcome of the decisions will just be the same. So there's no that that's not true. Um, um, uh, the 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 so the legal system as such works just the same. They may 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 do some political steps, but uh, or change the law if it gets that far. Um, but only when the law is changed, you have different uh, court decisions coming out. I would think. Uh, don't <laughs> don't take my illusions. Um, well, we have. We have uh, a couple of minutes left, and I, because it's promised in the agenda, I do still uh, at least briefly want to touch upon one final topic, that's the, the front licensing and the value chain. Um, uh, connected cars have been prominently here, um, where we have the situation that a, um, a patentee is um, litigating against an OEM, an end product uh, manufacturer, um, to get him to take a friend license. And that OEM says, no, I don't want to take the license. Please go to my supplier, the direct supplier being the tier one um, supplier. And the question is, and that assuming that this tier one supplier is willing, uh, to take a license so the question is can um, the OEM refuse to take a license and keep on infringing until the tier one has taken a license or can the patentee say um, no I want you the OEM manufacturer to be the one who has to take a license because you are infringing um, and um, I want to um, that, that is my licensing concept um, I'm not sure that's the right way of framing the question, though. I, I think the question is framed as, can a patent holder refuse to license to a supplier? It's not about an OEM continuing to infringe. No, it's, it's both OEM sides of the question. Supplier, it's also the question, can the OEM refuse to take a license? and okay, just say sure. go and find someone else I, I don't think that's anyone's position that was I the question the OE, that was the I question think the OEM's position I, but that's not the question the OEMs have not taken that position in this industry and in the automotive industry other industries the OEMs have said we want to buy licensed products we want to obtain a license by virtue of our suppliers yeah, but we don't rate. want to be the, the ones taking the license well, the only reason that question exists is because the suppliers are being refused licenses by the patent holder. It's an, it, that's, that's the fundamental problem. I and mean, going back to the early 90s, when the Etsy policy was written, you saw licenses at the supplier level, at the component level. Qualcomm had hundreds of them. Semiconductor companies like Harris and Motorola had dozens of licenses, right? L licensing at the component level, licensing at the module level was what was the norm for a very long time. And it's only in more recent times that companies have started refusing to license at the component level. And that's what's creating this issue with the OEMs, not any reluctance by the OEMs. They tell their suppliers, go get every license I yeah, need but to operate legally. What happens, that's what they're what doing. happens, dear Dave, what happens if the OEM says, go to the my tier one supplier, he is willing to take a license. And then the patentee goes to the tier one supplier and says, okay, let's talk. And the tier one supplier says, oh no, it's not me. Please go to the tier two supplier and try to get a license. And then the OEM goes to the tier two supplier, offers the same license rate that was offered to the OEM. And that tier two supplier says, oh no, not me. Please go to my supplier because I want to buy licensed um, products. Well, I, first of all, that can what be happens? figured out in like a couple of days, so it's not a big hardship. Ugh. Second of all, the best result would be that you go beyond the tier one or tier two and go to the chip maker, because if you license the chip maker, you can license like three companies and you get the entire market, right? You license Qualcomm, mm -hmm. MediaTek, uh, maybe a few others, Intel, a few, you're going to get the entire market. And so instead of having 5,000 licensing negotiations, a patent five. That seems to me to be it's an not five. It's of not course. five. It's and not five thousand. I think. And, 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 that, and, and by the way, that, that is the way that every other industry works, right? Again, this is we developed in the wireless telecom industry, in the semiconductor industry, whether it's, it's for video chips or microprocessors or or MEMS devices or. Uh, amplifiers, all of these electronic products are licensed at the chip level. That is the only thing that makes sense. This system became distorted 
uh, when when uh, companies that held patents got out of business or when they got out of the product business. Can I? And, 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 can and I also that's question? Why we're in this weird situation. I question coming in. That was actually also my question. It's a question also coming in from the from the audience. What about when chips in IoT are used in very different end products with very different values of using the patented technology? So the point being that the value of the license should be in relationship to the value that is brought to the end product, and not the value of the hardware. Um, and of course, the chip is in the chip, it's not yet clear what value that technology will have in the end product. Is the position that the value of the patent changes depending what end product the same chip is put in? Because we have yeah. something in the US called the yes. entire market value rule, which says that that's only permissible when you can prove that the entire value of the end product is based on the value of the single patent. For standards, that makes no sense. The way that this is dealt with in practical perspectives is IoT chips are very different than, than, than what I'll call standard cellular chips. IoT is a dumbed down, small version of the standard, not the large version of the standard. If you put an, a, 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 a high-end Cat14 chip in a blender, you know, that's not a good idea. You, you put a low-end IoT chip in a blender and it costs less and you probably pay less um, in licensing fees. But putting that same right. chip in a different device, I don't think changes the, 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 the scenario. Yeah. Right, and, and the, the, answer, then, is the answer is to just charge different prices for the different chips. Um, but then you never know going. where it comes out. And I, I may just add, because our time is, is running out, that that's exactly what at least the German courts have uh, are proposing. The value of the license has to be calculated on the level of the end product, or the value in, of, in the end product. And that, of course, the further away you go from the end product, the more difficult it becomes to track down that that was a submission. But I um, so until recently, uh, if there was a panel on artificial intelligence at an intellectual property conference, it might have focused primarily on products. Today, patent analytics are mainstream. The idea of AI as an inventor has been recognized in at least a couple of jurisdictions. Uh, and the role of artificial intelligence in regulation more generally is being taken much more seriously. Uh, this panel uh, is going to look at emerging trends and developments in artificial intelligence. Um, the bullet points in the program give an indication of some of the possible topics, uh, but we were very clear that this is an inclusive rather than exclusive list. Those bullet points covered how IP officers view AI as inventions for inventions and, ex and in examining inventions, data privacy and artificial intelligence, WIPO's AI initiatives, computational antitrust, the implications of the EU digital regulation on artificial intelligence and potential practical examples of when it matters, when a human as opposed to an artificial intelligence was involved in an innovation or use. Uh, we have a fantastic panel to help us, if not answer all these questions, at least clarify the questions. Uh, and it includes regulators. We've got Jerry Ma from the US Patent and Trade um, Office. We've got Ulrika Till from the World Intellectual Property Organization. We've also got representatives from industry, Fung Yi from NREL, uh, and also uh, Kate Gaudry from Kilpatrick Townsend. Uh, we've also got academics like myself, Peter Picht from the University of Zurich, and Thibaut Schreppel from Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam uh, in the Netherlands. Um, as I said, what I'd be hoping for is uh, brief comments from the panel. I'll ask them each a question myself to get started, maybe then some follow-ups, uh, and then we'll be opening it up to the floor reasonably soon. But maybe to set the table, if you like, um, let me first turn to you, Kate, uh, from Kilpatrick Townsend with, uh, with your legal practitioner hat on. Um, discussion in the academic context of AI is often very theoretical, and I'm, I'm guilty of some of that myself. Can I ask you to start us off by really helping ground this panel on, um, by outlining some of the examples of where it matters when an AI system, as opposed to a human, is involved in innovation or use for the purposes of IP. Okay, can I throw the floor over to you for a moment? Certainly. Um, so I, th I think one of the more popular topics to answer that question right now is, is thinking about what happens when AI is doing something inventive. Um, and what what's interesting to me is not only thinking about the very extreme case, but kind of some of the in-between. So the extreme case right now that's going on around the world is with the um, the Davis cases. And so here, no human was an inventor. You just had this AI program that was generating outputs. 
Um, and a lot of the patent offices are saying you can't patent it in that case. Now, I find it a little more interesting if you think about a situation where you would normally call a human an inventor. So for example, um, it's sometimes in, in biology labs, there's, there's sophisticated screens. They're calling um, evolutionary, uh, I forget the, the name for it right now, evolutionary um, screening, something like this, right? Where you identify the problem, but then essentially everything just takes off, like normal mutations take off to identify the um, output that you're interested in. Now, if a human was doing that, you would say this other person should be the inventor. The only thing that the human is actually doing in these cases is identifying the problem. So we have this disconnect where we say a human would need to be listed in this case. Otherwise, maybe the patent would be invalid, but we're not going to let you substitute something else. And so what's happening more and more is that you're having situations, or not happening more and more, but it's, it's becoming more possible that there are situations where you cannot have um, the, the type of inventor list, the, the type of inventorship requirements that consistently apply across different scenarios. So that's the biggest issue, I would say. Um, but there's other issues, uh, like what happens um, when you're, you have a, a piece of, when you're innovating in the space of AI, and then you need to figure out what one of skill in the art is like what level are we going to expect people or one of skill in the art to be do we assume that they have ai at their disposal um do we assume that we have they have a specific kind of ai at their disposal uh or do we just kind of go back to our, our normal one of skill in the art um, type of of standards so those are a couple of the issues um but really it touches i would say on all areas of patent law we could talk about enablement, we could talk about um, patent eligibility, and I have a feeling we, we might jump to some of those later in the discussion, but that, that's kind of a starting point, I suppose. So, uh, as, as you said, one of, the, one of the issues that arises uh, quite intentionally, because it was an intentionally provocative act, was the Davos case. Uh, and so uh, Ryan Abbott, who's a counterpart of mine, an academic in, in Surrey, um, with Peter Thiel and others, has been going around the world trying his luck. Uh, and one place where he failed was the US PTO. Uh, so, uh, so Jerry, um, apart from anything else, I'm curious your reaction to the fact that Australia and South Africa uh, ended up, I think in August, uh, recognizing Davos as the inventor, at least for the purposes of a patent application. Uh, but in the larger context, IP offices have really emerged as one of these areas in which the legal status of AI systems has been uh, contested. Can you talk a bit about um, how that works out from your perspective, both in general uh, and in the USPTO in particular, uh, when AI is not just an invention, but potentially an inventor? Sure thing. Um, first of all, apologies in advance for subjecting the audience to the scratchy voice treatment. I'm still recovering from one of the two we uh, seem to forgot existed before this whole COVID thing. Uh, nevertheless, I'm so delighted to be here with my distinguished co-panelists. Um, and, you know, as you said, I think, uh, you know, they're at least from the USPTO perspective, uh, you know, we see a broad multifaceted engagement with AI as subject matter for invention in the inventive process and in the examination process. I think all three of these merit discussion. So turning to AI as inventions, um, you know, governments around the world have recognized the importance of uh, leadership and in AI innovation as one of the fundamental pillars of future economic growth. And, you know, just this year, uh, we in the United States kicked off our national AI initiative. Other jurisdictions such as the EU and the UK have also released AI strategies that, you know, while may differ in the details, also acknowledge the integrality of technical excellence in AI for their uh, national or, you know, in some cases, super national agendas. Um, so IP offices, including the USPTO, are very, very keen to observe and to understand the rise of AI within inventions submitted to our offices for patent. This can manifest in you know, scientific research. For example, the USPTO recently released an AI patent data set uh, to share with the world our methodology and uh, our data sets for locating and classifying AI technology within millions of US, uh, United States patents. 
Uh, this can also manifest in uh, policy research. So for example, uh, the USPTO in 2020 released a report on public views on AI and IP policy uh, to share you know, around 200 diverse viewpoints and comments on what would be appropriate IP policy for uh, AI technology. But ultimately, uh, keeping up with AI is something that just simply requires careful and continued investment from uh, you know, all IP offices. So investment in taxonomy maintenance to ensure that we're appropriately characterizing the contents of inventions concerning uh, AI inventions and, or sorry, investment in technology uh, to ensure that our examiners can locate the manifold forms of prior art that AI innovation has now engendered. And ultimately, investment in our staff and examiners, you know, at the end of the day, they're the experts making patentability determinations on inventions containing AI. And, and we want to make sure uh, that they have sound contextual knowledge and expertise to do so. Uh, the second uh, you know, perspective is AI as a tool for inventing or in the inventive process. Uh, while I won't comment on relevant matters in the United States, some of which are still uh, you know, currently pending before the appeals courts, um, let me just make two brief points here. One point number one is uh, you know, with respect to uh, differing outcomes uh, in certain matters in different jurisdictions, uh, you know, uh, different jurisdictions, uh, you know, despite, uh, you know, despite some in international efforts at harmonization, you know, different jurisdictions at the end of the day still have different substantive patent law. Um, so I wouldn't read too much into, you know, comparative differences in how different jurisdictions have ruled on certain matters as, you know, uh, an artifact of anything more than those differences in the patent laws of, you know, uh, around the world. Um, but point number two is, which may be more or less a reformulation of Kate's point, um, AI is most certainly a technology that can assist both in inventing and in patent prosecution. However, such technology falls on a spectrum. I think, um, as Kate was alluding to, this is often underappreciated. You know, there, there are two extremes. One extreme is, uh, you know, something that Kate highlighted, uh, you know, this idea of an autonomous, more or less autonomous AI inventor, you know, conceiving of the invention, uh, maybe even reducing it to practice, basically, you know, taking, really taking the steering wheel in the inventor process. Um, the other end of the spectrum is something like tabbed autocomplete in Microsoft Word. So new versions of Microsoft Word, or uh, for those who use Gmail, uh, your Compose window in Gmail. You know, you can you can press tab, and the and some AI model will you know fill in the next two or three words in the sentence. Right. This is AI technology. Um, it in some sense is assisting you know perhaps inventors, perhaps uh, patent prosecutors, uh, but I don't think anyone would really claim that such technology is anything more than assistive technology for humans who remain in the driver's seat. So if you want to contemplate an issue such as AI inventorship, I think you know, there, there are two questions. One is this question of line drawing. You know, uh, where do you draw the line between something that's more assistive and something that's more um, uh, you know, autonomous? And then after you draw that line, you know, the, the, the question arises of when or even if we'll cross you know, from one side of that line to the other in any given um, technical field. So the last perspective, and I'll be brief here, is AI for examining. Um, so bottom line here is IP offices care deeply about improving the efficiency of our operations and our standard of service. And there's broad recognition around the world or within the IP office community that AI can play a huge role in doing so. I'll just name a couple of areas. Um, classification, perhaps the use case most similar to a classical machine learning problem. Um, image and document understanding, integrity assurance, customer service, and probably the most aspirational use case, which is uh, pr patent prior art search. Um, so if you think about the evolution of prior art over the past few years, we're seeing an explosion in terms of both quantity and form. We have the standard stuff in terms of patents, published patent applications, scientific papers, of course, but then we also have things like white papers, preprints, technical blog posts, 
even source code repositories that can now serve as prior art, uh, you know, in our, uh, you know, in our time. So, um, you know, to the extent that AI can help us contend with this explosion in prior art, you know, I think all IP offices are super, super interested in leveraging this technology. Um, so that was, a, I think, a whirlwind tour, a necessarily brief tour of how IP offices view artificial intelligence. Um, but I'm sure we'll uh, get more in the, into the details as this discussion progresses. Thank you. We certainly will. And I, I've got a bunch of questions, but I'm going to hold off for the moment. Uh, among other things, that line drawing exercise, I, I think there are interesting questions, not just where you should draw the line, but why we're drawing the line. Maybe that's something we'll, we'll come back to. Uh, but let, let me move on, bringing in the other panelists. Turning now to uh, to Peter, can I ask you um, to uh, bring you in on the uh, the aspects of the European Union, uh, which is something you've thought deeply about. Now, the European Union um, has laid out a marker in various situations concerning artificial intelligence, building on its kind of Brussels effect impact on data protection. Um, could you talk a bit about what's happening with the EU's digital regulation and what it might mean for this, this question of AI and IP? Yeah, certainly, Simon, thanks for being here and, and for, for being able to speak about that. Um, what I would like to do for my initial statement is to, to climb with you a little bit down from the most lofty heights of, of true AI, if such things exist, and, and get to complex um, algorithms possibly approaching AI and employed today and even more tomorrow in real life economics by companies. You all know that such tools are being employed for various tasks, including customer data collection and processing, market surveillance, pricing, and so on. No worries, I'm not going uh, to get into the discussion on algorithmic collusion and such things. Um, instead, I wanted to point out the fact that the EU digital reg regulation, which is underway in, in the form of acts that are called DMA, DSA, DGA, and soon the Data Act and whatnot, um, also has a very important impact on algorithmic market activity because it does prohibit certain complex algo uses and thus promote others. Two very brief examples, um, the Digital Markets Act obliges so-called gatekeepers, there's very large digital market players, uh, to engage in data related activity, which they will only be able to perform uh, effectively, especially down the road, if employing complex self-learning neural networks, such as, for example, providing users with real-time access to their and only their individual transaction data as it is being generated. Also, the DSA foresees the establishment of so-called intermediaries, i.e. trustworthy companies that support and act in the interest of customers and users in digital markets, for instance, when it comes to dynamic consent or algo discrimination or such things. Um, now, if, if these intermediaries want to live up to the task, they will have to use uh, digital tool, tools just as complex uh, as those of the big digital players. Um, now, in the discourse, in this more specific discourse on AI and IP, we reflect on questions such as transparency of AI and ethical AI and data protection and standards and processes which can address these goals and concerns, also ownership of exclusivity rights covering, covering AI systems and their output, which, which is, I think, a focus for today's discussion. Now, this is, these, are, these are important points on a theoretical level, but I think it is thrilling to, to, to reflect and to, to become aware that here is an opportunity to actually put them into practice today. Um, I think that the setting of this upcoming digital regulation has certain characteristics that may suit, suit such an enterprise well. For example, we're in a complex, fast developing tech area, but maybe not the most outlandish, uh, outlandish one. Um, what we do has practice impact right now, not in a more or less distant future. There is close regulatory oversight that permits for responsible trial and error. Um, and also we can generate, or at least I hope we could generate an intense stakeholder um, involvement, which is very important for the quality of, of the technical uh, development in, in this process. Now, what should we do um, to, what should we do with the setting? 
um, no details here. I don't have the time we want to discuss instead, um, but I think we should much intensify um, the, the plans for an intense ex ante sandbox testing phase for such uh, systems. We should focus much more research and uh, academic discussion on, on this field. Um, we should implement, the regulators should implement strong and immediate transparency measures, including um, public discourse or publication of the systems codes on platforms and in scientific discourse. Um, we should include te technical experts in the regulatory dialogue that is foreseen between the agencies and the gatekeepers. We should now designate flagship intermediaries um, going through the initial process and then becoming role models and such things. And also one last point maybe uh, as to IP ownership, um, we should ensure that there, are, that there is access to appropriate systems for example, uh, for intermediaries, intermediaries through appropriate licenses. And there I touch also upon the front licensing context, context. Um, Also, there is the AI Act, the EU AI Act, another important piece of regulation coming up, as you all know. And we must ensure, I'm not going to go into details here, but we must ensure that the AI Act uh, uh, syncs very well with the digital regulation. I think that's true not only for the EU, but for other jurisdictions as well. So this is um, the a bit small, bit more hands-on aspect I wanted to point out and uh, happy to explore this with you further through the discussion. Thank you so much, Peter. And I think I think this is really helpful in drilling down into that sort of AI, that the use cases of AI and um, some of the questions about regulation, which um, obviously the EU is, uh, one could say more enthusiastic perhaps about regulation than some other jurisdictions and we might come back in the q a into into why that is the case but i want to go back to this sort of higher level of um, um sort of diff the way different jurisdictions approach ai so jerry in his comments pointed out that there's um a kind of regulatory arbitrage almost available to inventors and that's kind of what was happening with davos if only there was some international organization tasked with looking at this from the global level and uh, possibly encouraging harmonization. Um, Ulrike, from the World Intellectual Property Organization's perspective, can I, can I bring you in on, uh, on this question and, and how these matters are thought of within the context of WIPO, where um, you have this sort of global regime, uh, but a patchwork of regulate, regulatory approaches and um, uh, unevenly distributed capacity uh, in terms of uh, access to technology and impact on the direction which technology is going. Ulrike, please. Thank you, Simon. That is so many really good questions all in one. <laughs> um, I will start um, and we can get into some more in the detail, but I will actually start by the global perspective, um, if I may, because I know we're focusing on AI today, but Peter in some ways talking about digital um, has already alluded to the fact that AI um, certainly isn't the only change that we're seeing that, that we need to address. Um, uh, and uh, what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about the overall perspective um, of the change that we're facing. Um, uh, and um, AI um, is one of the what I call frontier technologies um, that is bubbling up that we're seeing at the forefront publicity we're all talking about. Um, but there's a whole raft of these technologies. And when I talk about frontier technologies, um, I really talk about um, the technologies that operate at the intersection of scientific breakthrough and real practical implementation. Um, so there are things like robotics, the Internet of Things, cloud computing, 5G, um, the brain uh, computer interface, neuroscience. Um, and AI uh, gets, gets a lot of press and AI is certainly, certainly the largest of those technologies currently in terms of the number of granted patents and patent applications. The WIPO Technology Trend Report 2019 that makes for fascinating reading because it really shows AI moving from scientific publications into patents and patent applications. So you can see how AI is moving, moving to market. Um, but certainly in terms of market size, currently the Internet of Things is significantly larger. Robotics is significantly larger. Um, and again, to give you a global perspective, not just AI, but all of these new frontier technologies the change in how we innovate, how we create, how our life is changing, how we live our lives. 
whether you call it Industry 4.0 or um, uh, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, I think I've heard Society 5.0 term, a term from Japan. Um, the economic impact um, of that is huge. Um, there's been, an, I think it was an UNCTAD report um, earlier this summer that puts the current market um, value of frontier technologies at 350 billion US dollars with a potential to grow to 3.2 trillion by 2025, not so very long from now. So that, that maybe gives you the global perspective um, of the potential upside for innovation and creation um, and economic growth. Now, why do these technologies matter for WIPO and what, what do we do about it? And in some ways, um, I, I think it mirrors a little bit what, what Jerry was saying. I think there's two strands to it um, in very many ways. The first one is how can these technologies help us make IP administration and registration easier, faster, more accessible, um, really with an aim, and that goes to the global question of making sure that IP um, works for everyone anywhere in the world. Um, and the second one is the other things that we've heard about for, from Kate and, and from Jerry as well, um, about how does AI and how these technologies fit into the current IP system to make sure that the current IP system continues to do what it's supposed to foster innovation and creation. Um, and here, the biggest engagement that WIPO has um, is um, what we call the WIPO conversation. Um, uh, I am privileged um, to, uh, to, to look after the team um, that looks after that um, that part of WIPO. Um, and for me, it's very exciting because it's um, it's a very new um, and novel format. Um, it's a format that recognizes there are so many different stakeholders. It's a format that recognizes um, that there's um, technical elements, there's uh, law elements, there's IP elements. Um, and it's not a standing committee or similar format. It's a format that um, is in open exclusive. It's open to everyone. Um, and um, I probably finish by saying the, the enthusiasm that we see um, in helping us all understand what the questions are, because I think understanding the questions is so key in finding the answers, is um, last year we've had more than 2,000 people from 130 countries dialing in and being part of the conversation. So it gives you a real sense of um, the enthusiasm, but also the complexity of the questions. And I think um, we are all better having these discussions um, because it will help us define the questions and then hopefully at some point help us define some of the answers. Great. Thank you very much, Ulrike. And so I'll, I'll come back to you on this question of how you can foster innovation, how you can ensure greater accessibility around the world to some of the benefits of AI and of IP more generally. Uh, while perhaps mitigating some of the risks and not unduly constraining innovation if there's inadequate protection. Um, but sort of moving down onto the, uh, where the rubber hits the road, if you like, um, Fang Yi, you've um, recently moved, I think you can tell us uh, why, I'm kind of curious, you've moved from a global law firm to a, a mixed reality startup. Um, and so IP presumably is vital uh, to your company uh, can you talk a bit about how these issues affect firms like yours uh, and how that sort of shapes the way in which you think about IP and, uh, and IP protection more generally? Well, first of all, uh, it's such a great pleasure to be uh, among such an interesting panel. Um, uh, I am uh, Yifang. I recently moved from a uh, law firm practice to uh, join a mixed reality uh, startup called Enreal. And it is uh, really exciting for me uh, uh, per personally and professionally at this time because um, uh, just now we talked about uh, we are at the frontier of technology re revolution um, in, uh, in history. If you look at uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, we are talking about smartphones. And now we're talking about mixed reality and how AI um, is uh, changing the world uh, with, uh, uh, of course, the help of 5G, uh, making it all possible. And um, I think moving from a law firm to uh, a, uh, a technology firm that is really at the very top uh, of uh, this very exciting uh, change in um, in the way we interact um, 
uh, with with the pandemic and and we all can feel how um, virtual reality and and how uh, people can um, really change the way uh, that we interact and work together and not only in our personal life but also industrial um, settings and mixed reality is really making all that possible uh, which uh, we uh, didn't think was possible before so for um, not our, not only our company, but uh, the industry as a whole, uh, we often talk about the building of a mixed reality community because it's really a new uh, thing that we uh, couldn't imagine before. And for me, it's really exciting to see our teams of um, innovators uh, being very proud of what they do. And, and as a legal professional, I, I think we are we are also very proud to be uh, able to support them with um, uh, with our professional um, service. And um, I think the first thing that uh, strikes me um, as uh, a somewhat a, a very significant um, issue is the vast and significant amount of information and data that's involved in AI and and um, in machine learning and and in general uh, that's involved in the mis mixed reality industry and we are collecting and and depend on we're depending on the data that we collect and um with the interactive um uh, user um interface that um we we are using data in a way that was not used by uh, past technologies before and I think this is a brand new um, issue that we are facing. Uh, that sometimes I, I, I feel that we are stepping ahead, oftentimes um, ahead of regulators and, 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 and the laws that we are creating new facts for uh, regulars to, to uh, everybody um, is the same, where we're all learning how, uh, what, what kind of uh, creative, uh, things that we are we're making to uh, to change people's lives so i i think this this is a very interesting question that how uh regulations and, and laws of different countries see the coming um the becoming of a new age in technology and we're we're looking at things that uh we're we've never dealt with before such as um with machine learning and ai uh, we are um using our devices um, to look at our real real life surroundings and analyzing them and, and transmitting them back to a cloud and then um, uh, using internet uh, artificial intelligence to uh, have a virtual in interaction. So uh, it's, it's a really exciting time, but, but also challenging time, I think, for regulators and also for companies um, in, in our uh, efforts to, uh, to in our uh, compliance uh, programs. Um, and also the second thing that, um, that strikes me as um, a, a really important part of my, um, uh, my uh, work is that the global view um, that uh, Eureka just uh, talked about and, and agree that these um, new issues are all global. We cannot look at only the laws and regulations of one country. Uh, yesterday, uh, I attended the first uh, the morning sessions and we talked about the, the important jurisdictions for patents right now. Uh, remains uh, the US and the Ch and China and maybe Germany, France, and some of the other important countries. I think for data pri data and and privacy, these uh, this is also true. And and for for the industry, you cannot just rely on the advice of um, attorneys from just one country because you you your product and the technology is global. And there are a lot of uh, cross-border, multi-jurisdictional issues that you have to deal with um, before you enter market and before you um, present your products to con consumers. And I think for uh, innovators right now in the industry, it's also our social responsibility to not only build a technology community, but also a community for um, our users. I think that's... Um, my um, brief 
points of interest for uh, everybody. Uh, maybe we can okay. discuss in depth later. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, E. And, and I'll note that we're a little over half an hour into a panel discussion on artificial intelligence. We've talked about mixed reality. No one has used the word metaverse yet, which is excellent. Because uh, every time you use that word, Mark Zuckerberg gets a dollar. So I'm not going to use it again. Um, but um, uh, we've got one more speaker I'm going to bring in, but I'll just flag for the audience. I've got lots of questions, um, but I know the email addresses of all these panelists. So I can bug them anytime. Um, audience, your chances to ask your chance to ask questions is coming up very soon. Please do type them into the Q&A function. Um, but uh, let me turn now to uh, Tibalt. Um, so Tibalt, often we do focus on AI and, and some of the discussion thus far has really focused AI and technology is something to be regulated. Um, it's partly come up in the question in that um, I think Jerry, among others, talked about the way it can be a kind of useful technology. Uh, and Ulrika at, the, at WIPO mentioned there's been some discussion of this. Uh, but you've been working for some years on how artificial intelligence tools might help with regulation itself. Um, can you give us a sense of, of where you think we are and how that might actually work in practice? <clears throat> sure. Um... First of all, I'm very happy for the invitation. So Daryl, if you are in the room, thank you very much for inviting me to the metaverse. No, joke apart. <laughs> um, it's good to be with you and to be able to share all of that expertise in, in, a, in, a, in a space which is evolving so rapidly. Um, I find it to be fascinating. And so what I've tried to do, because of course you can't indeed cover the entire space, uh, even you know when it comes to IP and AI or competition and AI or data privacy and AI, it's it's so broad that my angle, uh, and this is something that I started uh, more than a year ago now, was to try to see if in the literature or if within competition agencies, but you could pretty much transpose that to, you know, patent uh, offices and data protection agencies, if AI could actually u uh, be be used by by those agencies uh, to achieve different. Uh, things. The first, I think, would be to monitor when it comes, for instance, to competition law or, you know, IP infringements to, to monitor that in a way which is a bit uh, more precise. It could be also for drafting legislation or it could be for enforcement purposes. And so that that is indeed the, the focus of um, some of my work in the space. Um, and of course, when talking about AI, you have to talk about data. And so here I want to make it clear that should you be a governmental agency, there are two different ways you could approach the subject. You could first start with the data which is out there, meaning the data on the market. So you could try to detect what companies or you know economic agents are, are doing. Um, and so here I've been trying to see how we could use web scraping or to develop API uh, or to use, uh, to use NLP, for instance, to, to try to detect um, potential infringements, for instance. So, uh, we, we, I mean, we know now from empirical work that what you can do is to use the 10 Ks of companies, uh, which is of course a financial statement in nature, but to try to understand what is the market dynamic, what's happening, and if there are some potential infringements. So that is the first way. But what you can also do is to start with a company which is inside the agency. And that is something that most agencies could do, and definitely the ones in the US because they do have enough data. And here, what you could do is that you could, you know, talking about something which is quite simple, I mean, at least simple to set up, which is to set up a supervised machine learning system. What you could do there is to take your own case law or your own, you know, decision when you have uh, uh, conflicts regarding patent or trademark and label those decisions and then try to train a machine learning to try to detect patterns. And so we've been publishing within the computational uh, antitrust project some work on the subject. Um, and what they've done is that they've have labeled the FTC decisions in the US regarding the pharma sector. And they ended up finding that most of the times when companies engage in one type of practice, they also engage in another type of practice which was never seen by the FTC and, and something which, you know, couldn't appear if you were just to look at it with our human brain. So this is kind of the first thing that you could do, which is to better understand what's happening. Um, there, is a, there is something which is very much computational related, but I hope you will see how it relates to IP, which is, 
killer acquisitions, which is also one of those buzzwords that you have to pronounce. <laughs> so I guess I can uh, check the box now. But the idea is that some of the big tech companies will be acquiring startups, not for the purpose of you know acquiring the tech, but to make sure to prevent competition on the market. Uh, and most of the time, what they do is that they acquire the IP rights. Um, and there again, I think that if you were to use AI, you could actually detect potential killer acquisitions in a way which is a bit more precise than just looking at the turnover of the companies. So we've also published a paper by MIT scholars in which they studied the, the fitness of a company, which is the link between the company's growth and the connections that this company has with all the companies and all the tech. And they showed that there is a strong correlation between the two. So potentially, you know, something to, to take into account. And the final item is when it comes to understanding better what you've been doing as an agency. Uh, it could be understanding your enforcement better. It could be an understanding how to draft policy and legislation better. Uh, same applies, by the way, to, to uh, courts. Um, and so here, we've been publishing some work, and this is something in which I have uh, a big interest. Uh, regarding the use of uh, agent-based modeling, the idea being to create a computer simulation to see how agents behave according to changes in the environment. Uh, so, you know, should you say that patent protection is not 20 years now, but 17, what could be the effect of that? And this is the kind of thing that you could, you could simulate. Uh, but it, it could also be that you want to analyze legislations and let's say contribution um, when the governmental agencies ask for contribution regarding drafts and, and you know, new potential legislation to see if agents understand the term in a similar way. And what we found out is that they actually don't. So for instance, the terms dominance or gatekeeper, which uh, Peter mentioned, uh, and monopoly and all that is understood in a totally different way with totally different feeling behind it, which I think could also be interesting when it comes to drafting legislation to try, if possible, for instance, to avoid those terms. So um, the idea in the end, you know, to paraphrase a, a great music band is to fight fire with fire. And so knowing that we are facing, you know, increasingly complex and rapid um, AI system out there, it could be an idea for agencies. And also, by the way, for companies to improve compliance capacity to, to use the same. So this is a bit of the, the overview. Um, and again, it ties with, you know, what has been discussed so far, which is a potential infringement. And of course, the potential of the tech, which could be explored in a different way, I guess. All right, thank you very much. I'm, I'm tempted to pursue the finding fire with fire metaphor but and the band reference but but won't for the moment maybe that's something for the uh, the cocktail hour that comes uh, depending on your time zone uh, after the session um so as i as i said um, we've kept our speakers brief to leave time for discussion um any of you out there who've ever organized a conference the way in which you ensure that six panelists keep the time is you have a hard line forbidding them from using any slides uh, and you ask them to be brief um what i'd like to do now is i've got um, I'm, I'm going to ask sort of questions in four themes, bringing in our speakers, uh, and then I'll, I will bring in Q&A from the floor, but that requires the floor to actually put in their, put in their cues. Um, but the four themes I'd like to pick out from, from what our panelists have, have outlined thus far are firstly, the line between human and non-human innovation. Uh, secondly, the work of patent agencies in practice. Thirdly, the impact of regulation on innovation more generally. Uh, and then fourthly, the question that underpins a lot of AI on data uh, and how we think about data. Uh, and um, Kate, can I, can I start by going back to you? Because you, you did talk about how um, the role of artificial intelligence in innovation is new only in that it's technology. It's not a new legal phenomenon. We've often had issues of inventions that can't be attributed to a human actor. Uh, indeed, it goes through the history of copyright law back through that, that photograph of Oscar Wilde that made it all the way to the US Supreme Court when people said, there's no artistry in taking a photograph, all you're doing is pushing a button. Uh, whereas now we wouldn't think of it that way. Can I ask you a slight variation on what you, what, why do we need to draw the line at all? Um, I mean, why, why is that line important? and how might the way we think about that line between human and non-human um, intervention uh, be shifting? Well, so there's a lot of different models that we could consider. So there's the current model that you as 
else in Europe and, and Britain has, has indicated applies where we need to have only human inventors. Um, there's the model that's proposed by the Davis team where you can list AI. Um, it's, there seems to be a third option suggested by a court um, in the UK where they said you could have deemed inventorship. So you could list a human like on behalf of the AI or a fourth model is we could do away with inventorship requirements, right? Copyright. Once you see a movie, you don't see all of the authors, you know, on the copyright itself. It's in the credits, but not in the copyright. Um, so the, I find that the last option to be pretty interesting. Uh, there's already a ton of transactional costs in order to um, make sure all of the paperwork is, is complied with. And the, at the end of the day, usually you have employment contracts that are in place anyway, where the applicant, right, the employer, um, that's the entity that's controlling what's happening with patents. So I think, I think that even though there's different roles in terms of the way in which an AI can contribute to the invention, um, it, it's more interesting to think about what the different models would be and the different setups. Now, one argument that I've heard with regard to why we might not want to go towards one of these alternative systems right now is because we haven't thought about it before. And so there's a lot of questions about like, what does it mean? You know, how, how are we going to be tracking the ownership? How are we going to be putting people on notice for different types of um, information? What's gonna happen in the litigation? And so one argument that I've heard is like, this is a potentially a fine system to do any of these things, to do away with inventorship, to list AI as an inventor, to have deemed inventorship, but the courts aren't the place for it. And so we should step back and make sure that we have a very coherent system in place where we've thought through the different complexities and then we can propose that. Okay, thanks. And so Anonymous uh, from the floor has, has added a question on this um, in this area, asking whether we really need to rethink authorship. Wouldn't uh, working through corporations, as we have for a long time, deal with the issue of incentivizing AI? Uh, and the short answer to that is yes, it would. But implicit in that question is, is this issue that I'll, I'll turn Jerry to you if I can, because you also talked about drawing the line without asking you to comment on any current cases. Why is it important, asking a very naive question, why is it important to reward human innovators and why is it not important to reward AI innovators? Um, and I appreciate that the legislation is what it is, but taking a step back to the policy, the idea as it's sometimes presented, I think a couple of you mentioned this, is we want to incentivize humans to innovate. And one argument that's sometimes presented is that you don't need to incentivize AI systems, all they need to incentivize them is electricity, a computer program. Uh, so, so do you think that line will be changing, Jerry, anytime in the near future? And should it, I suppose? Okay, and you win the prize for the first, you should win a prize for being the first person to not unmute themselves. There you go. Amazing, perfect. I, um, I will probably wear that prize. Um, as to the first question, uh, you know, will that line be changing in the near future? I think I, you know, along the same lines as Kate, you know, we're, we're uh, at the USPTO, we're not in the business of, um, uh, you know, creative interpretations of law, you know, the, the law really needs to uh, change before we make any of these, um, you know, redeterminations of the concepts of, uh, I guess, in our case, inventorship. Um, you know, and that's, that would at minimum be a process, you know, subject to a lot of careful contemplation, uh, by, uh, Congress, um, you know, probably in consultation with, uh, experts in this area. I think, you know, in terms of the question of should that line change in the near future, there's, so th there's something to be said about incentivization along many different axes, right? So. So it's true that an AI, for the operation of an AI system, all you need to really work it is to turn it on, to give it sufficient electricity, to give it sufficient computing horsepower, and let it do its thing, right? But how does, the second order question is, how does that AI 
come into existence in the first place, right? There's some, and these days, often very high initial investment, sort of fixed R&D costs into bringing any of these AI systems into existence. This transcends, you know, the IP space. You know, if, if we look at um, areas such as, uh, you know, computational biology or natural language processing, or even playing board games, the amount of dollar, uh, the, the you know, monetary investment it takes to build a high quality state of the art AI system is, uh, you know, safe to say often in the eight or nine figures, um, particularly for uh, larger models. So um, the, there's this question of, you know, how do we, should we, and how do we incentivize the creation of these potentially transformative systems? And uh, you know that I think goes it goes uh, in very large part to uh, the question of you know should we rethink authorship or inventorship? Should there be uh, some sorts of incentivization for uh, not only you know the human inventors on a patent, but you know. Uh, the progenitors of any AI system or model that contributes to conception of an invention. Um, so I don't have the answers, uh, you know, either personally speaking or uh, on behalf of the USPTO. Um, ultimately, you know, resolving these questions is going to require you know, careful discussion, careful contemplation, and ultimately, uh, most likely, legislative change. Thanks, Jay. As, as you were speaking, I was I was reminded of the enormous amount of power that is currently being wasted mining for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, and I do wonder if if we did start rewarding AI innovators generally, whether there there'd be a new sort of phenomenon of uh, patent trolls. Uh, if you had enormous amounts of energy going into coming up with every conceivable invention, the kind of monkeys at the keyboard question. But Jerry, let me stick with you just for a, a quick follow up. Um, building on what um, Tibalt was saying about the possible use of AI in analytics, in the regulatory space, uh, not asking you to talk about policy at the federal, but not government policy, but within organizations like the USPTO, do you think if we're having this conversation 20, 30 years from now, there will be far fewer people working in an organization like yours and more AI systems doing at least some of the analysis? Sure thing. So the short answer is almost certainly not. Um, at the USPTO, we view, you know, we view the role of algorithms in adjudication as auxiliary rather than primary. So, uh, you know, in all of our investments in AI you know, technology to date, our fundamental philosophy has been to empower the human experts to do their jobs more effectively uh, whether that means efficiency, quality, or you know any other metric that we care about. So, um, you know, in in terms of you know even our current efforts, uh, you know, around prior art search, around classifying patents, these are very much aimed toward empowering our you know expert examiners uh, to be able to you know in the case of classification uh, by you know by um, generating more accurate patent classification be able to examine the things that are most relevant to their background and expertise. And in the case of prior art search, uh, to be able to retrieve the most relevant prior art documents for any given application uh, in a faster and more accurate manner. Um, so, you know, even down the road, once we get more powerful AI technologies that can potentially, um, you know, do more in the realm of document understanding, we fundamentally don't see this technology sitting in the driver's seat in any adjudicatory decision. Um, so, so it's, you know, it's really less about algorithmic adjudication as much as algorithms in adjudication. And as far as we apply algorithms in adjudication, it is very much as a tool for the adjudicator. Um, and there, I, there's, you know, divided schools of thought on, you know, this overall subject as far as, you know, will we realize something um, that, you know, in popular conception is called artificial general intelligence that eventually will, you know, rise to the level of 
you know, a human and, you know, general purpose uh, tasks and decision making that a human would otherwise do. My personal take on this is we are very, very far away from anything remotely resembling artificial general intelligence. But regardless of whether that's the case, you know, there, there are the, all these secondary considerations uh, regarding, you know, societal acceptance of AI as an adjudicator in and of itself that we need to be very, very careful, you know, about perturbing, uh, you know, before we go down the rabbit hole of um, throwing AIs in any, uh, you know, governmental decision-making process. So, you know, backing away from the IP space a bit, uh, you know, just take uh, social security in the United States, right? Social security disability insur uh, uh, insurance, you know. Um, do you really want an AI model to be telling you that your disability claim is denied, right? Will an AI model be able to create an explainable decision? No, right now the answer is very much no. I think, you know, even a couple of decades now, the answer is very much no, but, you know, even if the technology gets there, there's still the societal question of, you know, what do we want to do with such technology? Yeah, so I mean, we're, that that moves on to different panel discussions and the phenomenon of robo debt in Australia, the admission scandal in the UK, might point to some of some of the dangers that you're highlighting. Um, but just maybe to to pick up one thing you said, Jerry. Um, so to all of the uh, the USPTO employees listening in, Jerry says your jobs are safe. T Bolt, why is he wrong? I think he's right. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, that's some of my students are actually concerned by the very same. And they say, do we have, you know, a potential job waiting for us? And I keep on saying yes, but probably not if you are a dinosaur. And I think for me, the dinosaurs would be the lawyers and, you know, governmental agents not working with tech. Um, and I can't see how if you do not understand tech at all, even what is the you know computational thinking you could actually be better in 10 years than a lawyer who does and so uh but for the rest i very much agree and, and there is also a question of trust that I'm, I'm very curious to see how this will evolve i'm pretty sure if you are to ask people right now if they are willing to board on the plane with a ai system you know as a pilot most people would say that they would prefer to have a you know human being i think this might change uh, so there is this issue of trust. Do we trust AI, you know, for for making decisions? I think this will eventually evolve. But of course, there is the incentive that we won't, in any case, give you know that power to AI system. And the way I see it, but again, this is just prediction, is that AI will actually assist and augment what we can do. Um, this might be a different story in 300 years, though. You know, with quantum computing and AI, we see already that AI is creating AI. And so that is fascinating, and it might be that they may achieve better results than we can, and then we're going to have a, a conflicted situation. But so far, I'm not aware of any scholar uh, working uh, on developing AI-centric AI. All we hear about is human-centric AI, right? So I think we are we are safe, at least for quite some years. So I very much agree with uh, with Jerry, as a matter of fact. Okay, well, I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to point out that I'll, I'll just touch on this very briefly in chess. There was a period when, um, after Gary Kasparov got beaten, um, there was Centaur chess, where human and AI would be much more effective than any AI. But the latest yeah. chess systems, it's all computers all the time now. Okay, let yeah. me move on to um, uh, the third area that I wanted to touch on, the relationship between regulation and innovation. Um, and, and here I wanted to go back to, to both Peter and Ulrike. Uh, Peter, you talked about the... Um, uh, regulation within the European Union. Uh, there's a whole string of regulations coming out, um, in, including the AI Act, which you mentioned. Um, and I suppose uh, I'm curious whether you think, whether you have any time for the argument that's put forward candidly in small jurisdictions like mine, Singapore, where there is a wariness that if you regulate too heavily uh, or too early, um, all you will succeed is in regulation elsewhere. So one, I suppose, in Europe, is that a concern? And if it's a concern, is it regarded as a price worth paying uh, in order to preserve certain fundamental rights, for example? Um, so Peter, if I can get you to give your take on that, and then Ulrike, at the sort of global level, how 
um, WIPO, I mean, WIPO doesn't dictate to its members, but how, how the thinking is there in terms of trying to encourage the appropriate level of regulation across these different jurisdictions. But Peter first. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, Simon, for the, for the question. I think it's most interesting. I think you, you already um, laid out one of the core trade-offs perfectly well. I mean, the, so, so um, larger jurisdictions may feel more comfortable with regulation because they probably have, they are more insular in their self-perception, I would say. Um, and if that combines with the, I would say overall more cautious and more more uh, regulation happy um, context of the EU as opposed to, for example, the US. And then we have a facing new technologies and and maybe also technologies driven by companies that are sometimes perceived as, as very powerful and dangerous and maybe also technologies that, that one feels, even though this is not entirely true, that the technology evolves not so much out of Europe, but, but in other areas of the world and is then kind of sold to Europe or, or you know, um, propped up, <laughs> uh, propped onto European settings, then all, the, all of this makes um, for a pretty, regulation happy context and i think this is what we are seeing at present in the eu um now so i would say so so far we have a little bit of situation that much of that the talk about remaining attractive on a global level and not driving out innovation um is is politicians lip service um while administrations tend to engage in relatively heavy regulation. And I think that the EU needs to move a little bit, a bit more cautiously here. For example, you mentioned the AI Act. Um, the lists of, or the, the very extensive lists um, of, of very dangerous, dangerous, fairly dangerous and whatnot AI technologies in the annexes to that AI Act. Um, they are certainly, you know, on the restrictive side. And I think we should, as, as we talk about whether the AI Act should be changed before implementing it, I think this is an area where we should get it. Um, overall, you know, I think regulating AI is now at a relatively early stage in any case. And I don't think that, but I'd be interesting to hear your views on that. I think that we are here not at a stage where we can engage in the sort of regulation that we now see with regard to, I don't know, washing machines or cars or so. So hard and fast rules and, and, and technical standards, I think they're not applicable right now. Everything moves too fast. We do not know where the technology is going to be in maybe even two or three years. So I think um, the EU has to work hard on a I don't know, maybe one could say like of accompanying regulation, um, principles based regulation, where you try to attentively follow trends and follow developments together with technical experts and legal experts and so on, instead of, you know, trying to dictate now what we should do and not do. This is a very um, complex task. And I, I, I don't think that the AI Act and also the AI Act in combination with the digital regulation does presently an optimal job in, in, in that respect. But if the EU would manage to somehow address this task appropriately, this new form of regulation of fast moving technologies, then I think the EU could set you know, sort of, of, of global standards, at least in the legal framework, um, if we can't do that technologically, then maybe at least we come up with, with some ideas for good regulation. So, uh, according to Jerry and Tippold, all the lawyers are going to be replaced by AI systems before the patent examiners. But um, on the timing question, um, you, you remind me of something I'm sure many people listening to this have heard of, but I'll explain it very briefly, the Collingridge Dilemma, which is uh, references a book written in 1980 by David Collingridge uh, on the social control of technology that at an early stage of innovation it's relatively easy to regulate the costs are low but you don't know what you're trying to stop you don't know what the harms are and that's as peter said that's kind of where we are with ai the danger is that if you wait too long um, 
there's a whole series of things that happens and the cost of regulation becomes way up. You, you know what the harms are, but it's much more expensive and difficult to regulate them. And so you can apply this, for example, maybe to social media that back in 2004, when Facebook was, was first launched, uh, we probably could have regulated it in 2000 to 2021 and Meta and so on. Uh, it's much more harder to put that sort of genie back in the bottle or the toothpaste back in the tube. Ulrika, can I, can I get your take on sort of this, this issue of how countries around the world, which have their own sort of interests, um, should think about this question of where to regulate, how heavily, how lightly to regulate in order to encourage innovation, discourage abuse, uh, but, uh, but not allow other harms in the process? Gosh, it's one of those questions. Uh, if uh, I wish um, all of us had the answer to that question, uh, because I mean, the conundrum you talked about is the conundrum that we see in every single WIFO conversation um, and all of the discussion that we're having. I mean, uh, there's clearly two very, um, of, not opposing, but the two extremes of, of sorts, as you said on, on the Facebook example, um, basically saying, everything's happening so fast, we need to regulate now, otherwise we're going to be left behind and then, then what we're going to do versus the other end, it's moving so fast, how can we possibly regulate when we don't know what, what, what the result of all of that is? Um, and certainly uh, that rate, rate of change in technology and therefore the, um, the rate with that gap widening between what's happening is getting bigger in some ways um, and um, I, I give you I give you an example that I find absolutely fascinating and that what, what drives all of this all of these frontier technologies and AI um, is data and I think the last topic we'll come to is, is data and it's when you realize that um, I think 90% of the world's current data was um, created in the last two years and we currently have um, 2,500 petabyte of data created every single day. To put that into perspective, I mean, I find a petabyte incredibly difficult to, to think about, but one petabyte is the equivalent of the entire digital collection of the British Library in London. And we create 2,500 of those every single day in data. It gives you an idea of the, the fuel, data being the fuel that is driving AI, that is driving um, all of these frontier technologies. Um, so, I mean, that, that gap is widening. I think as, as WIPO, and one of the things we very much try to do is um, when you try and foster innovation, uh, um, one of the, the additional conundrums that we're seeing is we have a very specific set um, of technology yeah, that is getting more and more complex and harder to understand. Um, so uh, when you say AI, it's not just a computer program, how many people understand what a neural network is and um, where we might be on the narrow AI to general AI. Um, Advanced AI, AI is something um, that is predicted, not generally AI, but advanced AI, but might not need data as much anymore to come within within the next um, within the next ten years. Um, so I, I think uh, fundamentally it's key to have a basic understanding of those technologies um, because um, that will drive um, what we might want to do with it and what we might like, regulate with it. But that is harder to do. And on top of that, for us um, in the IP field, IP is, is a fairly specialized subject and the application of IP to these technologies is, is getting more intricate and the questions are getting more, more complicated. So I, I think um, taking a step back of what does that mean for regulation, I think it's going to be absolutely key despite this rate of change and the rate of complexity that we're seeing um, to be able to make it understandable to as many people as possible, because that will be the foundation um, to, make, to make the choices on, on regulation. Um, so WIPO at the moment is very much focusing on fostering that understanding, um, making sure our stakeholders are involved and stakeholders understand what the issues are same time, we're also trying to collect together, um, for example, on AI strategies, AI strategies, with national AI strategies, um, do they have an IP element? What does it say? We're trying to provide as many um, details and resources to stakeholders, um, because at the end of the day, regulation will have to circumstances. Um, but our role at the moment is very much a convener of these discussions to help us um, like go with the widening of the information so we keep up with the information and provide the resources to make the appropriate choices. 
Thank you. And, and your, your reference to data and the amount of data reminds me, I'm not, I'm not sure these figures are exactly correct, but we've been taking photographs, humans have been taking photographs for about almost two centuries, uh, but something like half of all the photographs ever taken in human history were taken last year. Uh, and that, that uh, yes. the statistic that keeps going. And that brings me nicely to E. Um, I wanted to pick up on your, your discussion of data. Um, because often in this kind of quote unquote fourth industrial revolution, um, data is sometimes referred to as the new oil, which is a, a nice kind of metaphor. It suggests sort of innovation, energy, empowerment, except that it's completely wrong in almost every way. Because oil is finite, you have to pay to extract it, you can only use it once. Whereas data is essentially unlimited. People give it to you for free and you can use it over and over again. So since you, you talk about the importance of data um, to your uh, businesses like yours, um, but you're also, you've got a background as a lawyer, how do you think about data? What is data for these purposes? It's kind of extraordinary that it's so important to the modern information economy, but there's not even an, an agreement about what data is. Is it a property right? Is it an intangible asset? Is it sort of, at least in the context of personal data linked with, with personal rights? How, how do you think of data and how does that affect the way in which you can monetize it in a company like yours? I think it's important to first to understand that um, data is an asset, not in the sense that um, it makes profit for a company like ours or in, in the sense any uh, company um, in, in, in our community is that it, it it's to us, it's more like a tool that makes um, our service available to the the, um, the the generators of the data, which is the environment in which uh, the products are actually used. Um, so in collecting the data, um, we have the problem of moving um, information from one country to a server in a different country, which is, uh, why we uh, we uh, in this uh, mixed reality uh, industry is uh, uh, we are all very careful in selecting our vendors, and um, we're really really careful with um, compliance uh, with the different uh, jurisdictions in which our products are provided. Um, so I, I I think it's there's a lot of detailed uh, work in the, di uh, the, di the different new products where we are uh, uh, contemplating to, to offer um, so that data is not going to be uh, uh, used in a way that is harmful to the users, not only uh, personal data, but data that uh, users not even realizing that they are uh, generating, uh, for example, um, the images and spatial information in their environment, uh, especially when, when we are accessing cameras in uh, of the user's computers and, and smartphones, um, the user may not realize that they are um, transmitting information that may be infringing on a third party's um, rights. For example, uh, their work environment, their uh, uh, spatial information within their, their house within a certain um, uh, a building of uh, of a different party, so um, it's really important for uh, industries such as mixed reality and as well as um, other companies that will need to access uh, information of this type to to really be careful of how that is transmitted, stored, and protected within uh, within their server, and also to be transparent with their users. Um, of how uh, the data is used. So I, I think the concept is not new to, um, to regulators, but I think with the technology moving on, I, 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 I am constantly surprised as how um, our uh, creative team come up with ideas that, that are unthinkable as before. And I, and I think the regulations always come behind the innovations. So um, I think it's, it's important at, as just, uh, I, I think it was Peter who uh, said that, um, uh, I think we should really focus on 
how the data affects the person. And from that point of view, to design a framework that will help um, protect the industry instead of focusing on the details of the specific technology, which is constantly changing. And if you, you're trying to catch uh, will catch up with the, the constantly changing technologies, the black letter law is, is never going to be fast enough with, with, the, with the changing of, uh, of te technologies and how uh, it's uh, the, with the pace, revolutionary pace that things are moving right now. So um, that's yeah. my experience. Yeah. Thank you. And, and certainly in Singapore, we have a Personal Data Protection Act, which was adopted a decade ago. And one way in which they tried to address this is by using reasonable 43 times so that it was meant to evolve over time and having posted a bit of fun at Facebook just now I pr should probably disclose that my law school is doing some work with them on incidentally collected personal data for example if someone's wearing those glasses uh, walking around collecting that data um, so we have Q&A um, unfortunately something happened with the um, the questions that oh now one has miraculously reappeared I was going to try and remember there are two questions I remember seeing uh, which I'll now ask. The first is on the US Constitution. And Jerry, I'll start with you on this. Um, you, were, you were quite um, deferential saying that it's not up to you to um, reinterpret the law, to change the law. But if the law was going to change, um, the questioner asks, sorry, it's David Brezina asks, uh, that since the US Constitution only authorizes Congress to grant rights to authors and inventors, um, and that this even work for hire is granted to a person. Um, could is it even possible legally in the United States without a constitutional amendment for an AI system to be recognised as an inventor? So, um, so first of all, very interesting question. Um, I think. In terms of you know my prior comments on you know how do we incentivize the development of AI models and AI systems that are able to contribute to inventing, I don't necessarily think that these sorts of incentives must entail you know some sort of um, inherent or maybe second order recognition as an inventor. Um, there are, you know, there are plenty of different ways for a government to incentivize, you know, innovation, right? We, we see this uh, all the time, you know, even with the current regime, um, you know, incent uh, innovation is incentivized with patents for sure, but it's also incentivized with things like um, SBIR grants, right, for, uh, you know, the funding of R&D initiatives uh, by small and medium businesses. Um, you know, there, there's so many vehicles for incentivizing, uh, you know, innovation development is sort of uh, R&D, especially when large fixed costs are entailed. I don't necessarily think, um, you know, we need to, you know, we need to necessarily go down the rabbit hole of, as the, uh, as the uh, question asker uh, poses maybe, you know, naming a machine as a person either in a first order or second order manner. Um, I don't want to say, you know, much more about, you know, the advisability of doing so, um, but I just want to, you know, reemphasize that, you know, the, you know, the, the powers that a government has to promote innovation and, you know, large scale R&D are extensive, you know, they include the IP system, but they are not in any way limited to the IP system. I think, especially in the United States, you see a realization of this very fact that there's, you know, there are so many different channels by which to promote, you know, AI innovation, uh, AI development, uh, you know, whether that's writ large or specifically in the realm of, you know, AI for, um, AI for inventing that, you know, it's it's not necessary at all uh, that we ne that we need to, you know, reconceive of machines as inventors in order to realize the same. Yeah, so I mean, one of the points you raised there is something that often comes up in this context, and it's the sort of comfort level to what extent we feel intuitively it's appropriate, for example, to recognize an AI system as an inventor. 
and a, a question that came up which inexplicably disappeared, I don't know how, um, related to the role of AI as a regulator uh, and whether or what it, would, what it might be necessary to do to raise the comfort level so that people would accept AI regulators, whether or not one thinks that's a, a good thing. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll open it up to, um, uh, I'll make this a kind of open question uh, and then I'll go backwards through the panel in reverse order from how you spoke um, to give you a, a kind of final chance because to speak because we've got about six minutes left. So taking that either as a departure point or just uh, any final thoughts, uh, Thibault, can I go to you first and then we'll go backwards through the panel, just any concluding remarks in a minute or so, either on the role of AI as a regulator or whether you think sort of 10, 20 years from now, if we're having a conference like this, AI might not just be the inventors, AI, AI systems might be the presenters and indeed the, the audience. <laughs> but your sort of concluding yeah. thoughts on this, Thibault first uh, and then sure. Ian come back to you next. So, you know, I actually organized a conference last summer in which I invited GPT-3 as a guest and I was asking that AI system to ask questions to the other guests. So this is not something for in 15 years, but, you know, th something for tomorrow. Um, I think, you know, the roles of lawyers, because of course we struggle to understand the tech and innovation and we have no general theory of innovation, but something that we can do is come up with great definitions. And I think this will be a good start. Uh, to be very concrete, if you read the AI Act, drafted by the European Commission, it basically covers every software in the world. And I think we can do better than that. Same for the DMA. It covers more than eight companies. It covers 80 companies. So I will argue that we start there and same when it comes to the question as can the AI, you know, be the, the owner and the, the inventor. And that, that is where I will argue that we could start. So potentially, you know, it, it shows that there are room, there is room for lawyers and we are not, um, yes, about to, to expire. <laughs> well, with, with my law school dean hat on, I thank you. My students, thank you. E, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we need more of, uh, of conferences like this where the industry can um, uh, discuss with the regulators what, what are the, the really uh, future needs uh, that might arise. And also, I think it's, um, it's a really good pr platform for the community to, to build together the tech community and, and the legal community in this industry to um, really work together to um, um, ensure that the technology revolution doesn't uh, upset the, um, the legal framework that are existing and, and, and there to protect um, uh, um, the user's privacy and also uh, the safety of data between, uh, especially in the cross-border settings. So, um, well, uh, I just like to take the chance to thank you again for um, hosting this panel and also uh, this conference. Thanks, E. Um, Ulrike. So I'll probably go back to something that Kate said when she first started off talking about um, the Davos case that everyone's talking about. And I think um, it is very valuable to think about the extremes because sometimes it lets you take a step back and think about what the future might hold. Um, so that, that's a very valuable exercise um, and I don't want to take away from it. But equally, I think um, AI data, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the technology uh, um, revolution that we're seeing is changing what we're doing right here and now. Um, whether that is a mix of AI and human, a shift of how invention and creation is happening at the moment, whether it's a shift in how we might register or administer the AI in how we might look for prior art and infringers. So they're, they're real life questions right here and now that would help innovators and creators um, to get a handle with. So I, I think from my side, um, I, I value the opportunity so much to be part of the discussions and it's really important to take the longer view to help us set a direction um, but also not to forget that in the here and now there's some real pr problems on um, the questions and answers that we can have a look at to help innovators and creators wherever they are around the world. Thank you. Um, Peter. Yeah that's an interesting question you put before us. Um, I think that uh, in 10 years time um, the process of, of a blending of human and AI um, action uh, will, will have increased. 
Um, so the sort of blending AI into, for example, human conferences as Thibault, um, as ever a pioneer, already is doing today, apparently. So I think this will get much stronger and some, some features of conferencing um, such as fact presentations or so on, or moderation maybe, um, are possibly then done by AI. I think an interesting aspect to this is that we, we still think very much about um, AI has to move towards our way of doing things. Um, I think there is also the flip side to that. Um, I think that human processes, including how we write and apply the law, may um, become structured more in a way that is easier to handle um, for AI systems, um, tolerating AI mistakes as we are tolerating today human mistakes. Just th think of a grumpy judge with all uh, her or his biases. Um, so I think this is a very important point, but we cannot explore this any further here. I, the time is up, um, but, but I'm very much looking forward to maybe hear about this at the next issue of this great conference. And thanks to Daryl at this point for the great conference. Thanks, Peter. Jerry. Sure thing. So I think um, two points in closing, um, you know, the first responsive to uh, your question, Simon, um, I think my views uh, are should be well known by now that, you know, AI is doing amazing things. It's proliferating all over the economy, but in terms of public sector regulatory use and adjudication, AI is always for, you know, the very long foreseeable future going to remain a tool for humans who we want to keep in the driver's seat of any adjudicatory decision. You know, an ex patent examiner sitting in the USPTO office or remotely, wherever they happen to be, uh, you know, has the application and they have tools, right? Tools including Microsoft Word, tools including, uh, you know, a patent search engine and, uh, you know, increasingly tools including, you know, a suite of AI tools that we're uh, hard at work trying to develop for them, right? So, um, you know, we're, we're very much focused on the development of AI to make the patent system you know, better and more efficient, but via the development of tools rather than the development of you know, wholesale new adjudicatory processes and technology. Um, the other point I'll just make is touching on the, um, on the data discussions from earlier, you know, patent offices, IP offices in general are such an under, you know, under recognized source of data for you know, the innovation economy writ large. If you think about IP offices, we are perhaps one of the most extensive as a group collections of scientific and technical knowledge in the world. You know, just think about the millions of applications that we publish, the millions of patents that we grant and the diversity of scientific and technical innovation that they entail. You know, it's just an amazing resource. So the last point I'll make is a plug for developer.uspto.gov, which will contain, you know, all the patent data and trademark data that your heart may desire. So I'll leave it there. Thanks so much to the organizers and to you, Simon, uh, for moderating. And it's been a fun hour and a half. Thanks, Jerry. And Adam, Adam has appeared to invite us all to a virtual reception, but Kate, you get the last word because he, Adam's not actually offering any coffee, at least where I'm sitting. Kate. Uh, well, thank you. I think it, this has been summarized very well by um, the other panelists here. So I'll just say uh, it was a, a pleasure to participate in this and it will be interesting to see where all of the these cases and um, uh, evaluations by different different entities uh, stand next year. But thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Well, look, on behalf of the audience, some of whom got up bright and early in Chicago, some of whom have stayed up late over in this part of the world in Asia, but all of whom have been very lucky to have a, a rich set of presentations. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the organizers and Adam, I think I'll hand it back to you to tell everyone what happens next. In particular, we're gonna start off with antitrust and IP in the Biden administration. What can we expect? Now, I think we could spend the entire time on that topic, um, but we're an ambitious crowd and we're also going to address pharmaceutical antitrust issues. What's next for pay for delay and beyond? And finally, we're going to address antitrust fines and copyright license negotiations. Is this a trend? 
So Anu, I'd love to kick it off to you um, as someone who's in the Biden administration. What are your views? What do you think we should be looking forward to? Thanks, Suzanne. And I'm going to go ahead and add to your already broad disclaimer and say that the views I express are my own and they don't reflect the views of the commission or of any commissioner. Uh, uh, so I think the first place to start when you ask the question, where is this administration going, is to look at the very broad and comprehensive executive order President Biden issued in July on competition. And it's aimed at promoting competition across the U.S. economy. Uh, uh, order does um, focus on, well, it calls for enhanced enforcement of the antitrust laws, but it really takes a whole of government approach. So I counted over 70 to do items in the uh, executive order. And while many of them fall on antitrust agencies, there are a lot of joint projects for everyone. And many agencies have a laundry list of things that they're encouraged to do or contemplate or explore. Um, although the executive order focuses on um, well, it focuses on several specific economic sectors, some of which impact folks uh, on this call, including technology, labor markets, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, airlines and transportation, agriculture. There's a whole section on beer, wine and spirits, internet service, banking and consumer finance. So there might be a little something for everyone in there from hearing aids to what you're drinking. Uh, I'm going to give some highlights uh, of parts of the executive order then touch on IP concerns, um, starting with section 5R that talks about march in rights. Um, and basically this is a, a direction to the Secretary of Commerce regarding some rules that were proposed in the last administration that would prevent agencies from using solely thinking about price as a reason to exercise march in rights. So the Secretary of Commerce has been requested to consider not finalizing that rule. Section 5H and 5S uh, focus on right to repair issues, which has been a hot topic, I think, for a while, particularly um, something that the FTC has spent some time working on, and we recently issued a report on right to repair. So the Section 5H encourages the FTC to exercise some rulemaking authority in this space, and I think that is a other um, in the document, it encourages lots of rulemaking by the FTC. In addition, there is a provision directing the Secretary of Defense to prepare a plan for um, avoiding terms in the uh, contracts it negotiates for procurement, making it difficult to repair. So you, this kind of goes to this idea that we're taking a multifocal approach to the issues identified in the order. Section 5i talks about agricultural patents. Um, so there's, I'm gonna quote the language here because um, we see this uh, language about intellectual property concerns kind of pervading the, the order. To help ensure that intellectual property system, while incentivizing innovation, does not unnecessarily reduce competition, and here it's in seed or other input markets beyond that reasonably contemplated by the Patent Act. So here are the Secretary of Agriculture is directed to submit a report enum enumerating any concerns, um, but also strategies for addressing those concerns across IP, antitrust, and other laws. So again, you see this sort of whole of government approach. And we see similar language talking about patents in the drug context. Uh, the EO says that we need to ensure that the patent system, while incentivizing innovation, does not also unjustifiably delay generic drug and biosimilar competition beyond that reasonably contemplated by applicable law. And here in 5H, we are we see again language encouraging the FTC to exercise rulemaking, uh, focusing on unfair anti-competitive conduct or agreements in the pres prescription drug industries. Um, and that includes focusing on agreements like uh, pay for delay agreements. Section 5P to, uh, uh, gives various um, things to the Secretary of Health and Human Services to do to continue to promote, promote generic drug and biosimilar competition. So again, you see this fusion approach. 
And finally, uh, in Section 5D, the Attorney General and the Secretary of Commerce are called to consider whether to revise their position on the intersection of IP and antitrust laws, which is sort of a, a broad ask. And then uh, there's a specific ask in the provision as well that uh, suggests that they consider whether to revise the 2019 policy statement on remedies for essential patents subject voluntary to subject to voluntary FRAND commitments. Um, and there's language in there about concerns uh, uh, relating to the potential for anti-competitive extension of market power beyond the scope of granted patents. Uh, and specifically, it encourages these agencies to protect standard setting processes from abuse. So that's quick encapsulation of a very broad uh, executive order. And I encourage you to look at the actual order to get a sense of where this administration uh, is heading. With respect to antitrust and SEP specifically, the agencies have, um, there are a couple of recent speeches that I want to just quickly flag for you and perhaps some of the other panelists will have reactions. I know a panel yesterday briefly touched on um, these speeches, uh, but first in September, the antitrust division's Jeffrey Wilder gave a speech titled, Leveling the Playing Field in the Standards Ecosystem, Principles for a Balanced Antitrust Enforcement Approach to Standard Essential Patents. And just last week, uh, FTC Commissioner uh, Rebecca Slaughter gave a speech on SEP's antitrust uh, and the FTC. And uh, you see some themes running across those speeches. And I think the main one is that there is a role for antitrust in this space. Um, well, we can talk further about that. And I, I'm curious to hear from others about, uh, about what they think. Uh, I just want to finish up by highlighting some priorities that Chair Khan at the FTC released a, in a memo outlining her vision for where the FTC is heading. And I think that may also impact some others on this panel, and I look forward to hearing reactions. First, um, we're going to address market consolidation and focus greater scrutiny on dominant firms, uh, and that includes an uh, in it includes revising the merger guidelines uh, in collaboration with the antitrust division. We're also going to focus on scrutinizing gatekeeper dominant intermediaries and extractive business models. Um, which, and finally, uh, we're going to focus on certain types of contract terms, especially those imposed in take it or leave it contracts like non-competes, repair restrictions, and exclusionary causes that harm competition or constitute unfair or deceptive practices. Well, thanks, Anu. That was a, a very fulsome summary of what's happening at the FTC. And, and Michelle, I'd love to get your reactions. But first, I just have one question for you, Anu. I know that you've spent a lot of time in the government and you were at the DOJ and then at the FTC. So you have experience, I think, working across agencies one thing that strikes me about the executive order is its breadth and how it goes, you know, not just to the FTC, DOJ, and PTO, but also, as you mentioned, to agriculture, to commerce, which obviously has a role to play in PTO and elsewhere. Based on your experience, what do you think are best practices for working within the government to achieve these sort of cross-agency goals? I know we're all one government, but it's amazing how sometimes communication doesn't always flow. And I think you're right in pointing out that the executive order is really encouraging those across government communications. And you will see a lot of coordination moving forward. I know both um, in the Wilder speech and Commissioner Slaughter noted that the antitrust division and the FTC uh, is coordinating closely on approaches in these areas moving forward. So I definitely think that that is um, going to be a theme here. Great, well, thank you. And Michelle, I'd love to turn it over to you because I know that you have a lot of experience in this area and I'd love to hear about sort of your views on what's happening in the Biden administration. Also maybe considering any legislative changes and how this is affecting the tech sector on the ground. Sure, I'd love to dive in that. I do have an, a follow-up question to what you asked for a new, 
And it's this, you know, often in executive orders, as we see here, it sort of sets out, um, please consider, think about these things, you know, sort of very aspirational. Has that helped to um, align agencies and thought leaders behind sort of like a cohesive strategy, even if it doesn't sort of force people to take certain specific actions? Has it had, you know, a, 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 that sort of almost binding impact, if not in words, but in, in sort of theory? Well, if you look at the order, you'll see a lot of things that say a secretary shall, and then you see a lot of things that say consider. And some of this reflects that some of the agencies involved are executive branch agencies, and some of the agencies are independent agencies like the FTC. So we're always encouraged to do things, but the items identified are often a launching point for the kinds of conversations um, that flow where they, then the the, thing, the projects go where they go. But it, it, at least there are things for the agencies to focus on um, and initiate cross-agency collaboration on. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. All right, so uh, I'd love to kind of talk through, uh, you know, some of the, the concepts, at least from the view of, of tech companies, and obviously we are not one size fits all, you know, typically they talk about tech in one breath and it encapsulates, you know, big companies to small companies. Um, so obviously there are some distinctions there, but some of the big tech focus and, and small tech focus that I've seen in the legislative front is, you know, we've got, uh, there's, one of the ones that I think is interesting and notable is about um, these concepts of requiring dominant companies to make their services interoperable with competitors. And so, you know, obviously platforms frequently have quite a bit of, of content and often the content stays within the walled garden of a particular platform. And so these efforts are focusing on uh, changing the systems and requiring these larger dominant companies to have things like their photos, their images, their messaging become interoperable, which sort of raises all sorts of interesting questions about, you know, data flows and ownership of data. Um, just this past week, I don't know if folks were, were paying attention, it wasn't big news, um, but Facebook actually changed one of its practices. So uh, on the interoperability front. So many, many years ago, I think we're going back to 2012 now, you know, typically you were able to take an Instagram photo and cross post it over to Twitter and you go to your Twitter timeline and you'd see an Instagram photo just sort of show up in the scroll. And then right after Instagram was acquired by Facebook, that feature was disabled and you could only see text and you'd have to click out of the Twitter ecosystem to go over to Instagram. So just this past week, Week, they've changed this policy, which I think is certainly interesting and obviously a, a strategy that one could adopt in sort of in terms of sort of getting ahead of some of the legislative changes being considered. Not that I know that's what they did, but you know. Um, another one to consider is uh, this legislative focus on preventing big tech companies from anti-competitively discriminating against other market actors, preserve their market position. So this could include anything from self-preferencing, uh, to you know, showing your own products versus another vendor's products, or showing uh, you know your your services at, at the top of the list. Um, the other one, as Anu talked about, were acquisitions. Obviously, you know, historically, people have a lot of regret about some acquisitions that have gone through, including Facebook and Instagram, WhatsApp, uh, Google's purchase of Android and YouTube, Amazon's purchase of Audible and Zappos. Um, you know, there's currently a consideration about where the burden of proof should sit. Should the agencies be forced to talk about the downstream impacts of these deals, or instead, should the parties have the burden of proof of showing what the implications of their deal will mean? So I think that's interesting. Um, and of course, Course, there's the discussion about increased merger filing fees. Everyone is in alignment that uh, the U.S. enforcers need more money, uh, and that seems to be a, a, a sound way of getting to that end. Um, and finally, you know, there's this discussion about structural separations, um, line of business types of restrictions of saying, you know, you need to offshoot this part of your business. Um, you can't get into this line of business again. And that one, I think, has is 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 fairly jarring in in the implications. So these are a wide ranging. Oh my god, sorry. Um, so there are a wide ranging, um, you know, set of, of of impacts that are being considered, and I think it. it as most folks can appreciate, this will really shake 
uh, the, the current ecosystem. I do wonder how long it takes before we sort of get to the point where there are changes happening. Um, you know, obviously technology moves very quickly and every day there are, you know, product changes, decisions being made um, about, you know, what content is being surfaced, what algorithms are operating in a certain way. And it's interesting just to see as there is such a heightened focus around the world um, on anti-competitive practices, how um, the changes being contemplate are, are we moving fast enough as, as you know, everyone thinks about. So I, I you know, these are all big, big picture questions. Um, the other one that I'd sort of, any questions? Anyone want to talk about anything? <laughs> I do, but I, I do, know, but I, I, I go first. I go first. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think, yeah, so I, I mean, I think the main question on what you just said is mm -hmm. how will this affect the ecosystem of tech? Take, let's take one thing, for example, right? If the FTC is saying that as a part of a consent, you have to allow the agency to review all acquisitions, not just those that meet the HSR filing threshold, right? What impact do you think that that's going to have on how tech operates, either in terms of aqua hires or, you know, other sort of developments in the, the vertical channel? What do you think that's going to do? Question. So I've, I've thought about this from sort of that, that initial angle, which is, you know, there are a number of startup companies that get funding, you know, these days, even though, you know, times are very different, a lot of startup companies are still getting tons and tons of funding. And I wonder where, you know, you have a scenario where the bigger tech companies that are often seen as the, the prime target for acquiring these small startups, um, you know, where every one of their deals are scrutinized, you end up in a position where, you know, will there continue to be the same degree of innovation? Because there are small startup companies that are much more products. You know, they, they, there's always the question of, is that a product or is it a company? And for many of these startups, the ideas and the concepts they come up with are, 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 are that. They're, you know, single product ideas. They're ones that sort of need resourcing and funding um, from longer, bigger companies to, to be sustainable in the long term. And I wonder if, you know, ultimately there is some net impact on innovation when those startups know that they don't have the exit opportunity of getting acquired. And the other concept that you flagged is if larger companies are in a position where they cannot simply just go out and purchase the companies that they want, you know, they're are certainly going to be downstream impacts in terms of what they do, you know, in at least Silicon Valley in the tech space, there is a limited pool of talent. Um, you know, software engineers are very hard to come by. Uh, and, you know, I, I wonder whether we'll see a lot more hiring on that front. If you can't acquire the companies, why not just go out and buy the talent? Um, and it, it, it sort of, there's a, there's a potential shift there. So I think I do think it's important for people to consider all of these concepts very holistically um, and not just sort of through the, the lens of pure competition law. So I have a follow-up question, so I but I wanted to give this um, opportunity to the panel if anyone else wants to jump in. Great. Well, so I think on your point, how much do you think we will start to see hiring early on by the large tech companies versus letting um, innovation sort of develop outside of the company and then be acquired? And one of the reasons why I'm thinking about this is when you look at the antitrust standards that apply in, there hasn't been very much, if at all, development of the law, fulsome development of the law in terms of nascent competition. I'm also thinking of, you know, Illumina Grail when you're really looking at nascent vertical competition, right? So this is a, it's a new area, I think, for the agencies and definitely goes to their interest in being more aggressive. But when you're thinking about the application of nascent issues, do you think that there's a division between the tech space and the pharma space, knowing that, that your experience is in tech, not, not in pharma, in terms of being able to evaluate the likelihood of success of that nascent competitor? 
think it's really challenging. I think when you look at, you know, the, the example that comes up often is sort of Facebook, Instagram, and what could have been thought of differently there, um, you know, and, and at the time, you know, image storage, it's a, still is fairly expensive. I mean, there, there are challenges, there are infrastructure challenges. And, you know, did, did Instagram success, you know, there were early indicators and signs of success, but were the, 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 was, you know, it ultimately successful because it had sort of the financial resourcing and backing and user base of Facebook, you know, perhaps. And so it can be difficult to say in isolation, whether or not Instagram would have come up to be, you know, a true competitor that, that, that ultimately constrained Facebook possibly, but it's, it's so hard to tell. And so there's sort of a consideration of how many X factors do you look at, you know, or what are the, it's, it's, it's really difficult to sort of do that, the thing in end, which I call like an AB test to see, you know, what would have happened, but for this change. Um, and so I, I, there are, are many tech companies running around these days that say they're the next greatest, you know, X, Y, Z, and the next biggest thing. And ultimately, you know, if they get acquired and you're looking at the documents, I think if you're a regulator looking at these, you think, oh my goodness, they're acquiring the next big, you know, uh, the, the, the thing that's gonna kill the entire debit industry, you know? Um, and I, I, I think that there is, it, it can be extremely difficult. That is a non-answer answer, but I'd love other folks' thoughts on this. All right, well, thank you. Um, and I think, you know, Michelle, we're gonna continue to talk about antitrust in the Biden administration and a new, you know, the FTC issues. So let's all, you know, keep our conversation going, but I'd like to bring Carlos in now because Carlos, you are in Brazil, you're watching this outside of the US. What are your views on, you know, both what's happening in the US with respect to antitrust IP in the Biden administration and also potentially globally? I think you may still be mute. Maybe it's on our end. Oh, uh, sorry for that. And thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, Suzanne. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, what happens in the US certainly impacts uh, usually what, what happens in Brazil as a developing country, uh, as well as what happens in Europe and other jurisdictions. Uh, the, uh, our look uh, from Brazil with regard to the Biden administration, of course, as Anu already mentioned, uh, it's uh, comes from the executive order of President Biden uh, from the White House, uh, where he uh, there is a clear commitment to enhance competition by uh, uh, encouraging uh, the review uh, in the intersection of antitrust uh, and IP uh, based on concerns uh, regarding uh, competitive extension of market power beyond the scope of granted patents. Uh, in the remarks at the signing order, uh, at the signing uh, order the president Biden stated the policy of no more tolerance of abusive actions by monopolies. So there is a clear uh, 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 call to promote a more vigorous antitrust enforcement. And uh, among the uh, initiatives that was already mentioned here, were already mentioned here, such as the ban on, uh, on or limit non-competes and pay for delay, similar agreements, uh, among others, uh, what is uh, uh, troubling from uh, our view abroad is that uh, this creates a great level of uncertainty. Uh, we, there are certainly uh, many concerns to be addressed. Uh, the COVID, for instance, is something that affected us, our loved ones, and already killed more than 5 million people. And I think that the, the, the goal uh, with those measures is to uh, give access to uh, medicines and uh, uh, raw materials for uh, uh, that will benefit uh, the, the public in general. Of course, I'm talking about health, but it, it certainly applies to other uh, areas uh, of the industry. But uh, using the COVID as uh, 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 an example, uh, we uh, 
see here that there is a great support from this administration, the US administration, to uh, waive rights uh, concerning uh, vaccines. And that's uh, something that we don't see as, uh, uh, we have doubts about that. We uh, believe that uh, it is, uh, uh, there is certainly a need for greater international cooperation, uh, but I do believe that the IP system is the main tool available to promote such cooperation. Uh, I recommend you to uh, uh, take a look at the report signed by Professor Mark, Mark Schutz, available at geneva network.com, uh, in which he shows that the proposal to ignore or negate IP rights related to uh, COVID could be counterproductive. Uh, the report shows that uh, innovation. Uh, innovators are already sharing sh secrets and know-how widely with partners worldwide to produce vaccines as, as quickly as possible and uh, also shows that this greater and faster uh, technology transfer is made available by legal certainty and trust among competitors and partners. And I think that IP is a very important tool for that in order to make them comfortable and willing to share information with one another. And uh, so we, we uh, think that we, this uh, uh, stance on waiving rights and also the level of uncertainty, uh, just as an example, uh, uh, among the policies that are, uh, that are encouraged to be reviewed uh, uh, as per the order is the uh, is regard to standard essential patents. And last April, the DOG reclassified the 2020 supplement to the 2015 standard setting policy as mere advocacy rather than formal guidance. This supplement of 2020, uh, as you well know, had clarified that the, that the division did not support limiting the rights of SEP holders to seek injunctive relief or negotiate uh, uh, reasonable royalties. It is difficult to know what will actually happen, but uh, I would like to highlight that this Reclassification creates uncertainty for patent holders and patentees on several fronts. Uh, and we believe that this is not a good thing for the negotiation of licensing agreements and innovation in general. So I think that the main point here is uh, the fact that whenever you have uh, these changing policies, uh, I think you, you need to be aware that uh, this uncertainty will uh, create the possibility of narratives in developing countries that can uh, be harmful uh, for uh, innovation in general, for collaboration, and because there are many companies devoted to copy, not really investing in developing new technologies, that they will seize the opportunity to misconstrue uh, uh, the discussions that are being held. Uh, that I, I know that are, those are very important discussions, but uh, 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 this uncertainty is kind of a, I believe that it's more harmful for countries in which we we're still working. It's a work in progress in terms of developing a strong uh, IP system. And well, with regard to the uh, CAGI, the Brazilian Antitrust Authority, uh, they, they're still adopting a more preventive approach regarding anti-competitive conduct and focusing more on acts of concentration in mergers. The shift is clear. But there is still considerable fines, uh, such as the $50 million fine imposed last Wednesday, the day before yesterday, uh, to a railroad company for abuse of dominant position, by the position of barriers to the entry of rivals in the sugar export market. Uh, in a nutshell, Cadi Tribunal found that the specific conduct of blocking access to essential infrastructure mounted to an antitrust violation, but the written decision was not published yet. Uh, there is no indication the CAD will change its stance regarding the intersection of IP uh, uh, as per the agency's most recent, uh, and antitrust, uh, as per the agency's most recent decisions denying accusations against IP holders, such as the spare parts case, the aut automotive industry, the enforcement of certain essential patents with requests for a preliminary injunction, enforcement of data package protection by pharmaceutical companies, uh, among others. There is also a trend uh, to increase cooperation uh, among uh, government agencies, especially with regard to social networks uh, and dominant positions, big data, but this is very incipient yet. So this is kind of a, a nutshell on how we look the Biden uh, uh, 
uh, administration regard with regard to antitrust and IP, and where we are headed here in Brazil. I believe we are in a good path, but uh, changes uh, in policies in the US and elsewhere uh, will certainly have an impact here as well. Thank you. Carlos, thank you very much. I, and I think this is a question that sort of goes to everyone, but in particular, you, one of the things that I, I was thinking about as you were presenting was the impact that U.S. changes can have abroad, right? So you were talking about the um, the SEP statements and then, you know, sort of how they changed from Obama to Trump. And then now we're sort of waiting to see what happens in the Biden administration. What is a, a way that you within Brazil are thinking about the ways to educate or to discuss with folks um, whether there are certain policy changes in the U.S. that are limited to the U.S., right? So I'm thinking in particular the first step statement really, in my mind, was going to the ITC and sort of ITC procedures. Um, but obviously it has become much more widely interpreted and I think that's something that the U.S. agencies need to consider as they're proposing guidance. But they also likely will continue to propose guidance that applies only within the United States. So what are some ways that we can think about um, cabining, may perhaps, what is applicable only to the U.S. so that it doesn't affect or intersect with the policy approach that you're trying to take in Brazil? Well, uh, that's a very good question, Suzanne. Uh, we are a civil law country and uh, very similar to uh, uh, the German law system. And you're basically allowed to misconstrue <laughs> a little bit when you present an answer to the complaint. The level of candor here is not that great. Uh, you basically, you uh, the, the, the preliminary injunction here is the main remedy against patent infringement. It's specifically provided by the letter black of a federal statute. Uh, you have to meet the level of uh, evidence necessary to uh, be entitled to a preliminary injunction. But, but the first thing that the defendant does when it comes to court is to shout to the judge, Your Honor, uh, this request is completely inadmissible. There is a clear guidance in other US law uh, and other laws governing those friend commitments, uh, etc. So uh, the, the level of impact uh, is, uh, is, um, is great. Uh, and of course, our, part of our job is to go there and tell the judge that it's not, uh, it's not about that. But when you have this type of change in the classification of something, uh, it, the signal here uh, can be enhanced. I think it's something that, uh, it's about narrative, I know, but uh, it, it helps, uh, uh, and for instance, Kaji. Kaji, uh, we have a very slim legislation concerning anti-competitive conduct. Say, they do recite a lot of US precedents whenever they are deciding a case. Sham litigation, for instance, is something that doesn't exist uh, under Brazilian law, but they do uh, bring uh, U.S. precedents and start uh, imposing fines concerning uh, on sham litigation cases. I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't have a, a, a statute or a law on that. I'm just saying that they heavily rely on uh, U.S. law. So uh, uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question uh, uh, or if I'm uh, dodging it, but uh, <laughs> but it's it's really uh, uh, the impact is great. Depend on, on the attorneys, but certain companies that are litigating abroad, for instance, we have these global patent enforcement cases, and uh, we have to file each jurisdiction. Whenever the the infringer comes with uh, its construction uh, of what is happening abroad, uh, and they they come up with documents, especially if they are issued by uh, government agencies uh, around the world. Uh, if it's a court decision or if it's a uh, agency decision, so if it's a new regulation, uh, it does impact the Brazilian judge, uh, a Brazilian judge, because they want to get it right. And, and they don't want to feel that they are giving something to you in Brazil that is not allowed uh, abroad. But we have different remedies, we have different different system, and uh, but, uh, but, but, I, I, but I strongly believe that this, uh, change and uh, with all the 
uh, and I think that I was mentioning the the, the work uh, of Professor Schultz because I think that we do lack a lot of empiric, empiric, ev empiric evidence about uh, okay we're doing all this we're limiting competes we're limiting uh, okay but what what is our goal uh, we, there there are advocates for limiting rights uh, the the trips agreement uh, to provide uh, medicines but the corporations already ongoing and it's already working. So their companies are already collaborating to find ways of faster uh, bringing vaccines to the market. And so uh, uh, what we believe there is a lot of battles, uh, a lot of narratives, a lot of policy discussions, uh, but they do impact and, and eventually you have the perception that there is a winner. And, and when they come to, to developing countries, uh, these decisions will be used to uh, help uh, 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 usually used to help uh, the the to negate IP rights and something things like that. No, thank you, Carlos. I thought that was a very helpful answer. And the reason why I'm thinking of this is I'm I'm sort of thinking very specifically about the SEP policy statements because it, it's something that I worked on when I was at the FTC. But I'm also thinking about the massive um, policy efforts that the current administration have stated, and I have nothing to do with that, but but thinking about when we were looking at specific issues that were related to the ITC, related to the US, and obviously there was very, very fulsome debate on that point. Once things begin to sort of go outside of the US, I think there is a, more can be done in terms of education, right? And saying we're taking, we're making this policy in the US because this is what we need to do. It may have these follow on effects outside of the United States. Here's the right way to understand that so that it's not having, you know, anti innovation effects outside of the US. I'm not, I don't think explaining that as clearly as I would like to, but it's just something I, I'm thinking about. I completely agree with our concerns, Suzanne. Uh, uh, I see that a lot of measures that are uh, being adopted in the U.S. by the government to refine and to take care of cases that are outside the curve, uh, I think that they eventually uh, do harm U.S. Uh, patentees and IP holders uh, in uh, developing countries because they like to use those arguments that are kind of trying to prevent uh, abuses uh, to tell uh, Brazilian authorities and judges that those IP owners are always abusing uh, and there is a trend of abuse. And uh, so, and, and uh, I don't need to tell you that in developing countries, uh, the government tends to benefit the national champions. So this is something that uh, has kind of a really a profound side effect and outside the US. That's at least my personal view uh, uh, on that. Suzanne, may I, well, may I add to that? Um, yes, please. This is, this is uh, really interesting. I, I, I do agree with the, uh, with the concerns that were uttered, uh, but the opposite sometimes happens as well that one administration across the globe does identify an anti-competitive issue that has not been identified elsewhere. Um, and enforcement in one country, and often it is the US that's at the forefront, uh, then triggers uh, uh, enforcement, or at least, you know, looking into the issue that has been a non-issue previously. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, I mean, we'll, we'll be getting to pay to delay, but uh, uh, that's something that to my knowledge, certainly started in the US and then sort of came across the ocean to Europe. And now we're, you know, we're seeing uh, respective enforcement um, measures here as well. So I think it does cut both ways, but I, I, I do agree with, with Carlos that uh, antitrust agencies across the globe, I think should be careful when, when phrasing their policies uh, to, well, be as sure as possible at least that uh, you know mis misuse is prevented. I, I think there's there's a limit to that um, because uh, clever advocates will be advocating what they take out of that decision. In the end, it depends on the national agencies and judges uh, uh, to 
to have a really clear view on this. But uh, I think there, you know, it, there, there are two sides of the metals you know, to, of the metal to it. Well, Tobias, I think that's an excellent segue into your thoughts on pay for delay. In particular, um, you know, one thing that I've always thought interesting with pay for delay is I'm obviously schooled in the US case law, right, having worked on those cases at the FTC. And so I think of it very much in terms of a Hatch-Waxman framework, which obviously you don't have in Germany. So I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on sort of the current status of pay for delay and those issues. And then Anu will return to you for sort of a US perspective. Okay, thank you. Well, my, my previous comment was not <laughs> aimed at <laughs> getting into the uh, uh, pay for delay discussion uh, that I was asked to prepare. Uh, but in any event, um, yeah, so uh, I think it is a good example of uh, uh, inquiries and, and activity in the US uh, uh, that spilled over and, and, and triggered respective uh, um, inquiries and also enforcement in Europe. Um, the, and, and there has been recently in the last one or two, maybe three years, uh, this has really, really picked up. Um, I mean, the European kickoff was probably as early as 2009 when the Commission started the sector inquiry. That was not restricted to pay for delay, it's a sector inquiry uh, into pharma in general. Um, but it was uh, uh, particularly uh, directed at monitoring patent settlements. And uh, we've, we've seen a number uh, of cases, particularly last year and this year, um, that now offer, I think, more, more and, and, and clearer guidance uh, than we used to have. Um, coming to your question, the, the, maybe it's, it's good to, to lose a couple words on, on the legal framework uh, uh, that these things are dealt with here. Uh, and it's, it's mainly Article 101 TFEU, which, which states that, that uh, agreements between undertakings which may affect trade between member states and have as their object or effect the prevention, restriction, or distortion of competition um, shall be prohibited. Um, so fr from the quote, you can see there, there, there are mainly two differentiations. The one is um, agreements that by object may affect trade um, and the other by effect. Now, if, if, if you translate it as, as far as you can translate it to US, US standards, I think the by effect uh, rule or the by effect uh, uh, case would probably translate to the rule of reason as you have in the US, whereas uh, the by object uh, uh, cases, uh, you, you do not need to uh, um, analyze and, and then weigh the, the potential anti and pro competitive uh, effects of the measure. Um, the, 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 other, uh, um, the other legal framework is Article 102, even though with pay for delay agreements much less, but uh, that's, that's our market dominance uh, uh, rule, which uh, prohibits any abuse of, the, uh, of, of a market dominant position. Um, so the, the, main, the, 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 the main cases on pay for delay have been, have been 101 um, uh, cases and um, interestingly uh, both the commission and then um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the European Court of Justice have um, mainly found agreements uh, by object and not by effect, which then means that you don't have the uh, uh, weighing uh, of, of pro and anti-competitive effects, so you don't need to go into uh, actually analyzing that uh, in, in detail. Um, to actually get into 101, however, uh, you first need to establish that you have competitors uh, at the table, which may raise questions when you have an originator on the one hand and the generic that is only about to enter the market, but it is not on, on the market yet. Um, as I said, that has been uh, uh, dealt with in a number of recent cases, uh, the Lundbeck case, uh, the generics case, uh, and, and a couple more. And uh, the guidance these cases have uh, offered 
is that, um, a, of course, a potential competitive relationship between the parties is sufficient. And well, when do you have that potential competitive relationship? Well, that requires both the intention and also the ability of the generic to actually enter the market. Um, it has also been established, uh, enough, but I think that's, that's self-explanatory, that the existence of the patent itself does not prevent the existence of such a potential competitive relationship because otherwise Article 101 would be meaningless for, for, for these cases. Um, so as, as regards the intention of the generic, that's something that needs to be established uh, and, and that is usually established by looking uh, whether there have been sufficient preparatory steps to enter the market. Uh, and indications would be um, ma uh, applications for market authorization, uh, challenges of, of patents that are in the way, marketing initiatives, ordering stocks, uh, already concluding supply agreements, etc. Um, but there must be a sufficiently short-term expectation and intention to enter the market. And uh, Interestingly, the European Court of Justice in the generics case uh, established that the fact that the generic has concluded in pay for delay agreement uh, actually indicates uh, that there was a strong indication uh, to come onto the market. Well, so bottom line is the, the, the uh, competition aspect the, the, or the generics qualification as a potential competitor is not uh, the issue that's that's been relatively uh, cleared uh, by by the recent case law we've had so coming to what does establish uh, uh, an agreement that has as the object restriction of competition um, the ECj does emphasize in every decision that this needs to be interpreted narrowly but i think when you go into the cases um as said the vast majority of the cases are cases where they have actually found uh, it the object of the respective agreement to restrict uh, competition and the by effect uh, 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 rule did, did not play a role anymore so um I'm, I'm not sure how how narrow the interpretation really is but um Similarly, the ECJ always states that it cannot generally be assumed that settlements in connection with the expiry of a primary patent um, must be classified as a restriction. Uh, there needs to be a sufficient degree of harm. Um, and I'll, I'll get to the indications the courts have used to establish that in a second. But I do think what is interesting is that uh, the courts did not look into the question on you know, how uncertain the infringement or the strength of the validity of the respective patents is. So they've they've blocked away any 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 patent consideration issues at this point, which is I think mainly a jurisdiction point and and probably also a competence point. Um, and. Well, what, what, one of the strong indications or one of the main issues, and I think that's similar to, to the FTC uh, in the US, is um, what is the extent of the value transfer from the originator to the generic in these agreements? Uh, that's a significant, probably the most significant factor to see whether we have a restriction uh, uh, by object. Um, and where this payment goes beyond reimbursement of the cost the generic company had to either fight uh, 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 the validity of the respective patent or, or defend against infringement, etc., where, where it goes beyond cost compensation or damage compensation, um, that is at least an indication that this agreement uh, can only be explained to serve the, um, the, 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 the interest of the originator to keep the generics from the market. Um, in the Lundbeck case, I think that's a very illustrative case. Um, the value transfer, and that was actually a money transfer, 
um, was calculated by the anticipated profits of uh, the respective generic company and the damages that uh, this generic company may have had to pay uh, uh, to, 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 to its uh, contractors. So um, it was clear this was a compensation for not coming onto the market. Um, there, to, to what I've seen, there has been less focus on, on non-money compensation. I think that's something and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear on this, particularly from, from our US participants on the panel. Uh, so non-cash compensations, um, the cases here have mainly been cash compensation cases so far. Um, so let's pay for delay in Article 101 and just a couple brief words on Article 102, which is our um, abuse of market dominant position asset that has been far less the focus of the investigations and the court cases we have seen so far. Um, there, um, it, it is more relevant if you have agreements not with just one generic, but where there's actually a whole scheme of uh, such respective agreements, uh, various agreements that lead uh, to the conclusion that there's actually an overall contract orientated strategy of the uh, originator company um, to, um, well, pr prolong the mon monopoly that uh, it rightly exercised during the lifetime of the basic patent. And just, just, just to add, a, so let's pay for delay because that is the main uh, uh, field of, of uh, antitrust enforcement I think we, we are seeing in the pharma sector. Of course, there are others. Uh, um, there's this, the, 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 there is the, uh, the issue of evergreening, but I think that there's not much uh, uh, guidance on that yet. And I think uh, the problem starts with you know, how do you define evergreening, what that actually is. Um, we, we have seen the commission looking into uh, 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 Teva's behavior. There's uh, um, an invest formal investigation that has been started uh, by the commission in March this year. Um, there's only limited public information available uh, so far, but uh, one of the potential abuses the commission is looking into uh, is related to filing and selectively withdrawing a number of divisional patents uh, uh, after the um, basic patent had expired. Well, that's interesting because I think one of the things I think about in terms of the difference in between the US and Europe again goes back to Hatch Waxman, right, and the impacts of the Orange Book listing in the US and how that applies to evergreening. But to think about Europe applying potential evergreening um, theories to a situation where you are following an IP license, or, pardon me, an IP enforcement strategy, um, yeah. separate and apart from a statute, I think that that's an interesting, um, an interesting way to think about evergreening that is, again, different from how we think about evergreening in the US because for us it always comes back to Hatch Waxman. Yeah, and exactly that's that's what I'm saying that I think before talking about this, it's helpful to at least think of a definition what, what you understand as as evergreening because it, it does differ. And fr from what we've seen here so far, and that's very little, uh, but that's really the enforcement uh, of, of IP rights. And of I mean, I think it goes without saying that uh, um, uh, enforcing antitrust on, on the enforcement of IP rights uh, under Article 102 is the clear exception. So you'd really need to have uh, a significant, let, let's call them uh, uh, side facts, uh, uh, because the, the, the mere enforcement of the, the rights that have been rightly granted to you, uh, whether they, you know, whether they fall later on, if, if they are challenged, that's a different story, but they have been granted for, for a reason. Um, but as said, uh, the commission is currently looking in, 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 into, into, into uh, behavior of Teva in this regard. Uh, but to be complete, and as said, there's, there's little public information. It's not just the filing and selectively withdrawing divisional patents. Um, this was apparently accompanied by, by uh, communication measures that Teva took towards hospitals, doctors, pharmacists, etc. 
to well, uh, we, we all don't know what is true and what's not true, but the allegation is um, that um, uh, this communication, these communication measures uh, were intended to uh, uh, disqualify the generic product as, as an accompanying right. measure to the enforcement measures. So it's not just an IP enforcement case. Right, so that's more consistent with our case law where you're going beyond the patent grant, right? Taking steps beyond the patent grant, and that's what's leading yeah. to the antitrust issues. Um, that was extremely interesting. Thank you. Anu, I wonder if we could turn to you um, to talk about the US shortly. I, I want to make sure that we preserve time for Milan to talk about copyright issues, but I'm interested in what you're seeing in the US, particularly the task force that was announced. Oh, um, I was going to start with pay for delay, but maybe. Oh, I didn't need to. Whatever, however you'd like. No, um, let me just lay the stage for the task force because I think it goes back to this idea of the agencies um, kind of cross communicating and cross pollinating about uh, how to look at antitrust. And of course, this is all in the backdrop that we have different laws. So when we talk to each other, what is going on in Europe versus what is going on in the United States largely reflects the actual laws. Um, but uh, I think the exchange of ideas is useful and you do see flows of case theories going both ways. So earlier this year, a multilateral pharmaceutical merger task force was created uh, with the purpose of looking at uh, potential approaches to updating the way we analyze pharmaceutical mergers. Uh, so the Federal Trade Commission is participating in that along with many sister agencies, including the, the Canadian Competition Bureau, the European um, DGCOMP, UK's CMA, um, and the US Department of Justice, and many of our state attorney general's offices. Uh, and in May, um, the agencies issued a call for public comments with a list of questions about how we might start thinking um, differently or more broadly about uh, the issues. Uh, and some of these, uh, the topics certainly touch on how we should be thinking about IP in the pharmace pharmaceutical merger context. So you can, um, the public comments are all available. The questions are available. We received over 50, uh, close to 50 comments. But some of the questions were, like, can, what kinds of theories of harm should we be considering? Should we be taking a more expansive approach? How should we be thinking about the impact of a merger on innovation? Uh, and how should we be thinking uh, about the challenges that arise when mergers involve uh, proprietary technologies leading to drug discovery and manufacturing platforms, which is an area where we're starting to see a lot of interest, especially as we're moving into biosimilars and um, how, how these uh, will play out. Uh, also, um, market definition questions are get interesting when we start thinking about IP, uh, as well as uh, how we should approach remedies um, and divestitures. So I don't know if um, anyone else has been following this, but it'll be interesting to see what comes out of the various sister agencies and how, um, how they're thinking about these really important issues. On the pay for delay front, um, we've also seen plenty of activity as Tobias um, noted, well, in the US, we don't have this sort of split per se rule of reason approach after activists, it's clear that we're all using um, a rule of reason balancing approach to pay for delay. Uh, but the case law continues to develop uh, particularly about what constitutes a large and unjustified payment. Um, and as Tobias mentioned, we're seeing case law coming out in the US about different forms of compensation. It's pretty clear that non-cash compensation can certainly be large and unjustified. Um, and Recently, the federal, uh, the Fifth Circuit just affirmed an opinion that came out of the Federal Trade Commission on impacts, um, and that case involved different types of non-cash compensation, including collaboration agreement, a non-authorized um, generic agreement, which several of the circuits have reached uh, count, basically. 
uh, and there was a credit involved. And if you are interested in understanding how to, to really do a rule of reason analysis in this context, I think the commission opinion is particularly good because it reaches every step of the process, something that the courts often avoid doing and the Fifth Circuit also avoids doing it in this case. So um, just by way of background, super quick, uh, Impex was the agency's first part three proceeding in a pay for delay case. That means the agency actually brought the case in front of our internal ALJ. We have a trial and then that uh, the administrative law judge's opinion uh, decision was appealed. And then the full commissioners hear the case and they wrote an opinion, uh, which was then appealed to the circuit. If it's a commission opinion, the parties can choose where they want to appeal. So they chose the Fifth Circuit. Um, so I think the actual uh, commission opinion is a really interesting read and it does the full balancing effect. You can read about how they considered all these non-cash payments and, and um, how they weighed all that. Uh, and they also hit restrictive alternatives, um, which we often don't get to in these cases. The one that Fifth Circuit affirmed, um, they didn't actually look at the pro-competitive benefits. Instead, they concluded that any purported pro-competitive benefits um, from endo granting the licenses could have been achieved with a viable, less restrictive alternative. And I think this is really interesting um, because the court noted that uh, basically they could have done it without the payment and gotten an earlier uh, date. So it'll be very interesting to see how the case law develops with, within this framework. And I just wanna flag, I wanna make sure Milan has time, that we brought a new pay for a delay case at the beginning of the year and it also involves endo and impacts. And this time it's like the next stage of the story, the, the money flows back in the opposite direction. Uh, after the original pay for delay agreement, endo actually ended up exiting the market uh, and impacts ended up being the only one in the market uh, and the, the agreement at that, uh, in that situation actually involves the generic who is now the monopolist uh, agreeing in the opposite direction. So if we have time, we can talk about it, but I wanna make sure um, we save time. But I think that's interesting because it's a new, it's new thinking in that space. It, it certainly is. And, and thank you both for, um, such a fulsome coverage of the pharmaceutical issues. I think, you know, what I think is always interesting about this panel is I feel like we could use three hours to cover so many interesting issues. So, um, I, but Milan, we've been waiting patiently to hear from you um, about, a, I think, a relatively new and unique situation of antitrust fines in copyright license negotiations. Um, so I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on what's happening in France. Thank you. So I'm wondering if there's any kind of scheme to delay my entry on this panel. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> so listen, I I would like to talk to you about this uh, Google case in in France, which is quite interesting. When I uh, thinking how to prepare for it because, you know, the question is, is trend and I will have to look at several uh, countries. So I said, how will I do it? I said, well, I just go to Google News and, you know, I will search for uh, articles that are relevant to my topic. And it, it's quite funny because it reminds me when there was a decision against uh, Google by the European Commission uh, on the on the search, you know, the search decision that said that Google abused uh, um, satirical piece which said that the thing of doing a major investigation dawn rates and you know interviewing uh, complainants but then it realized it was much easier just to use google search <laughs> by typing google abuse of dominant position they said why should we do all the you know investigation if their service is so good <laughs> so anyway to, go, to come to the topic um, it's very interesting because um, now there is a european uh, legislation that is in place since 2019, uh, it's the EU copyright directive in the digital market. And okay, French were the first posed this directive into the and the competition authority in France has been investigating Google 
for uh, alleged um, abuse of dominant position in the way it negotiates and deals with the publishers you know so the publishers complain and newspapers they complain that um, uh, google doesn't want to pay for these uh, for their uh, for the links to the articles being used uh, by google and so basically google was under pressure to um, to strike deals with the publishers and the french competition authority said you know uh, if you don't do this then we will uh, impose a fine on you and we will pursue you um, and also then at the same time we have the the digital markets act and the G digital services act you know that are now being discussed uh, by the eu legislature so the eu parliament and the eu and the council of ministers and so uh, after the french law was transposed uh, so transposing the eu copyright directive uh, it allowed uh, publishers to seek payment um, for the article extracts um, by search engines but also let's say by facebook and others and so um, basically these publishers and the newspapers they were saying that the google's efforts to to seal these agreements were not sufficient you know and so that's why there was this competition authority uh, in france investigating and uh, last year the there was a an order or a, or a judgment by the paris court of appeal which uh, upheld the regulator's power to um, to order google to uh, negotiate with the publishers these so-called neighboring rights so um, despite there was a progress because google struck an agreement with the main alliance of french press uh, publishers but there were still others that didn't get uh, an agreement so you know where google didn't come to an agreement with the publishers and so they were still complainants um, and complaints were pending and so there was a question whether the, the first agreement that google uh, reached with this uh, main alliance of the could be used as a, some kind of model uh, for other news agencies in europe and maybe uh, to to have an with, with with the likes of google and facebook and so that, that's why this french case is quite interesting and i think it's being followed uh, um, also eu-wide i think maybe in europe uh, because you know everybody's watching how well how this how this will end and so uh, <clears throat> the problem is that the most um, eu countries uh, enact the this eu legislation this directive in a similar way but uh, you still don't know how these different member states will define for example uh, the concept of very short extracts the articles or also what it means an appropriate share of the revenues so you know there are all these uh, uh, unknowns and the problem is that it's a it's a directive that means that every member state has a margin of discretion how they will transpose uh, the directive into their national law um, so basically uh, there was this this was the backdrop that uh, there were these complaints against google competition authority was investigating and so um, basically um, at the end of the day uh, the french competition authority imposed a fine of 500 million euros uh, on google which is approximately 600 million dollars uh, because they said that um, in spite of the um, warnings uh, google has not uh, negotiated uh, sufficiently um, with the with the publishers and so uh, uh, there is this uh, temporary injunction and, and now there, there is this fine, you know, 500 million euros or 600 million dollars. And so uh, there were deals, uh, Google has managed to seal deals with some big names like Le Monde or Le Figaro, but then uh, it didn't, for example, reach an agreement with still some very big ones like the national newswire called AFP. And so basically now the, the, the thing is that um, France is the only EU country which has uh, transposed this um, that's why uh, everybody's looking what will happen and Google has already also contested the, the fine and they rejected the reasoning basically Google says that the the, the decision of the French competition authority um, is uh, failing to comp is basically failing to take into account 
that Google acted in good faith and that it has struck agreements with, with some big names. And so they say that the, their efforts were ignored. And they also say that up to now, Google is the only company which has announced agreements um, in, in relation to this French law. Uh, so what is interesting is that now we have also um, in other countries, for example, in Germany, uh, the, the, German, the president of the German Competition Authority, Mr. Mund, uh, has also threatened that there could be a similar um, investigation of Google in Germany if the company doesn't negotiate with the, with the publishers. So I think clearly there is a trend uh, in this respect. And um, I think the, the French authority um, also, you know, for example, there is a, there is a one billion fine on Apple uh, in, a, in a different, uh, let's say, uh, area, but also for, for, a, for a, an abuse or it's under some kind of French economic dependence law. Um, and so, for example, the German, um, the German uh, situation is interesting because in Germany the law is not uh, at least, it's not yet uh, anyway transposed, so the EU directive is only in the process of being transposed in, into German law. And also the problem is that um, the, as I said, you know, the problem is that each EU member has a how to implement the directive. So it's very difficult for us to know uh, what what is an, let's say Europe solution uh, uh, issue. So some of these things will come for us the EU court of which has validity the directive. Is. But that still a sub. I, I can't really talk about it much. But there is. This summer, there was an opinion of, of the Advocate General in the case who proposed to reject the, the action. But we could do a separate panel on that uh, alone. But I think to come back, um, so the, the difference, for example, in Germany is that the, there is no clear, uh, there are no clear rights uh, for, uh, for the publishers, you know, to, to claim uh, uh, compensation. And so that's why the, uh, it seems that the German Competition Authority says that it, it is ready to um, to step in uh, once the law is there. So, you know, the, the law hasn't been yet transposed, but they say that uh, once the law is there, then they will also try to see what they can do to to, um, to, to protect the, the, the press, because they say that the press is a weaker party in, in, in these negotiations. Um, I know that, for example, there Google also already has agreement with publications in Italy, and also, um, so there are, say, in other countries. Then you also have the they have reached an agreement with News Corp um, for 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 their service, which is called uh, Google News Showcase. Showcase. And so uh, basically, uh, I think yeah, the, the 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 bottom line is that there is a trend because you have the. You have at least in, in Europe, you have the legislation that is um, that 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 is allowing the, the the competition authorities and also then the publishers to 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 use that uh, legislation in, in in trying to obtain um, remuneration for for these neighboring rights. Um, also, the Australian situation is very interesting because uh, in Australia the, the the there is also a, a, a new law. Uh, which is quite controversial, which requires Google and Facebook to pay for news. And so there also there have been questions, can we replicate uh, the Australian approach and how can we adapt it uh, to make sure that uh, independent news is helped and not just the major media houses. And so also there is a, some have expressed uh, a concern that uh, Google and Facebook could be captured. Um, you know, if, if they start hand, handing out large money uh, to, to journalism. So, you know, you also have the element of the independence of, 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 of news. Um, so I think, yeah, my time is uh, basically up, out. But uh, yeah, this is something very interesting I wanted to point out to you. And uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Milan. You've left us 
to consider the role of antitrust in a completely functioning global society. So I think we all um, have a lot of things we can think about this afternoon. Would anyone like to have any final thoughts? Is there anything that's been sort of eating at you as we've been talking? I don't want to um, just sign off without giving anyone the opportunity to weigh in if they'd like. I was wondering if I could just ask uh, to use, you know, use or abuse this opportunity to ask Tobias uh, what he thinks about the, the Servier Servier case. You know, so there is a in the EU general court uh, as a, uh, ruled against basically against the Commission under one element of the case, and that is now pending before the Court of Justice. But it would be interesting what the practitioner thought, thought about it. Um, Sorry, I wasn't mute. Um, you, so, so, sorry, so you, you mean the e ECJ case or the ECJ decision against Servier or? Um... Yes, you know, because the, as you were talking about, so the Servier was done under 101 and 102, and the general court has upheld the 101, but it had, uh, you know, struck down the 102 part of the case. Yeah. But, you know, I, yeah, um, it's, 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 I, I'm not entirely sure about the specific circumstances uh, of, of, of that case um, because when I when I uh, looked into this, I, I, I had a focus on, on, on the 101. But as I think what what I mentioned for the um, uh, gen generics case. Um, will eventually, I think, be the differentiating line or the question whether you can also apply 102. Uh, I think the question is, is there an overall scheme? Uh, if, you know, if you have an agreement with one or two, uh, I think we are not within the realm of 102, but rather uh, 101, whereas if uh, this is really a general uh, a scheme and operation, then I think it'd also be within 102. With, 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 with all the, the other questions you then need to answer, what's the market definition? Um, is, is there market dominance? Uh, but I think these are issues that will just have to be sorted out on the basis of the facts. I don't think these will be the, 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 the key issues. The, the key issue is indeed, is, is there room uh, for 102 additionally to 101? And, and where does that room begin and where does it end? But I, I do think that the differentiating line must be, is there an overall um, uh, action scheme on the, on the side of the originator? Great, thanks. Well, it sounds like we've got our topic for next year. So <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for setting us up. Please join me in thanking Tobias, Michelle, Carlos, Anu, and Milan for such a thoughtful and interesting presentation today. Um, I think we can all agree that antitrust and IP will continue to be one of the most exciting areas of the law as we move into 2022. Um, so thank you very much for your time and please join me in, in thanking everyone.